Book One, Chapter One of The Beautiful and Damned. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Beautiful and Damned by F. Scott Fitzgerald. The Victor Belongs to the Spoils. Anthony Patch. To Shane Leslie, George Jean Nathan, and Maxwell Perkins, in appreciation of much literary help and encouragement. Book One, Chapter One, Anthony Patch In 1913, when Anthony Patch was twenty-five, two years were already gone since irony, the holy ghost of this later day, had, theoretically at least, descended upon him. Irony was the final polish of the shoe, the ultimate dab of the clothes brush, a sort of intellectual there, yet at the brink of this story he has yet gone no further than the conscious stage. As you first see him, he wonders frequently whether or not he is without honor and slightly mad, a shameful and obscene thinness glistening on the surface of the world like oil on a clean pond, these occasions being varied, of course, with those in which he thinks himself rather an exceptional young man, thoroughly sophisticated, well-adjusted to his environment, and somewhat more significant than anyone else he knows. This was his healthy state, and it made him cheerful, pleasant, and very attractive to intelligent men and to all women. In this state he considered that he would one day accomplish some quiet, subtle thing that the elect would deem worthy, and, passing on, would join the dimmer stars in a nebulous, indeterminate heaven halfway between death and immortality. Until the time came for this effort, he would be Anthony Patch, not a portrait of a man, but a distinct and dynamic personality, opinionated, contemptuous, functioning from within outward, a man who was aware that there could be no honor, and yet had honor who knew the sophistry of courage, and yet was brave. A Worthy Man and His Gifted Son Anthony drew as much consciousness of social security from being the grandson of Adam J. Patch as he would have had from tracing his line over the sea to the Crusaders. This is inevitable, Virginians and Bostonians to the contrary notwithstanding, an aristocracy founded sheerly on money postulates wealth in the particular. Now, Adam J. Patch more familiarly known as Crosspatch, left his father's farm in Tarrytown early in 61 to join a New York cavalry regiment. He came home from the war a major, charged into Wall Street, and, amid much fuss, fume, applause, and ill will, he gathered to himself some seventy-five million dollars. This occupied his energies until he was fifty-seven years old. It was then that he determined, after a severe attack of sclerosis, to consecrate the remainder of his life to the moral regeneration of the world. He became a reformer among reformers. Emulating the magnificent efforts of Anthony Comstock, after whom his grandson was named, he leveled a varied assortment of uppercuts and body blows at liquor, literature, vice, art, patent medicines, and Sunday theatres. His mind, under the influence of that insidious mildew which eventually forms an all but the few, gave itself up furiously to every indignation of the age. From an armchair in the office of his Tarrytown estate, he directed against the enormous hypothetical enemy, Unrighteousness, a campaign which went on through fifteen years, during which he displayed himself a rabid monomaniac, an unqualified nuisance, and an intolerable bore. The year in which this story opens found him wearying. His campaign had grown desultory. 1861 was creeping up slowly on 1895. His thoughts ran a great deal on the Civil War somewhat on his dead wife and son, and almost infinitesimally on his grandson Anthony. Early in his career Adam Patch had married an anemic lady of thirty, Alicia Withers, who brought him one hundred thousand dollars and an impeccable entree into the banking circles of New York. Immediately, and rather spunkily, she had borne him a son, and as if completely devitalized by the magnificence of this performance, she had thenceforth effaced herself within the shadowy dimensions of the nursery. The boy, Adam Ulysses Patch, became an inveterate joiner of clubs, connoisseur of good form, and driver of tandems. At the astonishing age of twenty-six he began his memoirs under the title, New York Society as I Have Seen It. On the rumor of its conception this work was eagerly bid for among publishers, but as it proved after his death to be immoderately verbose and overpoweringly dull, it never obtained even a private printing. This Fifth Avenue Chesterfield married at twenty-two. His wife was Henrietta Lebrun, the Boston Society contralto, 
and the single child of the union was, at the request of his grandfather, christened Anthony Comstock Patch. When he went to Harvard, the Comstock dropped out of his name to another hell of oblivion and was never heard of thereafter. Young Anthony had one picture of his father and mother together. So often had it faced his eyes in childhood that it had acquired the impersonality of furniture, but every one who came into his bedroom regarded it with interest. It showed a dandy of the nineties, spare and handsome, standing beside a tall dark lady with a muff and the suggestion of a bustle. Between them was a little boy with long brown curls, dressed in a velvet Lord Fauntleroy suit. This was Anthony at five, the year of his mother's death. His memories of the Boston Society contralto were nebulous and musical. She was a lady who sang, sang, sang in the music room of their house at Washington Square, sometimes with guests scattered all about her, the men with their arms folded, balanced breathlessly on the edges of sofas, the women with their hands in their laps, occasionally making little whispers to the men, and always clapping very briskly, and uttering cooing cries after each song. And often she sang to Anthony alone, in Italian or French, or in a strange and terrible dialect which she imagined to be the speech of the southern negro. His recollections of the gallant Ulysses, the first man in America to roll the lapels of his coat, were much more vivid. After Henrietta Lebrun Patch had joined another choir, as her widower huskily remarked from time to time, father and son lived up at Grandpa's in Tarrytown, and Ulysses came daily to Anthony's nursery and expelled pleasant, thick-smelling words for sometimes as much as an hour. He was continually promising Anthony hunting trips and fishing trips and excursions to Atlantic City, oh, some time soon now, but none of them ever materialized. One trip they did take, when Anthony was eleven, they went abroad, to England and Switzerland, and there, in the best hotel in Lucerne, his father died with much sweating and grunting and crying aloud for air. In a panic of despair and terror, Anthony was brought back to America, wedded to a vague melancholy that was to stay beside him through the rest of his life. Past and Person of the Hero At eleven he had a horror of death. Within six impressionable years his parents had died, and his grandmother had faded off almost imperceptibly until, for the first time since her marriage, her person held for one day an unquestioned supremacy over her own drawing-room. So to Anthony, life was a struggle against death that waited at every corner. It was as a concession to his hypochondriacal imagination that he formed the habit of reading in bed. It soothed him. He read until he was tired, and often fell asleep with the light still on. His favorite diversion until he was fourteen was his stamp collection, enormous, as nearly exhaustive as a boy's could be. His grandfather considered fatuously that it was teaching him geography. So Anthony kept up a correspondence with a half-dozen stamp and coin companies, and it was rare that the mail failed to bring him new stamp books or packages of glittering approval sheets. There was a mysterious fascination in transferring his acquisitions interminably from one book to another. His stamps were his greatest happiness, and he bestowed impatient frowns on anyone who interrupted him at play with them. They devoured his allowance every month, and he lay awake at night musing untiringly on their variety and many-colored splendor. At sixteen he had lived almost entirely within himself, an inarticulate boy, thoroughly un-American, and politely bewildered by his contemporaries. The two preceding years had been spent in Europe with a private tutor who persuaded him that Harvard was the thing it would open doors, it would be a tremendous tonic, it would give him innumerable self-sacrificing and devoted friends. So he went to Harvard. There was no other logical thing to be done with him. Oblivious to the social system, he lived for a while, alone and unsought, in a high room in Beck Hall, a slim dark boy of medium height with a shy sensitive mouth. His allowance was more than liberal. He laid the foundations for a library, by purchasing from a wandering bibliophile first editions of Swinburne, Meredith, and Hardy, and a yellowed, illegible autograph letter of Keats, finding later that he had been amazingly overcharged. He became an exquisite dandy, amassed a rather pathetic collection of silk pajamas, brocaded dressing gowns, and neckties too flamboyant to wear. In this secret finery he would parade before a mirror in his room, or lie stretched in satin along his window seat, looking down on the yard, in realizing dimly this clamor, breathless and immediate, in which it seemed he was never to have a part. Curiously enough, he found in senior year that he had acquired a position in his class. He learned that he was looked upon as a rather romantic figure, a scholar, a recluse, a tower of erudition. 
This amused him, but secretly pleased him. He began going out, at first a little, and then a great deal. He made the pudding. He drank, quietly, and in the proper tradition. It was said of him that had he not come to college so young, he might have done extremely well. In 1909, when he graduated, he was only twenty years old. Then abroad again, to Rome this time, where he dallied with architecture and painting in turn, took up the violin, and wrote some ghastly Italian sonnets, supposedly the ruminations of a thirteenth-century monk and the joys of the contemplative life. It became established among his Harvard intimates that he was in Rome, and those of them who were abroad that year looked him up and discovered with him a many moonlight excursions, much in the city, that was older than the Renaissance, or indeed than the Republic. Maury Noble, from Philadelphia, for instance, remained two months, and together they realized the peculiar charm of Latin women, and had a delightful sense of being very young and free in a civilization that was very old and free. Not a few acquaintances of his grandfather's called on him, and had he so desired he might have been persona grata with a diplomatic set. Indeed, he found that his inclinations tended more and more toward conviviality, but that long adolescent aloofness and consequent shyness still dictated his conduct. He returned to America in 1912 because of one of his grandfather's sudden illnesses, and after an excessively tiresome talk with a perpetually convalescent old man, he decided to put off until his grandfather's death the idea of living permanently abroad. After a prolonged search, he took an apartment on 52nd Street, and to all appearances settled down. In 1913, Anthony Patch's adjustment of himself to the universe was in the process of consummation. Physically, he had improved since his undergraduate days. He was still too thin, but his shoulders had widened and his brunette face had lost the frightened look of his freshman year. He was secretly orderly and in person spick and span. His friends declared that they had never seen his hair rumpled. His nose was too sharp. His mouth was one of those unfortunate mirrors of mood inclined to droop perceptively in moments of unhappiness but his blue eyes were charming, whether alert with intelligence or half-closed in an expression of melancholy humor. One of those men devoid of the symmetry of feature essential to the Aryan ideal, he was yet, here and there, considered handsome. Moreover, he was very clean, in appearance and in reality, with that especial cleanness borrowed from beauty. The Reproachless Apartment Fifth and Sixth Avenues, it seemed to Anthony, were the uprights of a gigantic ladder stretching from Washington Square to Central Park. Coming uptown on top of a bus toward 52nd Street invariably gave him the sensation of hoisting himself hand by hand on a series of treacherous rungs, and when the bus jolted to a stop at his own rung, he found something akin to relief as he descended the reckless metal steps to the sidewalk. After that, he had but to walk down 52nd Street half a block pass a stodgy family of brownstone houses, and then, in a jiffy, he was under the high ceilings of his great front room. This was entirely satisfactory. Here, after all, life began. Here he slept, breakfasted, read, and entertained. The house itself was of murky material built in the late nineties. In response to the steadily growing need of small apartments, each floor had been thoroughly remodeled and rented individually. Of the four apartments, Anthony's, on the second floor, was the most desirable. The front room had fine high ceilings, and three large windows that loomed down pleasantly upon 52nd Street. In its appointments it escaped by a safe margin being of any particular period. It escaped stiffness, stuffiness, bareness, and decadence. It smelt neither of smoke nor of incense. It was tall and faintly blue. There was a deep lounge of the softest brown leather with somnolence drifting about it like a haze. There was a high screen of Chinese lacquer chiefly concerned with geometrical fishermen and huntsmen in black and gold. This made a corner alcove for a voluminous chair guarded by an orange-colored standing lamp. Deep in the fireplace, a corded shield was burned to a murky black. Passing through the dining room, which, as Anthony took only breakfast at home, was merely a magnificent potentiality, and down a comparatively long hall, one came to the heart and core of the apartment, Anthony's bedroom and bath. Both of them were immense, under the ceilings of the former, even the great canopied bed seemed of only average size. On the floor an exotic rug of crimson velvet was soft as fleece on his bare feet. His bathroom, in contrast to the rather portentous character of his bedroom, was gay, bright, extremely habitable, and even faintly facetious. Framed around the walls were photographs of four celebrated thespian beauties of the day, 
Julia Sanderson as the Sunshine Girl, Ina Clare as the Quaker Girl, Billy Burke as the Mind the Paint Girl, and Hazel Dawn as the Pink Lady. Between Billy Burke and Hazel Dawn hung a print representing a great stretch of snow presided over by a cold and formidable sun. This, claimed Anthony, symbolized the cold shower. The bathtub, equipped with an ingenious bookholder, was low and large. Beside it, a wall wardrobe bulged with sufficient line for three men and with a generation of neckties. There was no skimpy, glorified towel of a carpet. Instead, a rich rug, like the one in his bedroom, a miracle of softness, that seemed almost to massage the wet foot emerging from the tub. All in all, a room to conjure with. It was easy to see that Anthony dressed there, arranged his immaculate hair there, in fact, did everything but sleep and eat there. It was his pride, this bathroom. He felt that if he had a love, he would have hung her picture just facing the tub so that, lost in the soothing steamings of the hot water, he might lie and look up at her and muse warmly and sensuously on her beauty. Nor does he spin. The apartment was kept clean by an English servant with a singularly, almost theatrically appropriate name of Bounds, whose technic was marred only by the fact that he wore a soft collar. Had he been entirely Anthony's Bounds, this defect would have been summarily remedied, but he was also the Bounds of two other gentlemen in the neighborhood. From eight until eleven in the morning he was entirely Anthony's. He arrived with the mail and cooked breakfast. At nine-thirty he pulled the edge of Anthony's blanket and spoke a few terse words. Anthony never remembered clearly what they were and rather suspected that they were deprecative. Then he served breakfast on a card table in the front room, made the bed, and, after asking with some hostility if there was anything else, withdrew. In the mornings, at least once a week, Anthony went to see his broker. His income was slightly under seven thousand a year, the interest on money inherited from his mother. His grandfather, who had never allowed his own son to graduate from a very liberal allowance, judged that this sum was sufficient for young Anthony's needs. Every Christmas he sent him a five hundred dollar bond, which Anthony usually sold, if possible, as he was always a little, not very, hard up. The visits to his broker varied from semi-social chats to discussions of the safety of eight percent investments, and Anthony always enjoyed them. The big trust company building seemed to link him definitely to the great fortunes whose solidarity he respected, and to assure him that he was adequately chaperoned by the hierarchy of finance. From these hurried men, he derived the same sense of safety that he had in contemplating his grandfather's money. Even more, for the latter appeared, vaguely, a demand loan made by the world to Adam Patch's own moral righteousness, while this money downtown seemed rather to have been grasped and held by sheer indomitable strengths and tremendous feats of will. In addition, it seemed more definitely and explicitly money. Close as Anthony trod on the heels of his income, he considered it to be enough. Some golden day, of course, he would have many millions. Meanwhile, he possessed a raison d'etre in the theoretical creation of essays on the popes of the Renaissance. This flashes back to the conversation with his grandfather immediately upon his return from Rome. He had hoped to find his grandfather dead, but had learned by telephoning from the pair that Adam Patch was comparatively well again. The next day he had concealed his disappointment and gone out to Tarrytown. Five miles from the station, his taxicab entered an elaborately groomed drive that threaded a veritable maze of walls and wire fences guarding the estate. This, said the public, was because it was definitively known that if the socialists had their way, one of the first men they'd assassinate would be Old Cross Patch. Anthony was late, and the venerable philanthropist was awaiting him in a glass-walled sun parlor, where he was glancing through the morning papers for the second time. His secretary, Edward Shuttleworth, who before his regeneration had been gambler, saloon-keeper, and general reprobate, ushered Anthony into the room, exhibiting his redeemer and benefactor as though he were displaying a treasure of immense value. They shook hands gravely. "'I'm awfully glad to hear you're better,' Anthony said. The senior patch, with an air of having seen his grandson only last week, pulled out his watch. "'Train late?' he asked mildly. It had irritated him to wait for Anthony. He was under the delusion not only that, in his youth, he had handled his practical affairs with the utmost scrupulousness, even to keeping every engagement on the dot, but also that this was the direct and primary cause of his success. 
It's been late a good deal this month, he remarked with a shade of meek accusation in his voice. And then, after a long sigh, sit down. Anthony surveyed his grandfather with that tacit amazement which always attended the sight. That this feeble, unintelligent old man was possessed of such power that, yellow journals to the contrary, the men in the Republic whose souls he could not have bought directly or indirectly would scarcely have populated white plains, seemed as impossible to believe as that he had once been a pink-and-white baby. The span of his seventy-five years had acted as a magic bellows. The first quarter-century had blown him full with life, and the last had sucked it all back. It had sucked in the cheeks and the chest and the girth of one arm and leg. It had tyrannously demanded his teeth, one by one, suspended his small eyes in dark bluish sacks, tweaked out his hairs, changed him from gray to white in some places, from pink to yellow in others, callously transposing his colors like a child trying over a paint box. Then, through his body and his soul, it had attacked his brain. It had sent him night sweats and tears and unfounded dreads. It had split his intense normality into credulity and suspicion. Out of the coarse material of his enthusiasm, it had cut dozens of meek but petulant obsessions. His energy was shrunk to the bad temper of a spoiled child, and for his will to power was substituted a fatuous, puerile desire for a land of harps and canticles on earth. The amenities having been gingerly touched upon, Anthony felt that he was expected to outline his intentions, and simultaneously a glimmer in the old man's eye warned him against broaching, for the present, his desire to live abroad. He wished that Shuttleworth would have tact enough to leave the room. He detested Shuttleworth. But the secretary had settled blandly in a rocker, and was dividing between the two patches the glances of his faded eyes. "'Now that you're here, you ought to do something,' said his grandfather softly. "'Accomplish something.' Anthony waited for him to speak of leaving something done when you pass on. Then he made a suggestion. I thought, it seemed to me, that perhaps I'm best qualified to write. Adam Patch winced, visualizing a family poet with long hair and three mistresses. History, finished Anthony. History? History of what? The Civil War? The Revolution? Why, no, sir, a history of the Middle Ages. Simultaneously, an idea was born for the history of the Renaissance popes, written from some novel angle. Still, he was glad he had said Middle Ages. Middle Ages? Why not your own country? Something you know about? Well, you see, I've lived so much abroad. Why you should write about the Middle Ages, I don't know. Dark Ages, we used to call them. Nobody knows what happened, and nobody cares, except that they're over now. He continued for some minutes on the uselessness of such information, touching, naturally, on the Spanish Inquisition and the corruption of the monasteries. Then, Do you really think you'll be able to do any work in New York? Or do you really intend to work at all? This last with soft, almost imperceptible cynicism. Why, yes, I do, sir. When'll you be done? Well, there'll be an outline, you see, and a lot of preliminary reading. I should think you've done enough of that already. The conversation worked itself jerkily toward a rather abrupt conclusion, when Anthony rose, looked at his watch, and remarked that he had an engagement with his broker that afternoon. He had intended to stay a few days with his grandfather, but he was tired and irritated from a rough crossing, and quite unwilling to stand a subtle and sanctimonious brow-beating. He would come out again in a few days, he said. Nevertheless, it was due to this encounter that work had come into his life as a permanent idea. During the year that had passed since then, he had made several lists of authorities, he had even experimented with chapter titles and the division of his work into periods, but not one line of actual writing existed at present, or seemed likely ever to exist. He did nothing, and contrary to the most accredited copy-book logic, he managed to divert himself with more than average content. Afternoon it was October in 1913, midway in a week of pleasant days, with the sunshine loitering in the cross streets and the atmosphere so languid as to seem weighted with ghostly falling leaves. It was pleasant to sit lazily by the open window, finishing a chapter of Irwan. It was pleasant to yawn about five, toss the book on a table, and saunter humming along the wall to his bath. To you, beautiful lady, he was singing as he turned on the tap. I raise my eyes... To you, beautiful lady, 
My heart cries. He raised his voice to compete with the flood of water pouring into the tub, and as he looked at the picture of Hazel Dawn upon the wall, he put an imaginary violin to his shoulder and softly caressed it with a phantom bow. Through his closed lips he made a humming noise, which he vaguely imagined resembled the sound of a violin. After a moment his hands ceased their gyrations and wandered to his shirt, which he began to unfasten. Stripped, and adopting an athletic posture like the tiger-skin man in the advertisement, he regarded himself with some satisfaction in the mirror, breaking off to dabble a tentative foot in the tub. Readjusting a faucet and indulging in a few preliminary grunts, he slid in. Once accustomed to the temperature of the water, he relaxed into a state of drowsy content. When he finished his bath, he would dress leisurely and walk down Fifth Avenue to the Ritz, where he had an appointment for dinner with his two most frequent companions, Dick Caramel and Maury Noble. Afterward, he and Maury were going to the theater. Caramel would probably trot home and work on his book, which ought to be finished pretty soon. Anthony was glad he wasn't going to work on his book. The notion of sitting down and conjuring up not only words in which to clothe thoughts, but thoughts worthy of being clothed, the whole thing was absurdly beyond his desires. Emerging from his bath, he polished himself with the meticulous attention of a boot black. Then he wandered into the bedroom, and, whistling the while, a weird, uncertain melody strolled here and there, buttoning, adjusting, and enjoying the warmth of the thick carpet on his feet. He lit a cigarette, tossed the match out the open top of the window, then paused in his tracks with the cigarette two inches from his mouth, which fell faintly ajar. His eyes were focused upon a spot of brilliant color on the roof of a house farther down the alley. It was a girl in a red negligee, silk, surely, drying her hair by the still hot sun of late afternoon. His whistle had died upon the stiff air of the room. He walked cautiously another step nearer the window with the sudden impression that she was beautiful. Sitting on the stone parapet beside her was a cushion, the same color as her garment, and she was leaning both arms upon it as she looked down into the sunny areaway where Anthony could hear children playing. He watched her for several minutes. Something was stirred in him, something not accounted for by the warm smell of the afternoon or the triumphant vividness of red. He felt persistently that the girl was beautiful. Then, of a sudden, he understood. It was her distance— not a rare and precious distance of soul, but still distance, if only in terrestrial yards. The autumn air was between them, and the roofs and the blurred voices. Yet for a not altogether explained second, posing perversely in time, his emotion had been nearer to adoration than in the deepest kiss he had ever known. He finished his dressing, found a black bow tie, and adjusted it carefully by the three-sided mirror in the bathroom. Then, yielding to an impulse, he walked quickly into the bedroom and again looked out the window. The woman was standing up now. She had tossed her hair back, and he had a full view of her. She was fat, full thirty-five, utterly undistinguished. Making a clicking noise with his mouth, he returned to the bathroom and reparted his hair. "'To you, beautiful lady,' he sang lightly, "'I raise my eyes.' Then, with a last soothing brush that left an iridescent surface of sheer gloss, he left his bathroom in his apartment, and walked down Fifth Avenue to the Ritz-Carlton. Three Men At seven, Anthony and his friend Maury Noble are sitting at a corner table on the cool roof. Maury Noble is like nothing so much as a large, slender, and imposing cat. His eyes are narrow and full of incessant, protracted blinks. His hair is smooth and flat, as though it has been licked by a possible, and if so, Herculean, mother cat. During Anthony's time at Harvard, he had been considered the most unique figure in his class, the most brilliant, the most original, smart, quiet, and among the saved. This is the man whom Anthony considers his best friend. This is the only man of all his acquaintance whom he admires, and, to a bigger extent than he likes to admit to himself, envies. They are glad to see each other now. Their eyes are full of kindness as each feels the full effect of novelty after a short separation. They are drawing a relaxation from each other's presence, a new serenity. Maury Noble behind that fine and absurdly cat-like face is all but purring. And Anthony, nervous as a will-o'-the-wisp, restless, he is at rest now. They are engaged in one of those easy, short-speech conversations that only men under thirty, or men under great stress, indulge in. Anthony. 
Seven o'clock. Where's the caramel? Impatiently. I wish he'd finish that interminable novel. I've spent more time hungry. Maury. He's got a new name for it. The Demon Lover. Not bad, eh? Anthony. Interested. The Demon Lover? Oh, woman wailing. No, not a bit bad. Not bad at all, do you think? Maury. Rather good. What time did you say? Anthony. Seven. Maury. His eyes narrowing, not unpleasantly, but to express a faint disapproval. Drove me crazy the other day. Anthony. How? Maury. That habit of taking notes. Anthony. Me too. Seems I'd said something night before that he considered material, but he'd forgotten it. So he had at me. He'd say, can't you try to concentrate? And I'd say, you bore me to tears. How do I remember? Maury laughs noiselessly, by a sort of bland and appreciative widening of his features. Maury. Dick doesn't necessarily see more than anyone else. He merely can put down a larger proportion of what he sees. Anthony. That rather impressive talent. Maury. Oh, yes, impressive. Anthony. An energy, ambitious, well-directed energy. He's so entertaining. He's so tremendously stimulating and exciting. Often there's something breathless in being with him. Maury. Oh, yes. Silence, and then... Anthony, with his thin, somewhat uncertain face, at its most convinced. But not indomitable energy. Some day, bit by bit, it'll blow away, and his rather impressive talent with it, and leave only a wisp of a man, fretful and egotistic and garrulous. Maury, with laughter. Here we sit vowing to each other that little Dick sees less deeply into things than we do, and I'll bet he feels a measure of superiority on his side, creative mind over merely critical mind and all that. Anthony. Oh, yes. But he's wrong. He's inclined to fall for a million silly enthusiasms. If it wasn't that he's absorbed in realism and therefore has to adopt the garments of the cynic, he'd be... He'd be credulous as a college religious leader. He's an idealist. Oh, yes, he thinks he's not, because he's rejected Christianity. Remember him in college? Just swallow every writer whole, one after another, ideas, technique, and characters. Chesterton, Shaw, Wells, each one as easily as the last. Maury, still considering his own last observation. I remember. Anthony, it's true. Natural-born fetish worshipper, take art. Maury, let's order. He'll be... Anthony, sure, let's order. I told him. Maury, here he comes. Look, he's going to bump that waiter. He lifts his finger as a signal, lifts it as though it were a soft and friendly claw. Here you are, Caramel. A new voice, fiercely. Hello, Maury. Hello, Anthony Comstock Patch. How is old Adam's grandson? Debutante still after you, eh? In person, Richard Caramel is short and fair. He is to be bald at thirty-five. He has yellowish eyes, one of them startlingly clear, the other opaque as a muddy pool, and a bulging brow like a funny paper baby. He bulges in other places. His paunch bulges, prophetically. His words have an air of bulging from his mouth. Even his dinner coat pockets bulge, as though from contamination, with a dog-eared collection of timetables, programs, and miscellaneous scraps. On these he takes his notes with great scurryings up of his unmatched yellow eyes, and motions of silence with his disengaged left hand. When he reaches the table, he shakes hands with Anthony and Maury. He is one of those men who invariably shake hands, even with people whom they have seen an hour before. Anthony. Hello, Caramel. Glad you're here. We needed a comic relief. Maury. You're late. Been racing the postman down the block? We've been clawing over your character. Dick. Fixing Anthony eagerly with the bright eye. What'd you say? Tell me and I'll write it down. Cut three thousand words out of part one this afternoon. Maury. Noble aesthete. And I poured alcohol into my stomach. Dick. I don't doubt it. I bet you two have been sitting here for an hour talking about liquor. Anthony. We never pass out, my beardless boy. Maury. We never go home with ladies we meet when we're lit. Anthony. All in all, our parties are characterized by a certain haughty distinction. Dick. The particularly silly sort who boast about being tanks. Trouble is, you're both in the eighteenth century. School of the old English squire. Drink quietly till you roll under the table. Never have a good time. Oh, no, that isn't done at all. Anthony. This from chapter six, I'll bet. Dick. Going to the theater? Maury. Yes, 
we intend to spend the evening doing some deep thinking over life's problems. The thing is tersely called the woman. I presume that she will pay. Anthony. My God, is that what it is? Let's go to the Follies again. Maury. I'm tired of it. I've seen it three times. To Dick. The first time, we went out after Act One and found a most amazing bar. When we came back, we entered the wrong theater. Anthony. Had a protracted dispute with a scared young couple who we thought were in our seats. Dick, as though talking to himself, I think that when I've done another novel and a play, it may be a book of short stories, I'll do a musical comedy. Maury, I know, with intellectual lyrics that no one will listen to, and all the critics will groan and grunt about dear old Pinafore, and I shall go on shining as a brilliantly meaningless finger in a meaningless world. Dick, pompously, art isn't meaningless. Maury, it is in itself. It isn't in that it tries to make life less so. Anthony, in other words, Dick, you're playing before a grandstand peopled with ghosts. Maury, give a good show, anyhow. Anthony, to Maury, on the contrary, I'd feel that it being a meaningless world, why write? The very attempt to give it purpose is purposeless. Dick, well, even admitting all that, be a decent pragmatist and grant a poor man the instinct to live. Would you want everyone to accept that sophistic rot? Anthony. Yeah, I suppose so. Maury. No, sir. I believe that everyone in America but a selected thousand should be compelled to accept a very rigid system of morals. Roman Catholicism, for instance. I don't complain of conventional morality. I complain rather of the mediocre heretics who seize upon the findings of sophistication and adopt the pose of a moral freedom to which they are by no means entitled by their intelligences. Here the soup arrives, and what Maury might have gone on to say is lost for all time. Night Afterward they visited a ticket speculator, and at a price, obtained seats for a new musical comedy called High Jinx. In the foyer of a theatre they waited a few moments to see the first night crowd come in. There were opera cloaks, stitched of myriad, many-coloured silks and furs. There were jewels dripping from arms and throats and ear-tips of white and rose. There were innumerable broad shimmers down the middles of innumerable silk hats. There were shoes of gold and bronze and red and shining black. There were the high-piled, tight-packed coiffures of many women and the slick-watered hair of well-kept men. Most of all, there was the ebbing, flowing, chattering, chuckling, foaming, slow-rolling wave effect of this cheerful sea of people, as tonight it poured its glittering torrent into the artificial lake of laughter. After the play, they parted. Maury was going to a dance at Sherry's, Anthony homeward and to bed. He found his way slowly over the jostled evening mass of Times Square, which the chariot race and its thousand satellites made rarely beautiful and bright and intimate with carnival. Faces swirled about him, a kaleidoscope of girls, ugly, ugly as sin, too fat, too lean, yet floating upon this autumn air as upon their own warm and passionate breaths, poured out into the night. Here, for all their vulgarity, he thought, they were faintly and subtly mysterious. He inhaled carefully, swallowing into his lungs perfume and the not unpleasant scent of many cigarettes. He caught the glance of a dark young beauty sitting alone in a closed taxicab. Her eyes in the half-light suggested night and violets, and for a moment he stirred again to that half-forgotten remoteness of the afternoon. Two young Jewish men passed him, talking in loud voices and craning their necks here and there in fatuous, supercilious glances. They were dressed in suits of the exaggerated tightness, then semi-fashionable. Their turnover collars were notched at the Adam's apple. They wore gray spats and carried gray gloves on their cane handles. Past a bewildered old lady borne along like a basket of eggs between two men who exclaimed to her of the wonders of Times Square, explained them so quickly that the old lady, trying to be impartially interested, waved her head here and there like a piece of wind-worried old orange peel. Anthony heard a snatch in their conversation. "'There's the Astor, Mama. "'Look. See the chariot race sign? "'That's where we were today. No, there. "'Good gracious. You should worry and grow thin like a dime.' He recognized the current witticism of the year as it issued stridently from one of the pairs at his elbow. "'And I says to him, I says—' The soft rush of taxis by him— and laughter, laughter horses a crows, incessant and loud, with the rumble of the subways underneath, and, over all, the revolutions of light, the growings and recedings of light, 
light dividing like pearls, forming and reforming and glittering bars and circles and monstrous grotesque figures cut amazingly on the sky. He turned thankfully down the hush that blew like a dark wind out of a cross street, past a bakery restaurant in whose windows a dozen roast chickens turned over and over on an automatic spit. From the door came a smell that was hot, doughy, and pink. A drugstore next, exhaling medicines, spilt soda water, and a pleasant undertone from the cosmetic counter. Then a Chinese laundry, still open, steamy and stifling, smelling folded and vaguely yellow. All these depressed him. Reaching Sixth Avenue, he stopped at a corner cigar store and emerged feeling better. The cigar store was cheerful, humanity in a navy blue mist, buying a luxury. Once in his apartment, he smoked a last cigarette, sitting in the dark by his open front window. For the first time in over a year, he found himself thoroughly enjoying New York. There was a rare pungency in it, certainly, a quality almost southern. A lonesome town, though. He who had grown up alone had lately learned to avoid solitude. During the past several months he had been careful, when he had no engagements for the evening, to hurry to one of his clubs and find someone. Oh, there was a loneliness here. His cigarette, its smoke bordering the thin folds of curtain, with rims of faint white spray, glowed on until the clock in St. Anne's down the street struck one with a querulous fashionable beauty. The elevated, half a quiet block away, sounded a rumble of drums, and should he lean from his window he would see the train, like an angry eagle, breasting the dark curve at the corner. He was reminded of a fantastic romance he had lately read, in which cities had been bombed from aerial trains, and for a moment he fancied that Washington Square had declared war on Central Park, and that this was a northbound menace loaded with battle and sudden death. But as it passed, the illusion faded. It diminished to the faintest of drums, then to a faraway droning eagle. There were the bells and the continued low blur of auto horns from Fifth Avenue, but his own street was silent, and he was safe in here from all the threat of life. For there was his door and the long hall and his guardian bedroom, safe, safe. The arc light shining into his window seemed for this hour like the moon, only brighter and more beautiful than the moon. A Flashback in Paradise Beauty, who was born anew every hundred years, sat in a sort of outdoor waiting room, through which blew gusts of white wind and occasionally a breathless hurried star. The stars winked at her intimately as they went by, and the winds made a soft incessant flurry in her hair. She was incomprehensible, for, in her, soul and spirit were one. The beauty of her body was the essence of her soul. She was that unity sought for by philosophers through many centuries. In this outdoor waiting room of winds and stars she had been sitting for a hundred years, at peace in the contemplation of herself. It became known to her, at length, that she was to be born again. Sighing, she began a long conversation with a voice that was in the white wind, a conversation that took many hours and of which I can give only a fragment here. Beauty, her lips scarcely stirring, her eyes turned, as always, inward upon herself. Whither shall I journey now? The voice. To a new country, a land you have never seen before. Beauty, passionately. I loathe breaking into these new civilizations. How long a stay this time? The voice. Fifteen years. Beauty. And what's the name of the place? The voice. It is the most opulent, most gorgeous land on earth, a land whose wisest are but little wiser than its dullest, a land where the rulers have minds like little children, and the lawgivers believe in Santa Claus, where ugly women control strong men. Beatty, in astonishment. What? The voice, very much depressed. Yes, it is truly a melancholy spectacle. Women with receding chins and shapeless noses go about in broad daylight, saying, Do this, and do that. And all the men, even those of great wealth, obey implicitly their women, to whom they refer sonorously either as Mrs. So-and-so or as the wife. Beauty. But this can't be true. I can understand, of course, their obedience to women of charm. But to fat women? To bony women? To women with scrawny cheeks? The voice. Even so. Beauty. What of me? What chance shall I have? The voice. It will be harder going, if I may borrow a phrase. Beauty, after a dissatisfied pause. Why not the old lands, the lands of grapes and soft-tongued men, or the land of ships and seas? 
the voice. It's expected that they'll be very busy shortly. Beauty. Oh. The voice. Your life on earth will be, as always, the interval between two significant glances in a mundane mirror. Beauty. What will I be? Tell me. The voice. At first it was thought that you would go this time as an actress in the motion pictures, but, after all, it's not advisable. You will be disguised during your fifteen years as what is called a society girl. Beauty. What's that? There is a new sound in the wind which must, for our purposes, be interpreted as the voice scratching its head. The voice, at length. It's a sort of bogus aristocrat. Beauty. Bogus? What is bogus? The voice. That, too, you will discover in this land. You will find much that is bogus. Also, you will do much that is bogus. Beauty, placidly. It all sounds so vulgar. The voice. Not half as vulgar as it is. You will be known during your fifteen years as a ragtime kid, a flapper, a jazz baby, and a baby vamp. You will dance new dances neither more nor less gracefully than you dance the old ones. Beauty, in a whisper. Will I be paid? The voice. Yes, as usual, in love. Beauty, with a faint laugh which disturbs only momentarily the immobility of her lips. And will I like being called a jazz baby? The voice, soberly. You will love it. The dialogue ends here, with Beauty still sitting quietly, the stars pausing in an ecstasy of appreciation, the wind, white and gusty, blowing through her hair. All this took place seven years before Anthony sat by the front windows of his apartment and listened to the chimes of St. Anne's. End of Book One, Chapter One Book One, Chapter Two, Part One of Two of The Beautiful and Damned. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Beautiful and Damned by F. Scott Fitzgerald. Book One, Chapter Two Portrait of a Siren. Part One of Two. Crispness folded down upon New York a month later bringing November and the three big football games, and a great fluttering of furs along Fifth Avenue. It brought, also, a sense of tension to the city and suppressed excitement. Every morning now there were invitations in Anthony's mail. Three dozen virtuous females of the first layer were proclaiming their fitness, if not their specific willingness, to bear children unto three dozen millionaires. Five dozen virtuous females of the second layer were proclaiming not only this fitness, but, in addition, a tremendous undaunted ambition toward the first three dozen young men, who were, of course, invited to each of the ninety-six parties, as were the young ladies' group of family friends, acquaintances, college boys, and eager young outsiders. To continue, there was a third layer from the skirts of the city, from Newark and the Jersey suburbs up to bitter Connecticut, and the ineligible sections of Long Island, and doubtless contiguous layers down to the city's shoes. Jewesses were coming out into a society of Jewish men and women, from Riverside to the Bronx, and looking forward to a rising young broker or jeweler and a kosher wedding. Irish girls were casting their eyes, with license at last to do so, upon a society of young Tammany politicians, pious undertakers, and grown-up choir boys. And naturally the city caught the contagious air of entree. The working girls, poor ugly souls, wrapping soap in the factories and showing finery in the big stores, dreamed that, perhaps in the spectacular excitement of this winter, they might obtain for themselves the coveted mail, as in a muddled carnival crowd an inefficient pickpocket may consider his chances increased. And the chimneys commenced to smoke, and the subway's foulness was freshened, and the actresses came out in new plays, and the publishers came out with new books, and the castles came out with new dances and the railroads came out with new schedules containing new mistakes instead of the old ones that the commuters had grown used to. The city was coming out. Anthony, walking along 42nd Street one afternoon under a steel-gray sky, ran unexpectedly into Richard Caramel emerging from the Manhattan Hotel barber shop. It was a cold day, the first definitely cold day, and Caramel had on one of those knee-length, sheep-lined coats long worn by the working men of the Middle West, 
that were just coming into fashionable approval. His soft hat was of a discreet dark brown, and from under it his clear eye flamed like a topaz. He stopped Anthony enthusiastically, slapping him on the arms more from a desire to keep himself warm than from playfulness, and after his inevitable handshake exploded into sound. Cold as the devil. Good Lord, I've been working like the deuce all day till my room got so cold I thought I'd get pneumonia. Darn landlady economizing on coal came up when I yelled over the stairs for her for half an hour. Began explaining why and all. God. First she drove me crazy. Then I began to think she was sort of a character and took notes while she talked. So she couldn't see me, you know, just as though I were writing casually. He had seized Anthony's arm and was walking him briskly up Madison Avenue. Where to? Nowhere in particular. Well, then, what's the use? demanded Anthony. They stopped and stared at each other, and Anthony wondered if the cold made his own face as repellent as Dick Caramel's, whose nose was crimson, whose bulging brow was blue, whose yellow unmatched eyes were red and watery at the rims. After a moment, they began walking again. Done some good work on my novel. Dick was looking and talking emphatically at the sidewalk. But I have to get out once in a while. He glanced at Anthony apologetically, as though craving encouragement. I have to talk. I guess very few people ever really think. I mean, sit down and ponder and have ideas in a sequence. I do my thinking in writing or conversation. You've got to have a start, sort of, something to defend or contradict, don't you think? Anthony grunted and withdrew his arm gently. I don't mind carrying you, Dick, but with that coat. I mean, continued Richard Caramel gravely, that on paper your first paragraph contains the idea you're going to damn or enlarge on. In conversation you've got your vis-a-vis -vis last statement, but when you simply ponder, why, your ideas just succeed each other like magic lantern pictures, and each one forces out the last. They passed Forty Fifty Street and slowed down slightly. Both of them lit cigarettes and blew tremendous clouds of smoke and frosted breath into the air. Let's walk up to the plaza and have an eggnog, suggested Anthony. Do you good. Air will get the rotten nicotine out of your lungs. Come on, I'll let you talk about your book all the way. I don't want to if it bores you. I mean, you needn't do it as a favor. The words tumbled out in haste, and though he tried to keep his face casual, it screwed up uncertainly. Anthony was compelled to protest. Bore me? I should say not. Got a cousin, began Dick, but Anthony interrupted by stretching out his arms and breathing forth a low cry of exultation. "'Good weather!' he exclaimed. "'Isn't it? Makes me feel about ten. I mean, it makes me feel as I should have felt when I was ten. Murderous. Oh, God! One minute it's my world, and the next I'm the world's fool. Today it's my world, and everything's easy, easy. Even nothing is easy. Got a cousin up at the plaza. Famous girl. We can go up and meet her. She lives there the winter. Has lately, anyway. With her mother and father. Didn't know you had cousins in New York.' Her name's Gloria. She's from home, Kansas City. Her mother's a practicing billfist, and her father's quite dull, but a perfect gentleman. What are they? Literary material? They try to be. All the old man does is tell me he just met the most wonderful character for a novel. Then he tells me about some idiotic friend of his, and then he says, There's a character for you. Why don't you write him up? Everybody'd be interested in him. Or else he tells me about Japan or Paris or some other very obvious place and says, why don't you write a story about that place? That'd be a wonderful setting for a story. How about the girl? inquired Anthony, casually. Gloria. Gloria what? Gilbert. Oh, you've heard of her. Gloria Gilbert. Goes to dances at colleges. All that sort of thing. I've heard her name. Good-looking. In fact, damned attractive. They reached 50th Street and turned over toward the avenue. I don't care for young girls as a rule, said Anthony, frowning. This was not strictly true. While it seemed to him that the average debutante spent every hour of her day thinking and talking about what the great world had mapped out for her to do during the next hour, any girl who made a living directly on her prettiness interested him enormously. Gloria is darn nice, not a brain in her head. Anthony laughed in a one-syllabled snort. By that you mean she hasn't a line of literary patter. No, I don't. Dick, you know what passes as brains in a girl for you? Earnest young women who sit with you in a corner and talk earnestly about life. The kind who, when they were sixteen, 
argued with grave faces as to whether kissing was right or wrong, and whether it was immoral for freshmen to drink beer. Richard Caramel was offended. His scowl crinkled like crushed paper. No, he began, but Anthony interrupted ruthlessly. Oh, yes, kind who just at present sit in corners and confer on the latest Scandinavian Dante available in English translation. Dick turned to him, a curious falling in his whole countenance. His question was almost an appeal. What's the matter with you and Maury? You talk sometimes as though I were a sort of inferior. Anthony was confused, but he was also cold and a little uncomfortable, so he took refuge in attack. I don't think your brains matter, Dick. Of course they matter, exclaimed Dick angrily. What do you mean? Why don't they matter? You might know too much for your pen. I couldn't possibly. I can imagine, insisted Anthony, a man knowing too much for his talent to express, like me. Suppose, for instance, I have more wisdom than you, and less talent. It would tend to make me inarticulate. You, on the contrary, have enough water to fill the pail and a big enough pail to hold all the water. I don't follow you at all, complained Dick, in a crestfallen tone. Infinitely dismayed, he seemed to bulge in protest. He was staring intently at Anthony, and caroming off a succession of passers-by, who reproached him with fierce, resentful glances. I simply mean that a talent like Wells's could carry the intelligence of a Spencer, but an inferior talent can only be graceful when it's carrying inferior ideas, and the more narrowly you can look at a thing, the more entertaining you can be about it. Dick considered, unable to decide the exact degree of criticism intended by Anthony's remarks. But Anthony, with that facility which seemed so frequently to flow from him, continued, his dark eyes gleaming in his thin face, his chin raised, his voice raised, his whole physical being raised. Say I am proud and sane and wise, an Athenian among Greeks. Well, I might fail where a lesser man would succeed. He could imitate, he could adorn, he could be enthusiastic, he could be, hopefully, constructive. But this hypothetical me would be too proud to imitate, too sane to be enthusiastic, too sophisticated to be utopian, too Grecian to adorn. Then you don't think the artist works from his intelligence? No. He goes on improving, if he can, what he imitates in the way of style, and choosing from his own interpretation of the things around him what constitutes material. But after all, every writer writes because it's his mode of living. Don't tell me you like this divine function of the artist business. I'm not accustomed even to refer to myself as an artist. Dick, said Anthony, I want to beg your pardon. Why? For that outburst. I'm honestly sorry. I was talking for effect. Somewhat mollified, Dick rejoined. I've often said you were a Philistine at heart. It was a crackling dusk when they turned in under the white façade of the plaza and tasted slowly the foam and yellow thickness of an eggnog. Anthony looked at his companion. Richard Caramel's nose and brow were slowly approaching a like pigmentation. The red was leaving the one, the blue deserting the other. Glancing at a mirror, Anthony was glad to find that his own skin had not discolored. On the contrary, a faint glow had kindled in his cheeks. He fancied that he had never looked so well. "'Enough for me,' said Dick, his tone that of an athlete in training. "'I want to go up and see the Gilberts. Won't you come?' "'Why, yes, if you don't dedicate me to the parents and dash off in the corner with Dora.' "'Not Dora, Gloria.' A clerk announced them over the phone, and, ascending to the tenth floor, they followed a winding corridor and knocked at 1088. The door was answered by a middle-aged lady, Mrs. Gilbert herself. How do you do? She spoke in the conventional American lady-lady language. Well, I'm awfully glad to see you. Hasty interjections by Dick, and then, Mr. Patz? Well, do come in and leave your coat there. She pointed to a chair and changed her inflection to a deprecatory laugh, full of minute gasps. This is really lovely, lovely. Why, Richard, you haven't been here for so long. No, no. The latter monosyllables served half as responses, half as periods, to some vague starts from Dick. Well, do sit down and tell me what you've been doing. One crossed and recrossed. One stood and bowed ever so gently. One smiled again and again with helpless stupidity. One wondered if she would ever sit down. At length, one slid thankfully into a chair and settled for a pleasant call. I suppose it's because you've been busy as much as anything else, 
smiled Mrs. Gilbert, somewhat ambiguously. The, as much as anything else, she used to balance all her more rickety sentences. She had two other ones. At least that's the way I look at it. And pure and simple. These three, alternated, gave each of her remarks an air of being a general reflection on life, as though she had calculated all causes and, at length, put her finger on the ultimate one. Richard Caramel's face, Anthony saw, was now quite normal. The brow and cheeks were of a flesh color, the nose politely inconspicuous. He had fixed his aunt with the bright yellow eye, giving her that acute and exaggerated attention that young males are accustomed to render to all females who are of no further value. "'Are you a writer too, Mr. Patts?' "'Well, perhaps we can all bask in Richard's fame.' Gentle laughter led by Mrs. Gilbert. "'Gloria's out,' she said, with an air of laying down an axiom from which she would proceed to derive results. "'She's dancing somewhere. Gloria goes, goes, goes. I tell her I don't see how she stands it. She dances all afternoon and all night until I think she's going to wear herself to a shadow. Her father is very worried about her.' She smiled from one to the other. They both smiled. She was composed, Anthony perceived, of a succession of semicircles and parabolas, like those figures that gifted folk make on the typewriter. Head, arms, bust, hips, thighs, and ankles were in a bewildering tier of roundnesses. Well-ordered and clean she was, with hair of an artificially rich gray. Her large face sheltered weather-beaten blue eyes, and was adorned with just the faintest white mustache. "'I always say,' she remarked to Anthony, that Richard is an ancient soul. In the tense pause that followed, Anthony considered a pun, something about Dick having been much walked upon. "'We all have souls of different ages,' continued Mrs. Gilbert radiantly. "'At least that's what I say.' "'Perhaps so,' agreed Anthony, with an air of quickening to a hopeful idea. The voice bubbled on. "'Gloria has a very young soul, irresponsible as much as anything else. She has no sense of responsibility.' "'She's sparkling, Aunt Catherine,' said Richard pleasantly. "'A sense of responsibility would spoil her. She's too pretty.' "'Well,' confessed Mrs. Gilbert, "'all I know is that she goes and goes and goes.' The number of goings to Gloria's discredit was lost in the rattle of the doorknob as it turned to admit Mr. Gilbert. He was a short man with a mustache resting like a small white cloud beneath his undistinguished nose. He had reached the stage where his value as a social creature was a black and imponderable negative. His ideas were the popular delusions of twenty years before. His mind steered a wobbly and anemic course in the wake of the daily newspaper editorials. After graduating from a small but terrifying Western university, he had entered the celluloid business, and as this required only the minute measure of intelligence he brought to it, he did well for several years. In fact, until about 1911, when he began exchanging contracts for vague agreements with the moving picture industry. The moving picture industry had decided about 1912 to gobble him up, and at this time he was, so to speak, delicately balanced on its tongue. Meanwhile, he was supervising manager of the Associated Midwestern Film Materials Company, spending six months of each year in New York and the remainder in Kansas City and St. Louis. He felt credulously that there was a good thing coming to him, and his wife thought so, and his daughter thought so too. He disapproved of Gloria. She stayed out late, she never ate her meals, she was always in a mix-up. He had irritated her once, and she had used towards him words that he had not thought were part of her vocabulary. His wife was easier. After fifteen years of incessant guerrilla warfare he had conquered her. It was a war of muddled optimism against organized dullness. And something in the number of yeses with which he could poison a conversation had won him the victory. Yes, 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 he would say. Yes, 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 yes. Let me see. That was the summer of, let me see, ninety-one or ninety-two? Yes, 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 yes. Fifteen years of yeses had beaten Mrs. Gilbert. Fifteen further years of that incessant, unaffirmative affirmative, accompanied by the perpetual flicking of ash mushrooms from thirty-two thousand cigars, had broken her. To this husband of hers she made the last concession of married life, which is more complete, more irrevocable, than the first. She listened to him. She told herself that the years had brought her tolerance. Actually, they had slain what measure she had ever possessed of moral courage. She introduced him to Anthony. "'This is Mr. Patts,' she said. 
The young man and the old touched flesh. Mr. Gilbert's hand was soft, worn away to the pulpy semblance of a squeezed grapefruit. Then husband and wife exchanged greetings. He told her it had grown colder out. He said he had walked down to a newsstand on 44th Street for a Kansas City paper. He had intended to ride back in the bus, but he had found it too cold. Yes, 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 too cold. Mrs. Gilbert added flavor to his adventure by being impressed with his courage in braving the harsh air. "'Well, you are spunky!' she exclaimed admiringly. "'You are spunky. I wouldn't have gone out for anything.' Mr. Gilbert, with true masculine impassivity, disregarded the awe he had excited in his wife. He turned to the two young men and triumphantly routed them on the subject of the weather. Richard Caramel was called on to remember the month of November in Kansas. No sooner had the theme been pushed toward him, however, than it was violently fished back to be lingered over, pawed over, elongated, and generally devitalized by its sponsor. The immemorial thesis that the days somewhere were warm, but the nights very pleasant, was successfully propounded, and they decided the exact distance on an obscure railroad between two points that Dick had inadvertently mentioned. Anthony fixed Mr. Gilbert with a steady stare, and went into a trance through which, after a moment, Mrs. Gilbert's smiling voice penetrated. "'It seems as though the cold were damper here. It seems to eat into my bones.' As this remark, adequately yes, had been on the tip of Mr. Gilbert's tongue, he could not be blamed for rather abruptly changing the subject. "'Where's Gloria?' "'She ought to be here any minute. "'Have you met my daughter, Mr.?' "'Haven't had the pleasure. "'I've heard Dick speak of her often. "'She and Richard are cousins.' "'Yes?' "'Anthony smiled with some effort. "'He was not used to the society of his seniors, "'and his mouth was stiff from superfluous cheerfulness. "'It was such a pleasant thought about Gloria and Dick being cousins. "'He managed within the next minute "'to throw an agonized glance at his friend.' Richard Caramel was afraid they'd have to toddle off. Mrs. Gilbert was tremendously sorry. Mr. Gilbert thought it was too bad. Mrs. Gilbert had a further idea, something about being glad they'd come, anyhow, even if they'd only seen an old lady, way too old to flirt with them. Anthony and Dick evidently considered this a sly sally, for they laughed one bar in three-four time. Would they come again soon? Oh, yes. Gloria would be awfully sorry. Goodbye. Goodbye. Smiles, smiles, bang. Two disconsolate young men walking down the tenth floor corridor of the plaza in the direction of the elevator. A Lady's Legs Behind Maury Noble's attractive indolence, his irrelevance, and his easy mockery, lay a surprising and relentless maturity of purpose. His intention, as he stated it in college, had been to use three years in travel, three years in utter leisure, and then to become immensely rich as quickly as possible. His three years of travel were over. He had accomplished the globe with an intensity and curiosity that, in anyone else, would have seemed pedantic, without redeeming spontaneity, almost the self-editing of a human Baedeker. But, in this case, it assumed an air of mysterious purpose and significant design, as though more noble were some predestined antichrist, urged by a preordination to go everywhere there was to go, along the earth, and to see all the billions of humans who bred and wept and slew each other here and there upon it. Back in America he was sallying into the search for amusement with the same consistent absorption. He who had never taken more than a few cocktails or a pint of wine at his sitting taught himself to drink as he would have taught himself Greek. Like Greek, it would be the gateway to a wealth of new sensations, new psychic states, new reactions in joy or misery. His habits were a matter for esoteric speculation. He had three rooms in a bachelor apartment on 44th Street, but he was seldom to be found there. The telephone girl had received the most positive instructions that no one should even have his ear without first giving a name to be passed upon. She had a list of half a dozen people to whom he was never at home, and of the same number to whom he was always at home. Foremost on the latter list were Anthony Patch and Richard Caramel. Maury's mother lived with her married son in Philadelphia, and there Maury went usually for the weekends. So one Saturday night, when Anthony, prowling the chilly streets in a fit of utter boredom, dropped in at the Molten Arms, he was overjoyed to find that Mr. Noble was at home. His spirit soared faster than the flying elevator. This was so good, so extremely good, to be about to talk to Maury, who would be equally happy at seeing him. They would look at each other with a deep affection just behind their eyes, 
which both would conceal beneath some attenuated raillery. Had it been summer, they would have gone out together and indolently sipped two long Tom Collinses, as they wilted their collars, and watched the faintly diverting round of some lazy August cabaret. But it was cold outside, with wind around the edges of the tall buildings, and December just up the street, so better far an evening together under the soft lamplight and a drink or two of Bushmills or a thimbleful of Maury's Grand Marnier, with the books gleaming like ornaments against the walls, and Maury radiating a divine inertia as he rested, large and cat-like, in his favorite chair. There he was! The room closed about Anthony, warmed him. The glow of that strong persuasive mind, that temperament, almost oriental in its outward impassivity, warmed Anthony's restless soul, and brought him a peace that could be likened only to the peace a stupid woman gives. One must understand all, else one must take all for granted. Maury filled the room, tiger-like, godlike. The winds outside were stilled. The brass candlesticks on the mantel glowed like tapers before an altar. What keeps you here today? Anthony spread himself over a yielding sofa and made an elbow rest among the pillows. Just been here an hour. Tea dance and I stayed so late I missed my train to Philadelphia. Strange to stay so long, commented Anthony curiously. Rather. What'd you do? Geraldine. Little usher at Keith's. I told you about her. Oh. Paid me a call about three and stayed till five. Peculiar little soul. She gets me. She's so utterly stupid. Moria was silent. Strange as it may seem, continued Anthony, so far as I'm concerned, and even so far as I know, Geraldine is a paragon of virtue. He had known her a month, a girl of nondescript and nomadic habits. Someone had casually passed her on to Anthony, who considered her amusing and rather liked the chaste and fairy-like kisses she had given him on the third night of their acquaintance, when they had driven in a taxi through the park. She had a vague family, a shadowy aunt and uncle who shared with her an apartment in the labyrinthine hundreds. She was company familiar and faintly intimate and restful. Further than that, he did not care to experiment, not from any moral compunction, but from a dread of allowing any entanglement to disturb what he felt was the growing serenity of his life. She has two stunts, he informed Maury. One of them is to get her hair over her eyes some way and then blow it out, and the other is to say, you crazy, when someone makes a remark that's over her head. It fascinates me. I sit there hour after hour, completely intrigued by the maniacal symptoms she finds in my imagination. Maury stirred in his chair and spoke. Remarkable that a person can comprehend so little and yet live in such a complex civilization. A woman like that actually takes the whole universe in the most matter-of-fact way. From the influence of Rousseau to the bearing of the tariff rates on her dinner, the whole phenomenon is utterly strange to her. She'd just been carried along from an age of spearheads and plunked down here with the equipment of an archer for going into a pistol duel. You could sweep away the entire crust of history, and she'd never know the difference. I wish our Richard would write about her. Anthony, surely you don't think she's worth writing about? As much as anybody, he answered, yawning. You know, I was thinking today that I have a great confidence in Dick, so long as he sticks to people and not to ideas and as long as his inspirations come from life and not from art, and always granting a normal growth, I believe he'll be a big man. I should think the appearance of the black notebook would prove that he's going to life. Anthony raised himself on his elbow and answered eagerly. He tries to go to life. So does every author except the very worst. But, after all, most of them live on pre-digested food. The incident or character may be from life, but the writer usually interprets it in terms of the last book he read. For instance, suppose he meets a sea captain and thinks he's an original character. The truth is that he sees the resemblance between the sea captain and the last sea captain Dana created, or whoever creates sea captains, and therefore he knows how to set the sea captain on paper. Dick, of course, can set down any consciously picturesque character-like character, but could he accurately transcribe his own sister? Then they were off for half an hour on literature. A classic, suggested Anthony, is a successful book that has survived the reaction of the next period or generation. Then it's safe, like a style in architecture or furniture. It's acquired a picturesque dignity to take the place of its fashion. After a time, the subject temporarily lost its tang. The interest of the two young men was not particularly technical. 
They were in love with generalities. Anthony had recently discovered Samuel Butler, and the brisk aphorisms in the notebook seemed to him the quintessence of criticism. Maury, his whole mind so thoroughly mellowed by the very hardness of his scheme of life, seemed inevitably the wiser of the two, yet in the actual stuff of their intelligence they were not, it seemed, fundamentally different. They drifted from letters to the curiosities of each other's day. Whose tea was it? People named Abercrombie. Why'd you stay late? Meet a luscious debutante? Yes. Did you really? Anthony's voice lifted in surprise. Not a debutante, exactly. Said she came out two winters ago in Kansas City. Sort of a leftover? No, answered Maury with some amusement. I think that's the last thing I'd say about her. She seemed, well, somehow the youngest person there. Not too young to make you miss a train. Young enough. Beautiful child. Anthony chuckled in his one-syllable snort. Oh, Maury, you're in your second childhood. What do you mean by beautiful? Maury gazed helplessly into space. Well, I can't describe her exactly, except to say that she was beautiful. She was tremendously alive. She was eating gumdrops. What? It was a sort of attenuated vice. She's a nervous kind, said she always ate gumdrops at teas because she had to stand around so long in one place. What'd you talk about? Bergson? Bilfism? Whether the one step is immoral? Maury was unruffled. His fur seemed to run all ways. As a matter of fact, we did talk on Bilfism. Seems her mother's a Bilfist. Mostly, though, we talked about legs. Anthony rocked in glee. My God, whose legs? Hers. She talked a lot about hers. As though they were a sort of choice bric-a-brac. She roused a great desire to see them. What is she, a dancer? No, I found out she was a cousin of Dick's. Anthony sat upright so suddenly that the pillow he released stood on end like a live thing and dove to the floor. Name's Gloria Gilbert? he cried. Yes, isn't she remarkable? I'm sure I don't know, but for sheer dullness her father— Well, interrupted Maury with implacable conviction, her family may be as sad as professional mourners, but I'm inclined to think that she is a quite authentic and original character— the outer signs of the cut-and-dried Yale prom girl and all that, but different, very emphatically different. "'Go on, go on,' urged Anthony. "'Soon as Dick told me she didn't have a brain in her head, I knew she must be pretty good.' "'Did he say that?' "'Swore to it,' said Anthony, with another snorting laugh. "'Well, what he means by brains in a woman is—' "'I know,' interrupted Anthony eagerly. "'He means a smattering of literary misinformation.' "'That's it.' The kind who believes that the annual moral letdown of the country is a very good thing, or the kind who believes it's a very ominous thing. Either pince-nez or postures. Well, this girl talked about legs. She talked about skin, too, her own skin, always her own. She told me the sort of tan she'd like to get in the summer, and how closely she usually approximated it. You sat enraptured by her low alto? By her low alto? No, by tan. I began thinking about tan. I began to think what color I turned when I made my last exposure about two years ago. I did used to get a pretty good tan. I used to get a sort of bronze, if I remember rightly. Anthony retired into the cushions, shaken with laughter. She's got you going. Oh, Maury. Maury the Connecticut lifesaver. The human nutmeg. Extra. Eris elopes with Coast Guard because of his luscious pigmentation. Afterward found to be Tasmanian strain in his family. Maury sighed. Rising, he walked to the window and raised the shade. Snowing hard. Anthony, still laughing quietly to himself, made no answer. Another winter. Maury's voice from the window was almost a whisper. We're growing old, Anthony. I'm twenty-seven, by God, three years to thirty, and then I'm what an undergraduate calls a middle-aged man. Anthony was silent for a moment. You are old, Maury, he agreed at length. The first signs of a very dissolute and wobbly senescence. You have spent the afternoon talking about tan and a lady's legs. Maury pulled down the shade with a sudden harsh snap. Idiot, he cried. That from you. Here I sit, young Anthony, as I'll sit for a generation or more, and watch such gay souls as you and Dick and Gloria Gilbert go past me, dancing and singing and loving and hating one another, and being moved, being eternally moved. And I am moved only by my lack of emotion. I shall sit and the snow will come, oh, for a caramel to take notes, 
and another winter and I shall be thirty, and you and Dick and Gloria will go on being eternally moved, and dancing by me and singing. But after you've all gone, I'll be saying things for new dicks to write down, and listening to the disillusions and cynicisms and emotions of new Anthonys, yes, and talking to new Glorias about the tans and summers yet to come. The firelight flurried up on the hearth. Maury left the window, stirred the blaze with a poker, and dropped a log upon the andirons. Then he sat back in his chair, and the remnants of his voice faded in the new fire that spit red and yellow along the bark. After all, Anthony, it's you who are very romantic and young. It's you who are infinitely more susceptible and afraid of your calm being broken. It's me who tries again and again to be moved. Let myself go a thousand times, and I'm always me. Nothing quite stirs me. Yet, he murmured, after another long pause, there was something about that little girl with her absurd tan that was eternally old, like me. End of Book One, Chapter Two, Part One of Two Book One, Chapter Two, Part Two of Two of The Beautiful and Damned. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Beautiful and Damned by F. Scott Fitzgerald. Book One, Chapter Two Portrait of a Siren. Part Two of Two. Turbulence. Anthony turned over sleepily in his bed greeting a patch of cold sun on his counterpane, crisscrossed with the shadows of the leaded window. The room was full of mourning. The carved chest in the corner, the ancient and inscrutable wardrobe, stood about the room like dark symbols of the obliviousness of matter. Only the rug was beckoning and perishable to his perishable feet. And Bounds, horribly inappropriate in his soft collar, was of stuff as fading as the gauze of frozen breath he uttered. He was close to the bed, his hand still lowered, where he had been jerking at the upper blanket, his dark brown eyes fixed imperturbably upon his master. "'Bows,' muttered the drowsy god. "'That you, Bows?' "'It's I, sir.' Anthony moved his head, forced his eyes wide, and blinked triumphantly. "'Bounds.' "'Yes, sir?' "'Can you get off? Yeah! Oh, 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 God!' Anthony yawned insufferably, and the contents of his brain seemed to fall together in a dense hash. He made a fresh start. "'Can you come around about four and serve some tea and sandwiches or something?' "'Yes, sir.' Anthony considered it with chilling lack of inspiration. "'Some sandwiches,' he repeated helplessly. "'Oh, some cheese sandwiches and jelly ones and chicken and olive, I guess. Never mind breakfast.' The strain of invention was too much. He shut his eyes wearily, let his head roll to rest inertly, and quickly relaxed what he had regained of muscular control. Out of the crevice of his mind crept the vague but inevitable specter of the night before, but it proved in this case to be nothing but a seemingly interminable conversation with Richard Caramel, who had called on him at midnight. They had drunk four bottles of beer and munched dry crusts of bread, while Anthony listened to a reading of the first part of The Demon Lover. Came a voice now after many hours. Anthony disregarded it as sleep closed over him, folded down upon him, crept into the byways of his mind. Suddenly he was awake, saying, What? For how many, sir? It was still Bounds, standing patient and motionless at the foot of the bed, Bounds who divided his matter among three gentlemen. How many what? I think, sir, I'd better know how many are coming. I'll have to plan for the sandwiches, sir. Two, muttered Anthony huskily. Lady and a gentleman. Bounds said, Thank you, sir, and moved away, bearing with him his humiliating reproachful soft collar, reproachful to each of the three gentlemen, who only demanded of him a third. After a long time, Anthony arose and drew an opalescent dressing gown of brown and blue over his slim, pleasant figure. With a last yawn, he went into the bathroom, and turning on the dresser light, the bathroom had no outside exposure, he contemplated himself in the mirror with some interest. A wretched apparition, he thought. He usually thought so in the morning. Sleep made his face unnaturally pale. He lit a cigarette and glanced through several letters in the morning tribune. 
An hour later, shaven and dressed, he was sitting at his desk looking at a small piece of paper he had taken out of his wallet. It was scrawled with semi-legible memoranda. See Mr. Howland at five. Get hair cut. See about Rivers' bill. Go bookstore. And, under the last, cash in bank, six hundred and ninety dollars, crossed out, six hundred and twelve dollars, crossed out, six hundred and seven dollars. Finally, down at the bottom and in a hurried scrawl, Dick and Gloria Gilbert for tea. This last item brought him obvious satisfaction. His day, usually a jelly-like creature, a shapeless, spineless thing, had attained mesozoic structure. It was marching along surely, even jauntily, toward a climax, as a play should, as a day should. He dreaded the moment when the backbone of the day should be broken, when he should have met the girl at last, talked to her, then bowed her laughter out the door, were turning only to the melancholy dregs in the teacups and the gathering staleness of the uneaten sandwiches. There was a growing lack of color in Anthony's days. He felt it constantly and sometimes traced it to a talk he had had with Maury Noble a month before. That anything so ingenuous, so priggish, as a sense of waste should oppress him was absurd, but there was no denying the fact that some unwelcome survival of a fetish had drawn him three weeks before down to the public library, where, by the token of Richard Caramel's card, he had drawn out half a dozen books on the Italian Renaissance. That these books were still piled on his desk in the original order of carriage, that they were daily increasing his liabilities by twelve cents, was no mitigation of their testimony. They were cloth and morocco witnesses to the fact of his defection. Anthony had had several hours of acute and startling panic. In justification of his manner of living, there was first, of course, the meaninglessness of life. As aides and ministers, pages and squires, butlers and lackeys to this great con, there were a thousand books glowing on his shelves. There was his apartment and all the money that was to be his when the old man up the river should choke on his last morality. From a world fraught with the menace of debutantes and the stupidity of many Geraldines, he was thankfully delivered. Rather should he emulate the feline immobility of Maury and wear proudly the cumulative wisdom of the numbered generations. Over and against these things was something which his brain persistently analyzed and dealt with as a tiresome complex, but which, though logically disposed of and bravely trampled underfoot, had sent him out through the soft slush of late November to a library which had none of the books he most wanted. It is fair to analyze Anthony as far as he could analyze himself. Further than that, it is, of course, presumption. He found in himself a growing horror and loneliness. The idea of eating alone frightened him. In preference, he dined often with men he detested. Travel, which had once charmed him, seemed at length unendurable, a business of color without substance, a phantom chase after his own dream's shadow. If I am essentially weak, he thought, I need work to do, work to do. It worried him to think that he was, after all, a facile mediocrity, with neither the poise of Maury nor the enthusiasm of Dick. It seemed a tragedy to want nothing, and yet he wanted something, something. He knew in flashes what it was, some path of hope to lead him toward what he thought was an imminent and ominous old age. After cocktails and luncheon at the university club, Anthony felt better. He had run into two men from his class at Harvard, and in contrast to the gray heaviness of their conversation, his life assumed color. Both of them were married. One spent his coffee time in sketching an extra nuptial adventure to the bland and appreciative smiles of the other. Both of them, he thought, were Mr. Gilbert's in embryo. The number of their yeses would have to be quadrupled, their natures crabbed by twenty years. Then they would be no more than obsolete and broken machines, pseudo-wise and valueless, nursed to an utter senility by the women they had broken. Ah, he was more than that, as he paced the long carpet in the lounge after dinner, pausing at the window to look into the harried street. He was Anthony Patch, brilliant, magnetic, the heir of many years and many men. This was his world now, and that last strong irony he craved lay in the offing. With a stray boyishness he saw himself a power upon the earth. With his grandfather's money he might build his own pedestal and be a Talleyrand, a Lord Verulam. The clarity of his mind, its sophistication, its versatile intelligence, all at their maturity and dominated by some purpose yet to be born, would find him work to do. On this minor his dream faded. Work to do. 
He tried to imagine himself in Congress, rooting around in the litter of that incredible pigsty with the narrow and porcine brows he saw pictured sometimes in the rotogravure sections of the Sunday newspapers. Those glorified proletarians babbling blandly to the nation the ideas of high school seniors, little men with copybook ambitions, who by mediocrity had thought to emerge from mediocrity into the lusterless and unromantic heaven of a government by the people, and the best, the dozen shrewd men at the top, egotistic and cynical, were content to lead this choir of white ties and wire-collar buttons in a discordant and amazing hymn, compounded of a vague confusion between wealth as a reward of virtue and wealth as proof of vice, and continued cheers for God, the Constitution, and the Rocky Mountains. Lord Verilam, Talleyrand. Back in his apartment the grayness returned. His cocktails had died, making him sleepy, somewhat befogged, and inclined to be surly. Lord Verulam, he? The very thought was bitter. Anthony Patch, with no record of achievement, without courage, without strength to be satisfied with truth when it was given him. Oh, he was a pretentious fool, making careers out of cocktails and meanwhile regretting, weakly and secretly, the collapse of an insufficient and wretched idealism. He had garnished his soul in the subtlest taste, and now he longed for the old rubbish. He was empty, it seemed, empty as an old bottle. The buzzer rang at the door. Anthony sprang up and lifted the tube to his ear. It was Richard Caramel's voice, stilted and facetious. Announcing Miss Gloria Gilbert. The Beautiful Lady How do you do, he said, smiling and holding the door ajar. Dick bowed. Gloria, this is Anthony. Well, she cried, holding out a little gloved hand. Under her fur coat her dress was Alice Blue, with white lace crinkled stiffly about her throat. Let me take your things. Anthony stretched out his arms, and the brown mass of fur tumbled into them. Thanks. What do you think of her, Anthony? Richard Caramel demanded barbarously. Isn't she beautiful? Well, cried the girl, defiantly, withal unmoved. She was dazzling, a light. It was agony to comprehend her beauty in a glance. Her hair, full of a heavenly glamour, was gay against the winter colour of the room. Anthony moved about, magician-like, turning the mushroom lamp into an orange glory. The stirred fire burnished the copper andirons on the hearth. "'I'm a solid block of ice,' murmured Gloria casually, glancing around with eyes whose irises were of the most delicate and transparent bluish-white. "'What a slick fire! We found a place where you could stand on an iron bar grating, sort of, and it blew warm air up at you, but Dick wouldn't wait there with me. I told him to go on alone and let me be happy.' "'Conventional enough, this.' She seemed talking for her own pleasure, without effort. Anthony, sitting at one end of the sofa, examined her profile against the foreground of the lamp. The exquisite regularity of nose and upper lip, the chin, faintly decided, balanced beautifully on a rather short neck. On a photograph she must have been completely classical, almost cold, but the glow of her hair and cheeks, at once flushed and fragile, made her the most living person he had ever seen. "'Think you've got the best name I've heard,' she was saying, still apparently to herself. Her glance rested on him a moment, and then flitted past him, to the Italian bracket lamps clinging like luminous yellow turtles at intervals along the walls, to the books, row upon row, then to her cousin on the other side. "'Anthony Patch, only you ought to look sort of like a horse, with a long narrow face, and you ought to be in tatters.' "'That's all the Patch part, though. How should Anthony look?' "'You look like Anthony.' she assured him seriously. He thought, she had scarcely seen him, rather majestic, she continued, and solemn. Anthony indulged in a disconcerted smile. Only I like alliterative names, she went on, all except mine. Mine's too flamboyant. I used to know two girls named Jinx, though, and just think if they'd been named anything except what they were named. Judy Jinx and Jerry Jinx. Cute, what? Don't you think? Her childish mouth was parted, awaiting a rejoinder. Everybody in the next generation, suggested Dick, will be named Peter or Barbara, because at present all the piquant literary characters are named Peter or Barbara. Anthony continued the prophecy. Of course Gladys and Eleanor, having graced the last generation of heroines and being at present in their social prime, will be passed on to the next generation of shop girls. Displacing Ella and Stella, interrupted Dick, and Pearl and Jewel, Gloria added cordially, and Earl and Elmer and Minnie. "'And then I'll come along,' remarked Dick, 
and picking up the obsolete name, Jewel, I'll attach it to some quaint and attractive character, and it'll start its career all over again. Her voice took up the thread of subject, and wove along with faintly upturning, half-humorous intonations for sentence ends, as though defying interruption, and intervals of shadowy laughter. Dick had told her that Anthony's man was named Bounds. She thought that was wonderful. Dick had made some sad pun about Bounds doing patchwork. But if there was one thing worse than a pun, she said, it was a person who, as the inevitable comeback to a pun, gave the perpetrator a mock reproachful look. "'Where are you from?' inquired Anthony. He knew, but beauty had rendered him thoughtless. "'Kansas City, Missouri.' They put her out the same time they barred cigarettes. "'Did they bar cigarettes?' I see the hand of my holy grandfather. He's a reformer or something, isn't he? I blush for him. So do I, she confessed. I detest reformers, especially the sort who tried to reform me. Are there many of those? Dozens. It's, oh, Gloria, if you smoke so many cigarettes, you'll lose your pretty complexion. And, oh, Gloria, why don't you marry and settle down? Anthony agreed emphatically while he wondered who had had the temerity to speak thus to such a personage. And then, she continued, there are all the subtle reformers who tell you the wild stories they've heard about you and how they've been sticking up for you. He saw, at length, that her eyes were gray, very level and cool, and when they rested on him he understood what Maury had meant by saying she was very young and very old. She talked always about herself as a very charming child might talk, and her comments on her tastes and distastes were unaffected and spontaneous. I must confess, said Anthony gravely, that even I've heard one thing about you. Alert at once, she sat up straight. Those eyes, with the grayness and eternity of a cliff of soft granite, caught his. Tell me, I'll believe it. I always believe anything anyone tells me about myself, don't you? Invariably, agreed the two men in unison. Well, tell me. I'm not sure that I ought to, teased Anthony, smiling unwillingly. She was so obviously interested, in a state of almost laughable self-absorption. "'He means your nickname,' said her cousin. "'What name?' inquired Anthony, politely puzzled. Instantly she was shy. Then she laughed, rolled back against the cushions, and turned her eyes up as she spoke. "'Coast to coast, Gloria!' Her voice was full of laughter, laughter undefined as the varying shadows playing between fire and lamp upon her hair. "'Oh, Lord!' Still, Anthony was puzzled. What do you mean? Me, I mean. That's what some silly boys coined for me. Don't you see, Anthony, explained Dick, traveler of a nationwide notoriety and all that. Isn't that what you've heard? She's been called that for years, since she was seventeen. Anthony's eyes became sad and humorous. Who's this female Methuselah you've brought in here, a Caramel? She disregarded this, possibly rather resented it, for she switched back to the main topic. What have you heard of me? Something about your physique. Oh, she said, coolly disappointed. That all? Your tan. My tan? She was puzzled. Her hand rose to her throat, rested there an instant, as though the fingers were feeling variants of color. Do you remember Maury Noble, man you met about a month ago? You made a great impression. She thought a moment. I remember, but he didn't call me up. He was afraid to, I don't doubt. It was black dark without now, and Anthony wondered that his apartment had ever seemed gray. So warm and friendly were the books and pictures on the walls, and the good bounds offering tea from a respectful shadow, and the three nice people giving out waves of interest and laughter back and forth across the happy fire. Dissatisfaction On Thursday afternoon Gloria and Anthony had tea together in the grill room at the plaza. Her fur-trimmed suit was gray, because with gray you have to wear a lot of paint, she explained, and a small toque sat rakishly on her head, allowing yellow ripples of hair to wave out in jaunty glory. In the higher light it seemed to Anthony that her personality was infinitely softer. She seemed so young, scarcely eighteen. Her form under the tight sheath, known then as a hobble skirt, was amazingly supple and slender, and her hands, neither artistic nor stubby, were small as a child's hands should be. As they entered, the orchestra were sounding the preliminary whimpers to a mexis, a tune full of castanets and facile, faintly languorous violin harmonies, appropriate to the crowded winter grill teeming with an excited college crowd, high-spirited at the approach of the holidays. Carefully, 
Gloria considered several locations, and rather to Anthony's annoyance, paraded him circuitously to a table for two at the far side of the room. Reaching it, she again considered. Would she sit on the right or on the left? Her beautiful eyes and lips were very grave as she made her choice, and Anthony thought again how naive was her every gesture. She took all the things of life for hers to choose from and apportion, as though she were continually picking out presents for herself from an inexhaustible counter. Abstractedly, she watched the dancers for a few moments, commenting murmurously as a couple eddied near. There's a pretty girl in blue, and, as Anthony looked obediently, there, no, behind you, there. Yes, he agreed helplessly. You didn't see her. I'd rather look at you. I know, but she was pretty, except that she had big ankles. Was she? I mean, did she? He said indifferently. A girl's salutation came from a couple dancing close to them. Hello, Gloria. Oh, Gloria. Hello there. Who's that? He demanded. I don't know. Somebody. She caught sight of another face. Hello, Muriel. Then to Anthony. There's Muriel Kane. Now, I think she's attractive. Except not very. Anthony chuckled appreciatively. Attractive, except not very, he repeated. She smiled, and was interested immediately. Why is that funny? Her tone was pathetically intent. It just was. Do you want to dance? Do you? Sort of. But let's sit, she decided. And talk about you? You love to talk about you, don't you? Yes. Caught in the vanity, she laughed. I imagine your autobiography would be a classic. Dick says I haven't got one. Dick, he exclaimed, what does he know about you? Nothing. But he says the biography of every woman begins with the first kiss that counts and ends when her last child is laid in her arms. He's talking from his book. He says unloved women have no biographies. They have histories. Anthony laughed again. Surely you don't claim to be unloved. Well, I suppose not. Then why haven't you a biography? Haven't you ever had a kiss that counted? As the words left his lips, he drew in his breath sharply as though to suck them back. This baby. I don't know what you mean, counts, she objected. I wish you'd tell me how old you are. Twenty-two, she said, meeting his eyes gravely. How old did you think? About eighteen. I'm going to start being that. I don't like being twenty-two. I hate it more than anything in the world. Being twenty-two? No, getting old and everything. Getting married. Don't you ever want to marry? I don't want to have responsibility and a lot of children to take care of. Evidently, she did not doubt that on her lips all things were good. He waited rather breathlessly for her next remark, expecting it to follow up her last. She was smiling, without amusement, but pleasantly, and after an interval, half a dozen words fell into the space between them. I wish I had some gumdrops. You shall. He beckoned to a waiter and sent him to the cigar counter. Do you mind? I love gumdrops. Everybody kids me about it because I'm always whacking away at one, whenever my daddy's not around. Not at all. Who are all these children? he asked suddenly. Do you know them all? Why, no. But they're from, oh, from everywhere, I suppose. Don't you ever come here? Very seldom. I don't care particularly for nice girls. Immediately he had her attention. She turned a definite shoulder to the dancers, relaxed in her chair, and demanded, What do you do with yourself? Thanks to a cocktail, Anthony welcomed the question. In a mood to talk, he wanted, moreover, to impress this girl, whose interests seemed so tantalizingly elusive. She stopped to browse in unexpected pastures, hurried quickly over the inobviously obvious. He wanted to pose. He wanted to appear suddenly to her in novel and heroic colors. He wanted to stir her from that casualness she showed toward everything except herself. I do nothing, he began, realizing simultaneously that his words were to lack the debonair grace he craved for them. I do nothing, for there's nothing I can do that's worth doing. Well? He had neither surprised her, nor even held her, yet she had certainly understood him, if indeed he said aught worth understanding. Don't you approve of lazy men? She nodded. I suppose so, if they're gracefully lazy. Is that possible for an American? Why not? he demanded, discomfited but her mind had left the subject and wandered up ten floors. My daddy's mad at me, she observed dispassionately. Why? 
but I want to know just why it's impossible for an American to be gracefully idle. His words gathered conviction. It astonishes me. It, it, I don't understand why people think that every young man ought to go downtown and work ten hours a day for the best twenty years of his life at dull, unimaginative work, certainly not altruistic work. He broke off. She watched him inscrutably. He waited for her to agree or disagree, but she did neither. Don't you ever form judgments on things? he asked with some exasperation. She shook her head, and her eyes wandered back to the dancers as she answered. I don't know. I don't know anything about what you should do or what anybody should do. She confused him and hindered the flow of his ideas. Self-expression had never seemed at once so desirable and so impossible. Well, he admitted apologetically, neither do I, of course, but— I just think of people, she continued, whether they seem right where they are and fit into the picture. I don't mind if they don't do anything. I don't see why they should. In fact, it always astonishes me when anybody does anything. You don't want to do anything? I want to sleep. For a second he was startled, almost as though she had meant this literally. Sleep? Sort of. I want to just be lazy and I want some of the people around me to be doing things, because that makes me feel comfortable and safe and I want some of them to be doing nothing at all, because they can be graceful and companionable for me. But I never want to change people or get excited over them. You're a quaint little determinist, laughed Anthony. It's your world, isn't it? Well, she said, with a quick upward glance, isn't it? As long as I'm young. She had paused slightly before the last word, and Anthony suspected that she had intended to say beautiful. It was undeniably what she had intended. Her eyes brightened, and he waited for her to enlarge on the theme. He had drawn her out, at any rate. He bent forward slightly to catch the words. But, let's dance, was all she said. Admiration That winter afternoon at the plaza was the first of a succession of dates Anthony made with her in the blurred and stimulating days before Christmas. Invariably she was busy. What particular strata of the city's social life claimed her he was a long time finding out. It seemed to matter very little. She attended the semi-public charity dances at the big hotels. He saw her several times at dinner parties in Sherry's, and once, as he waited for her to dress, Mrs. Gilbert, apropos of her daughter's habit of going, rattled off an amazing holiday program that included half a dozen dances to which Anthony had received cards. He made engagements with her several times for lunch and tea. The former were hurried, and, to him at least, rather unsatisfactory occasions, for she was sleepy-eyed and casual, incapable of concentrating upon anything or of giving consecutive attention to his remarks. When after two of these sallow meals he accused her of tendering him the skin and bones of the day, she laughed and gave him a tea-time three days off. This was infinitely more satisfactory. One Sunday afternoon, just before Christmas, he called up and found her in the lull directly after some important but mysterious quarrel. She informed him, in a tone of mingled wrath and amusement, that she had sent a man out of her apartment, here Anthony speculated violently, and that the man had been giving a little dinner for her that very night, and that of course she wasn't going, so Anthony took her to supper. "'Let's go to something,' she proposed as they went down in the elevator. "'I want to see a show, don't you?' Inquiry at the hotel ticket desk disclosed only two Sunday night concerts. They're always the same, she complained unhappily. Same old Yiddish comedians. Oh, let's go somewhere. To conceal a guilty suspicion that he should have arranged a performance of some kind for her approval, Anthony affected a knowing cheerfulness. We'll go to a good cabaret. I've seen everyone in town. Well, we'll find a new one. She was in wretched humor, that was evident. Her gray eyes were granite now, indeed. When she wasn't speaking, she stared straight in front of her as if at some distasteful abstraction in the lobby. Well, come on, then. He followed her, a graceful girl, even in her enveloping fur, out to a taxicab, and, with an air of having a definite place in mind, instructed the driver to go over to Broadway and then turn south. He made several casual attempts at conversation, but as she adopted an impenetrable armor of silence, and answered him in sentences as morose as the cold darkness of the taxicab, he gave up, and, assuming a like mood, fell into a dim gloom. A dozen blocks down Broadway, Anthony's eyes were caught by a large and unfamiliar electric sign spelling Marathon in glorious yellow script, 
adorned with electrical leaves and flowers that alternately vanished and beamed upon the wet and glistening street. He leaned and rapped on the taxi window, and in a moment was receiving information from a colored doorman. Yes, this was a cabaret, fine cabaret, best show in the city. Shall we try it? With a sigh, Gloria tossed her cigarette out the open door and prepared to follow it. Then they had passed under the screaming sign, under the wide portal, and up by a stuffy elevator into this unsung palace of pleasure. The gay habitats of the very rich and the very poor, the very dashing and the very criminal, not to mention the lately exploited very bohemian, are made known to the odd high school girls of Augusta, Georgia, and Red Wing, Minnesota, not only through the bepictured and entrancing spreads of the Sunday theatrical supplements, but through the shocked and alarmful eyes of Mr. Rupert Hughes and other chroniclers of the mad pace of America. But the excursions of Harlem onto Broadway, the deviltries of the dull, and the revelries of the respectable are a matter of esoteric knowledge only to the participants themselves. A tip circulates, and in the place knowingly mentioned, gather the lower moral classes on Saturday and Sunday nights, the little troubled men who are pictured in the comics as the consumer or the public. They have made sure that the place has three qualifications. It is cheap, it imitates with a sort of shoddy and mechanical wistfulness the glittering antics of the great cafes in the theatre district, and, this above all important, it is a place where they can take a nice girl, which means, of course, that everyone has become equally harmless, timid, and uninteresting through lack of money and imagination. There on Sunday nights gather the credulous, sentimental, underpaid, overworked people with hyphenated occupations, bookkeepers, ticket sellers, office managers, salesmen, and, most of all, clerks, clerks of the express, of the mail, of the grocery, of the brokerage, of the bank. With them are their giggling, over-gestured, pathetically pretentious women, who grow fat with them, bear them too many babies, and float helpless and uncontent in a colorless sea of drudgery and broken hopes. They name these Brummagem cabarets after Pullman cars. The Marathon, not for them the salacious similes borrowed from the cafés of Paris. This is where their docile patrons bring their nice women, whose starved fancies are only too willing to believe that the scene is comparatively gay and joyous, even faintly immoral. This is life. Who cares for the morrow? Abandoned people? Anthony and Gloria, seated, looked about them. At the next table, a party of four were in process of being joined by a party of three, two men and a girl, who were evidently late, and the manner of the girl was a study in national sociology. She was meeting some new men, and she was pretending desperately. By gesture she was pretending, and by words, and by the scarcely perceptible motionings of her eyelids, that she belonged to a class a little superior to the class with which she now had to do, that a while ago she had been, and presently would again be, in a higher, rarer air. She was almost painfully refined. She wore a last year's hat, covered in violets, no more yearningly pretentious and palpably artificial than herself. Fascinated, Anthony and Gloria watched the girl sit down and radiate the impression that she was only condescendingly present. For me, her eyes said, this is practically a slumming expedition, to be cloaked with belittling laughter and semi-apologetics and the other women passionately poured out the impression that though they were in the crowd they were not of it. This was not the sort of place to which they were accustomed. They had dropped in because it was nearby and convenient. Every party in the restaurant poured out that impression. Who knew? They were forever changing class, all of them, the women often marrying above their opportunities, the men striking suddenly a magnificent opulence, a sufficiently preposterous advertising scheme, a celestialized ice-cream cone. Meanwhile, they met here to eat, closing their eyes to the economy displayed in infrequent changing of the tablecloths, in the casualness of the cabaret performers, most of all, in the colloquial carelessness and familiarity of the waiters. One was sure that these waiters were not impressed by their patrons. One expected that presently they would sit at the tables. "'Do you object to this?' inquired Anthony. Gloria's face warmed, and for the first time that evening she smiled. "'I love it,' she said frankly. It was impossible to doubt her. Her gray eyes roved here and there, drowsing, idle or alert, on each group, passing to the next with unconcealed enjoyment, and to Anthony were made plain the different values of her profile, the wonderfully alive expressions of her mouth, 
and the authentic distinction of face and form and manner that made her like a single flower amidst a collection of cheap bric-a-brac. At her happiness, a gorgeous sentiment welled into his eyes, choked him up, set his nerves a-tingle, and filled his throat with husky and vibrant emotion. There was a hush upon the room. The careless violins and saxophones, the shrill rasping complaint of a child nearby, the voice of the violet-headed girl at the next table, all moved slowly out, receded, and fell away like shadowy reflections on the shining floor. And they too, it seemed to him, were alone and infinitely remote, quiet. Surely the freshness of her cheeks was a gossamer projection from a land of delicate and undiscovered shades. Her hand gleaming on the stained tablecloth was a shell from some far and wildly virginal sea. Then the illusion snapped like a nest of threads. The room grouped itself around him. Voices, faces, movement. The garish shimmer of the lights overhead became real, became portentous. Breath began. The slow respiration that she and he took in time with his docile hundred the rise and fall of bosoms, the eternal meaninglessness play and interplay, and tossing and reiterating of word and phrase, all these wrenched his senses open to the suffocating pressure of life. And then her voice came at him, cool as the suspended dream he had left behind. "'I belong here,' she murmured. "'I'm like these people.' For an instant this seemed a sardonic and unnecessary paradox hurled at him across the impassable distances she created about herself." Her entrancement had increased. Her eyes rested upon the Semitic violinist who swayed his shoulders to the rhythm of the year's mellowest fox-trot. Something goes, ring-a-ting-a-ling-a-ling, -a -ling, right in your ear. Again she spoke, from the center of this pervasive illusion of her own. It amazed him. It was like blasphemy from the mouth of a child. I'm like they are, like Japanese lanterns and crepe paper, and the music of that orchestra. You're a young idiot he insisted wildly. She shook her blonde head. No, I'm not. I am like them. You ought to see... You don't know me. She hesitated, and her eyes came back to him, rested abruptly on his, as though surprised at the last to see him there. I've got a streak of what you'd call cheapness. I don't know where I get it, but it's... Oh, things like this, and bright colors, and gaudy vulgarity. I seem to belong here. These people could appreciate me and take me for granted, and these men would fall in love with me and admire me, whereas the clever men I meet would just analyze me and tell me I'm this because of this or that because of that. Anthony, for the moment, wanted fiercely to paint her, to set her down now, as she was, as with each relentless second she could never be again. "'What were you thinking?' she asked. "'Just that I'm not a realist,' he said, and then— no, only the romanticist preserves the things worth preserving. Out of the deep sophistication of Anthony an understanding formed, nothing atavistic or obscure, indeed scarcely physical at all, an understanding remembered from the romancings of many generations of minds, that as she talked and caught his eyes and turned her lovely head, she moved him as he had never been moved before. The sheath that held her soul had assumed significance, that was all. She was a sun, radiant, growing, gathering light and storing it, then, after an eternity, pouring it forth in a glance, the fragment of a sentence, to that part of him that cherished all beauty and all illusion. End of Book One, Chapter Two, Part Two of Two Book One, Chapter Three, Part One of Two of The Beautiful and Damned. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Beautiful and Damned by F. Scott Fitzgerald. Book One, Chapter Three The Connoisseur of Kisses. Part One of Two. From his undergraduate days, as editor of the Harvard Crimson, Richard Carable had desired to write. But as a senior he had picked up the glorified illusion that certain men were set aside for service, and, going into the world, were to accomplish a vague yearnful something which would react either in eternal reward or, at the least, in the personal satisfaction of having striven for the greatest good of the greatest number. This spirit has long rocked the colleges in America. It begins, as a rule, 
during the immaturities and facile impressions of freshman year, sometimes back in preparatory school. Prosperous apostles known for their emotional acting go the rounds of the universities, and, by frightening the amiable sheep and dulling the quickening of interest and intellectual curiosity which is the purpose of all education, distill a mysterious conviction of sin, harking back to childhood crimes and to the ever-present menace of women. To these lectures go the wicked youths to cheer and joke, and the timid to swallow the tasty pills, which would be harmless if administered to farmers' wives and pious drug clerks, but a rather dangerous medicine for these future leaders of men. This octopus was strong enough to wind a sinuous tentacle about Richard Caramel. The year after his graduation it called him into the slums of New York to muck about with bewildered Italians as secretary to an alien young men's rescue association. He labored at it over a year before the monotony began to weary him. The aliens kept coming inexhaustibly, Italians, Poles, Scandinavians, Czechs, Armenians, with the same wrongs, the same exceptionally ugly faces, and very much the same smells, though he fancied that these grew more profuse and diverse as the months passed. His eventual conclusions about the expediency of service were vague, but concerning his own relation to it, they were abrupt and decisive. Any amiable young man, his head ringing with the latest crusade, could accomplish as much as he could with the debris of Europe, and it was time for him to write. He had been living in a downtown YMCA, but when he quit the task of making sow ear purses out of sow's ears, he moved uptown and went to work immediately as a reporter for the Sun. He kept at this for a year, doing desultory writing on the side, with little success, and then one day an infelicitous incident peremptorily closed his newspaper career. On a February afternoon he was assigned to report a parade of Squadron A. Snow threatening, he went to sleep instead before a hot fire, and when he woke up did a smooth column about the muffled beats of the horse's hooves in the snow. This he handed in. Next morning a marked copy of the paper was sent down to the city editor with a scrawled note, Fire the man who wrote this. It seemed that Squadron A had also seen the snow threatening, and had postponed the parade until another day. A week later he had begun The Demon Lover. In January, the Monday of the months, Richard Caramel's nose was blue constantly, a sardonic blue, vaguely suggestive of the flames licking around a sinner. His book was nearly ready, and as it grew in completeness it seemed to grow also in its demands, sapping him, overpowering him, until he walked haggard and conquered in its shadow. Not only to Anthony and Maury did he pour out his hopes and boasts and indecisions, but to anyone who could be prevailed upon to listen. He called on polite but bewildered publishers, he discussed it with his casual vis-à-vis -vis at the Harvard Club, it was even claimed by Anthony that he had been discovered, one Sunday night, debating the transposition of Chapter 2 with a literary ticket collector in the chill and dismal recesses of a Harlem subway station. And, latest among his confidants was Mrs. Gilbert, who sat with him by the hour and alternated between bilphism and literature in an intense crossfire. Shakespeare was a bilphist, she assured him through a fixed smile. Oh yes, he was a bilphist, it's been proved. At this Dick would look a bit blank. If you read Hamlet you can't help but see. Well, he lived in a more credulous age, a more religious age. But she demanded the whole loaf. Oh, yes, but you see, Bilphism isn't a religion. It's the science of all religions. She smiled defiantly at him. This was the bon mot of her belief. There was something in the arrangement of words which grasped her mind so definitely that the statement became superior to any obligation to define itself. It is not unlikely that she would have accepted any idea encased in this radiant formula, which was perhaps not a formula. It was the reductio ad absurdum of all formulas. Then, eventually, but gorgeously, would come Dick's turn. You've heard of the new poetry movement. You haven't? Well, it's a lot of young poets that are breaking away from the old forms and doing a lot of good. Well, what I was going to say was that my book is going to start a new prose movement, a sort of renaissance. I'm sure it will, beamed Mrs. Gilbert. I'm sure it will. I went to Jenny Martin last Tuesday, the palmist, you know, that everyone's mad about. I told her my nephew was engaged upon a work, and she said she knew I'd be glad to hear that his success would be extraordinary. But she'd never seen you or known anything about you, not even your name. 
having made the proper noises to express his amazement at this astounding phenomenon dick waved her theme by him as though he were an arbitrary traffic policeman and so to speak beckoned forward his own traffic i'm absorbed aunt catherine he assured her i really am all my friends are joshing me oh i see the humor in it and i don't care i think a person ought to be able to take joshing but i've got a sort of conviction he concluded gloomily you're an ancient soul i always say maybe i am dick had reached the stage where he no longer fought but submitted he must be an ancient soul he fancied grotesquely so old as to be absolutely rotten however the reiteration of the phrase still somewhat embarrassed him and sent uncomfortable shivers up his back he changed the subject where is my distinguished cousin gloria she's on the go somewhere with someone dick paused considered and then screwing up his face into what was evidently begun as a smile but ended as a terrifying frown delivered a comment i think my friend anthony patch is in love with her mrs gilbert started beamed a half second too late and breathed her really in the tone of a detective play whisper i think so corrected dick gravely she's the first girl i've ever seen him with so much well of course said mrs gilbert with meticulous carelessness. Gloria never makes me her confidant. She's very secretive. Between you and me, she bent forward cautiously, obviously determined that only heaven and her nephew should share her confession. Between you and me, I'd like to see her settle down. Dick arose and paced the floor earnestly, a small, active, already rotund young man, his hands thrust unnaturally into his bulging pockets. I'm not claiming I'm right, mind you, he assured the infinitely of the hotel steel engraving which smirked respectably back at him i'm saying nothing that i'd want gloria to know but i think mad anthony is interested tremendously so he talks about her constantly in anyone else that'd be a bad sign gloria is a very young soul began mrs gilbert eagerly but her nephew interrupted with a hurried sentence gloria'd be a very young nut not to marry him he stopped and faced her his expression a battle-map of lines and dimples, squeezed and strained to its ultimate show of intensity, this as if to make up by his sincerity for any indiscretion in his words. Gloria's a wild one, Aunt Catherine. She's uncontrollable. How she's done it, I don't know, but lately she's picked up a lot of the funniest friends. She doesn't seem to care. And the men she used to go with around New York were— He paused for breath. Yes, yes, yes interjected mrs gilbert with an anemic attempt to hide the immense interest with which she listened well continued richard caramel gravely there it is i mean that the men she went with and the people she went with used to be first-rate now they aren't mrs gilbert blinked very fast her bosom trembled inflated remained so for an instant and with the exhalation her words flowed out in a torrent she knew she cried in a whisper Oh, yes, mothers see these things, but what could she do? He knew Gloria. He'd seen enough of Gloria to know how hopeless it was to try to deal with her. Gloria had been so spoiled, in a rather complete and unusual way. She had been suckled until she was three, for instance, when she could probably have chewed sticks. Perhaps, one never knew, it was this that had given her that health and hardiness to her whole personality. And then, ever since she was twelve years old, she'd had boys about her so thick oh, so thick one couldn't move. At sixteen she began going to dances at preparatory schools, and then came the colleges, and everywhere she went, boys, boys, boys. At first, oh, until she was eighteen, there had been so many that it never seemed one any more than the others, but then she began to single them out. She knew there had been a string of affairs spread over about three years, perhaps a dozen of them altogether. Sometimes the men were undergraduates, sometimes just out of college. They lasted on an average of several months each, with short attractions in between. Once or twice they had endured longer, and her mother had hoped she would be engaged, but always a new one came, a new one. The men? Oh, she made them miserable, literally. There was only one who had kept any sort of dignity, and he had been a mere child, young Carter Kirby of Kansas City, who was so conceited anyway that he just sailed out on his vanity one afternoon and left for Europe next day with his father. The others had been wretched. They never seemed to know when she was tired of them, and Gloria had seldom been deliberately unkind. They would keep phoning, writing letters to her, trying to see her, making long trips after her around the country. 
Some of them had confided in Mrs. Gilbert, told her with tears in their eyes that they would never get over Gloria. At least two of them had since married, though. But Gloria, it seemed, struck to kill. To this day Mr. Carstairs called up once a week and sent her flowers which she no longer bothered to refuse. Several times, twice at least, Mrs. Gilbert knew it had gone as far as a private engagement, with Tudor Baird and that Holcomb boy at Pasadena. She was sure it had, because this must go no further. She had come in unexpected, and found Gloria acting, well, very much engaged indeed. She had not spoken to her daughter, of course. She had had a certain sense of delicacy, and, besides, each time she had expected an announcement in a few weeks. But the announcement never came. Instead, a new man came. Scenes! Young men walking up and down the library like caged tigers, young men glaring at each other in the hall as one came and the other left, young men calling up on the telephone and being hung up upon in desperation, young men threatening South America, young men writing the most pathetic letters. She said nothing to this effect, but Dick fancied that Mrs. Gilbert's eyes had seen some of these letters. And Gloria, between tears and laughter, sorry, glad, out of love and in love, miserable, nervous, cool, amidst a great returning of presents, substitution of pictures and immemorial frames, and taking of hot baths, and beginning again, with the next. That state of things continued, assumed an air of permanency. Nothing harmed Gloria or changed her or moved her. And then, out of a clear sky one day, she informed her mother that undergraduates wearied her. She was absolutely going to no more college dances. This had begun the change, not so much in her actual habits, for she danced, and had as many dates as ever, but they were dates in a different spirit. Previously it had been a sort of pride, a matter of her own vainglory. She had been, probably, the most celebrated and sought-after young beauty in the country, Gloria Gilbert of Kansas City. She had fed on it ruthlessly, enjoying the crowds around her, the manner in which the most desirable men singled her out, enjoying the fierce jealousy of other girls, enjoying the fabulous, not to say scandalous, and, her mother was glad to say, entirely unfounded rumors about her. For instance, that she had gone in the Yale swimming pool one night in a chiffon evening dress. And from loving it with a vanity that was almost masculine, it had been in the nature of a triumphant and dazzling career. She became suddenly an aesthetic to it. She retired. She who had dominated countless parties, who had blown fragrantly through many ballrooms to the tender tribute of many eyes, seemed to care no longer. He who fell in love with her now was dismissed utterly, almost angrily. She went listlessly with the most indifferent men. She continually broke engagements, not as in the past from a cool assurance that she was irreproachable, that the men she insulted would return like a domestic animal, but indifferently, without contempt or pride. She rarely stormed at men any more. She yawned at them. She seemed, and it was so strange, she seemed to her mother to be growing cold. Richard Caramel listened. At first he had remained standing, but as his aunt's discourse waxed in content, it stands here pruned by half, of all side references to the youth of Gloria's soul and to Mrs. Gilbert's own mental distresses, he drew a chair up and attended rigorously as she floated, between tears and plaintive helplessness, down the long story of Gloria's life. When she came to the tale of this last year, a tale of the ends of cigarettes left all over New York in little trays marked Midnight Frolic and Justine Johnson's Little Club, he began nodding his head slowly, then faster and faster, until, as she finished on a staccato note, it was bobbing briskly up and down, absurdly like a doll's wired head, and expressing almost anything. In a sense Gloria's past was an old story to him. He had followed it with the eyes of a journalist, for he was going to write a book about her some day. But his interests, just at present, were family interests. He wanted to know, in particular, who was this Joseph Blockman that he had seen her with several times, and those two girls she was with constantly, this Rachel Gerald and this Miss Kane? Surely Miss Kane wasn't exactly the sort one would associate with Gloria. But the moment had passed. Mrs. Gilbert, having climbed the hill of exposition, was about to glide swiftly down the ski-jump of collapse. Her eyes were like a blue sky seen through two round red window casements. The flesh about her mouth was trembling and at the moment the door opened, admitting into the room Gloria and the two young ladies lately mentioned. Two young women. Well, how do you do, Mrs. Gilbert? 
Miss Kane and Miss Gerald are presented to Mr. Richard Caramel. This is Dick. Laughter. I've heard so much about you, says Miss Kane, between a giggle and a shout. How do you do? says Miss Gerald shyly. Richard Caramel tries to move about as if his figure were better. He is torn between his innate cordiality and the fact that he considers these girls rather common, not at all the farm-over type. Gloria has disappeared into the bedroom. Do sit down, beams Mrs. Gilbert, who is by now quite herself. Take off your things. Dick is afraid she will make some remark about the age of his soul, but he forgets his qualms in completing a conscientious novelist's examination of the two young women. Muriel Kane had originated in a rising family of East Orange. She was short rather than small, and hovered audaciously between plumpness and width. Her hair was black and elaborately arranged. This, in conjunction with her handsome, rather bovine eyes and her over-red lips, combined to make her resemble Thedabara, the prominent motion-picture actress. People told her constantly that she was a vampire, and she believed them. She suspected, hopefully, that they were afraid of her, and she did her utmost under all circumstances to give the impression of danger. An imaginative man could see the red flag that she constantly carried, waving it wildly, beseechingly, and, alas, to little spectacular avail. She was also tremendously timely. She knew the latest songs, all the latest songs. When one of them was played on the phonograph, she would rise to her feet and rock her shoulders back and forth and snap her fingers, and if there was no music she would accompany herself by humming. Her conversation was also timely. I don't care, she would say. I should worry and lose my figure. And again, I can't make my feet behave when I hear that tune. Oh, baby! Her fingernails were too long and ornate, polished to a pink and unnatural fever. Her clothes were too tight, too stylish, too vivid, her eyes too roguish, her smile too coy. She was almost pitifully overemphasized from head to foot. The older girl was obviously a more subtle personality. She was an exquisitely dressed Jewess, with dark hair and a lovely milky pallor. She seemed shy and vague, and these two qualities accentuated a rather delicate charm that floated about her. Her family were Episcopalians, owned three smart women's shops along Fifth Avenue, and lived in a magnificent apartment on Riverside Drive. It seemed to Dick, after a few moments, that she was attempting to imitate Gloria. He wondered that people invariably chose inimitable people to imitate. We had the most hectic time, Muriel was exclaiming enthusiastically. There was a crazy woman behind us on the bus. She was absolutely, positively nutty. She kept talking to herself about something she'd like to do to somebody or something. I was petrified, but Gloria simply wouldn't get off. Mrs. Gilbert opened her mouth, properly awed. Really? Oh, she was crazy. But we should worry. She didn't hurt us. Ugly. Gracious. The man across from us said her face ought to be on a night nurse in a home for the blind, and we all howled, naturally, so the man tried to pick us up. Presently Gloria emerged from her bedroom, and in unison every eye turned to her. The two girls receded into a shadowy background, unperceived, unmissed. "'We've been talking about you,' said Dick quickly, your mother and I. "'Well,' said Gloria. A pause. Muriel turned to Dick. You're a great writer, aren't you? I'm a writer, he confessed sheepishly. I always say, said Muriel earnestly, that if I ever had the time to write down all my experiences, it'd make a wonderful book. Rachel giggled sympathetically. Richard Caramel's bow was almost stately. Muriel continued, But I don't see how you can sit down and do it. And poetry, lordy, I can't make two lines rhyme. Well, I should worry. Richard Caramel, with difficulty, restrained a shout of laughter. Gloria was chewing an amazing gumdrop and staring moodily out the window. Mrs. Gilbert cleared her throat and beamed. "'But you see,' she said, in a sort of universal exposition, "'you're not an ancient soul, like Richard.' The ancient soul breathed a gasp of relief. It was out at last. Then, as if she had been considering it for five minutes, Gloria made a sudden announcement. "'I'm going to give a party.' "'Oh, can I come?' cried Muriel with facetious daring. A dinner. Seven people. Muriel and Rachel and I, and you, Dick and Anthony, and that man named Noble. I liked him. And Blockman. Muriel and Rachel went into soft and purring ecstasies of enthusiasm. Mrs. Gilbert blinked and beamed. With an air of casualness, Dick broke in with a question. 
Who is this fellow Blockman, Gloria? Scenting a faint hostility, Gloria turned to him. Joseph Blockman? He's the moving picture man, vice president of Films Par Excellence. He and father do a lot of business. Oh. Well, will you all come? They would all come. A date was arranged within the week. Dick rose, adjusted hat, coat, and muffler, and gave out a general smile. Bye-bye, said Muriel, waving her hand gaily. Call me up some time. Richard Caramel blushed for her. Deplorable End of the Chevalier O'Keefe It was Monday, and Anthony took Geraldine Burke to luncheon at the Beaux-Arts. Afterward they went up to his apartment, and he wheeled out the little rolling table that held his supply of liquor, selecting vermouth, gin, and absinthe for a proper stimulant. Geraldine Burke, usher at Keith's, had been an amusement of several months. She demanded so little that he liked her, for since a lamentable affair with a debutante the preceding summer, when he had discovered that after half a dozen kisses a proposal was expected, he had been wary of girls of his own class. It was only too easy to turn a critical eye on their imperfections, some physical harshness or a general lack of personal delicacy. But a girl who was usher at Keith's was approached with a different attitude. One could tolerate qualities in an intimate valet that would be unforgivable in a mere acquaintance on one social level. Geraldine, curled up at the foot of the lounge, considered him with narrow, slanting eyes. "'You drink all the time, don't you?' she said suddenly. "'Why, I suppose so,' replied Anthony, in some surprise. "'Don't you?' "'Nope. I go on parties sometimes, you know, about once a week, but I only take two or three drinks. You and your friends keep on drinking all the time. I should think you'd ruin your health.' Anthony was somewhat touched. "'Why, aren't you sweet to worry about me?' Well, I do. I don't drink so very much, he declared. Last month I didn't touch a drop for three weeks, and I only get really tight about once a week. But you have something to drink every day, and you're only twenty-five. Haven't you any ambition? Think what you'll be at forty. I sincerely trust that I won't live that long. She clicked her tongue with her teeth. You crazy, she said, as he mixed another cocktail, and then, Are you any relation to Adam Patch? Yes, he's my grandfather. Really? She was obviously thrilled. Absolutely. That's funny. My daddy used to work for him. He's a queer old man. Is he nice? She demanded. Well, in private life he's seldom unnecessarily disagreeable. Tell us about him. Why, Anthony considered, he's all shrunken up, and he's got the remains of some gray hair that always looks as though the wind were in it. He's very moral. He's done a lot of good, said Geraldine, with intense gravity. Rot, scoffed Anthony. He's a pious ass, a chicken brain. Her mind left the subject and flitted on. Why don't you live with him? Why don't I board in a Methodist parsonage? You crazy! Again she made a little clicking sound to express disapproval. Anthony thought how moral was this little waif at heart. How completely moral she would still be, after the inevitable wave came that would wash her off the sands of respectability. Do you hate him? I wonder. I never liked him. You never like people who do things for you. Does he hate you? My dear Geraldine, protested Anthony, frowning humorously, do have another cocktail. I annoy him. If I smoke a cigarette, he comes into the room sniffing. He's a prig, a bore, and something of a hypocrite. I probably wouldn't be telling you this if I hadn't had a few drinks, but I don't suppose it matters. Geraldine was persistently interested. She held her glass, untasted, between finger and thumb, and regarded him with eyes in which there was a touch of awe. How do you mean a hypocrite? Well, said Anthony impatiently, maybe he's not. But he doesn't like the things that I like, and so, as far as I'm concerned, he's uninteresting. Hmm. Her curiosity seemed, at length, satisfied. She sank back into the sofa and sipped her cocktail. "'You're a funny one,' she commented thoughtfully. "'Does everybody want to marry you because your grandfather is rich?' "'They don't, but I shouldn't blame them if they did. Still, you see, I never intend to marry.' She scorned this. "'You'll fall in love some day. Oh, you will, I know.' She nodded wisely. "'It'd be idiotic to be overconfident. That's what ruined the Chevalier O'Keefe.' "'Who is he?' A creature of my splendid mind. He's my one creation, the Chevalier. 
crazy she murmured pleasantly using the clumsy rope ladder with which she bridged all gaps and climbed after her mental superiors subconsciously she felt that it eliminated distances and brought the person whose imagination had eluded her back within range oh no objected anthony oh no geraldine you mustn't play the alienist upon the chevalier if you feel yourself unable to understand him i won't bring him in besides i should feel a certain uneasiness because of his regrettable reputation i guess i can understand anything that's got any sense to it answered geraldine a bit testily in that case there are various episodes in the life of the chevalier which might prove diverting well it was his untimely end that caused me to think of him and made him apropos in the conversation i hate to introduce him end foremost but it seems inevitable that the chevalier must back into your life well what about him did he die he did in this manner he was an irishman geraldine a semi-fictional irishman the wild sort with a genteel brogue and reddish hair he was exiled from erin in the late days of chivalry and of course crossed over to france now the chevalier o'keefe geraldine had like me one weakness he was enormously susceptible to all sorts and conditions of women besides being a sentimentalist he was a romantic a vain fellow a man of wild passions a little blind in one eye and almost stone blind in the other now a male roaming the world in this condition is as helpless as a lion without teeth and in consequence the chevalier was made utterly miserable for twenty years by a series of women who hated him used him bored him aggravated him sickened him spent his money made a fool of him in brief as the world has it loved him this was bad geraldine and as the chevalier save for this one weakness this exceeding susceptibility was a man of penetration he decided that he would rescue himself once and for all from these drains upon him with this purpose he went to a very famous monastery in champagne called well anachronistically known as saint voltaire's it was the rule at saint voltaire's that no monk could descend to the ground story of the monastery so long as he lived but should exist engaged in prayer and contemplation in one of the four towers which were called after the four commandments of the monastery rule poverty chastity obedience and silence when the day came that was to witness the chevalier's farewell to the world he was utterly happy he gave all his greek books to his landlady and his sword he sent in a golden sheath to the king of france and all his mementos of ireland he gave to the young huguenot who sold fish in the street where he lived then he rode out to saint voltaire's slew his horse at the door and presented the carcass to the monastery cook at five o'clock that night he felt for the first time free forever free from sex no woman could enter the monastery no monk could descend below the second story so as he climbed the winding stair that led to his cell at the very top of the tower of chastity he paused for a moment by an open window which looked down fifty feet on to a road below it was all so beautiful he thought this world that he was leaving the golden shower of sun beating down upon the long fields, the spray of trees in the distance, the vineyards, quiet and green, freshening wide miles before him. He leaned his elbows on the window casement and gazed at the winding road. Now, as it happened, Therese, a peasant girl of sixteen from a neighboring village, was at that moment passing along this same road that ran in front of the monastery. Five minutes before, the little piece of ribbon which held up the stocking on her pretty left leg had worn through and broken being a girl of rare modesty she had thought to wait until she arrived home before repairing it but it had bothered her to such an extent that she felt she could endure it no longer so as she passed the tower of chastity she stopped and with a pretty gesture lifted her skirt as little as possible be it said to her credit to adjust her garter up in the tower the newest arrival in the ancient monastery of saint voltaire as though pulled forward by a gigantic and irresistible hand, leaned from the window. Further he leaned and further until suddenly one of the stones loosened under his weight, broke from its cement with a soft powdery sound, and, first headlong, then head over heels, finally, in a vast and impressive revolution, tumbled the Chevalier O'Keefe, bound for the hard earth and eternal damnation. Therese was so much upset by the occurrence that she ran all the way home and for ten years spent an hour a day in secret prayer for the soul of the monk whose neck and vows were simultaneously broken on that unfortunate Sunday afternoon. And the Chevalier O'Keefe, 
being suspected of suicide, was not buried in consecrated ground, but tumbled into a field nearby, where he doubtless improved the quality of the soil for many years afterward. Such was the untimely end of a very brave and gallant gentleman. What do you think, Geraldine? But Geraldine, lost long before, could only smile roguishly, wave her first finger at him, and repeat her bridge-all, her explain-all. Crazy, she said, you crazy! His thin face was kindly, she thought, and his eyes quite gentle. She liked him because he was arrogant without being conceited, and because, unlike the men she met about the theatre, he had a horror of being conspicuous. What an odd, pointless story! But she had enjoyed the part about the stocking. After the fifth cocktail he kissed her, and between laughter and bantering caresses and a half-stifled flare of passion they passed an hour. At four-thirty she claimed an engagement, and going into the bathroom she rearranged her hair. Refusing to let him order her a taxi, she stood for a moment in the doorway. "'You will get married,' she was insisting. "'You wait and see!' Anthony was playing with an ancient tennis ball, and he bounced it carefully on the floor several times before he answered with a soupçon of acidity. "'You're a little idiot, Geraldine.' She smiled provokingly. "'Oh, I am, am I? Want to bet?' "'That'd be silly, too.' "'Oh, it would, would it? Well, I'll just bet you'll marry somebody inside of a year.' Anthony bounced the tennis ball very hard. This was one of his handsome days, she thought. A sort of intensity had displaced the melancholy in his dark eyes. "'Geraldine,' he said at length, "'in the first place I have no one I want to marry. In the second place I haven't enough money to support two people. In the third place I am entirely opposed to marriage for people of my type.' In the fourth place, I have a strong distaste for even the abstract consideration of it. But Geraldine only narrowed her eyes knowingly, made her clicking sound, and said she must be going. It was late. Call me up soon, she reminded him as he kissed her goodbye. You have it for three weeks, you know. I will, he promised fervently. He shut the door, and coming back into the room, stood for a moment lost in thought with the tennis ball still clasped in his hand. There was one of his lonelinesses coming, one of those times when he walked the streets or sat, aimless and depressed, biting a pencil at his desk. It was a self-absorption with no comfort, a demand for expression with no outlet, a sense of time rushing by, ceaselessly and wastefully, assaged only by that conviction that there was nothing to waste, because all efforts and attainments were equally valueless. He thought with emotion, aloud, ejaculative, for he was hurt and confused. No idea of getting married, by God! Of a sudden he hurled the tennis ball violently across the room, where it barely missed the lamp, and, rebounding here and there for a moment, lay still upon the floor. Sunlight and Moonlight For her dinner Gloria had taken a table in the Cascades at the Biltmore, and when the men met in the hall outside a little after eight, that person, Blockman, was the target of six masculine eyes. He was a stoutening, ruddy Jew of about thirty-five, with an expressive face under smooth sandy hair, and, no doubt, in most business gatherings his personality would have been considered ingratiating. He sauntered up to the three younger men, who stood in a group smoking as they waited for their hostess, and introduced himself with a little too evident assurance. Nevertheless, it is to be doubted whether he received the intended impression of faint and ironic chill. There was no hint of understanding in his manner. "'You related to Adam J. Patch?' he inquired of Anthony, emitting two slender strings of smoke from nostrils over wide. Anthony admitted it with the ghost of a smile. "'He's a fine man,' pronounced Blockman profoundly. "'He's a fine example of an American.' "'Yes,' agreed Anthony. "'He certainly is.' "'I detest these underdone men,' he thought coldly. "'Boiled looking. Ought to be shoved back in the oven. Just one more minute would do it. Blockman squinted at his watch. Time these girls were showing up. Anthony waited breathlessly. It came. But then, with a widening smile, you know how women are. The three young men nodded. Blockman looked casually about him, his eyes resting critically on the ceiling and then passing lower. His expression combined that of a Middle Western farmer appraising his wheat crop and that of an actor wondering whether he is observed, the public banner of all good Americans. As he finished his survey, he turned back quickly to the reticent trio, determined to strike to their very heart and core. "'You college men? 
Harvard, eh? I see the Princeton boys beat you fellows in hockey. Unfortunate man. He had drawn another blank. They had been three years out, and he did only the big football games. Whether, after the failure of this sally, Mr. Blockman would have perceived himself to be in a cynical atmosphere is problematical, for Gloria arrived, Muriel arrived, Rachel arrived. After a hurried hello, people, uttered by Gloria and echoed by the other two, the three swept by into the dressing room. A moment later, Muriel appeared, in a state of elaborate undress, and crept toward them. She was in her element. Her ebony hair was slicked straight back on her head. Her eyes were artificially darkened. She reeked of insistent perfume. She was got up to the best of her ability as a siren, more popularly a vamp, a picker-up and thrower-away of men, an unscrupulous and fundamentally unmoved toyer with affections. Something in the exhaustiveness of her attempt fascinated Maury at first sight, a woman with wide hips affecting a panther-like leafness. As they waited the extra three minutes for Gloria, and, by polite assumption, for Rachel, he was unable to take his eyes from her. She would turn her head away, lowering her eyelashes and biting her nether lip, in an amazing exhibition of coyness. She would rest her hands on her hips and sway from side to side in tune to the music, saying, "'Did you ever hear such perfect ragtime? I just can't make my shoulders behave when I hear that.' Mr. Blockman clapped his hands gallantly. You ought to be on the stage. I'd like to be, cried Muriel. Will you back me? I sure will. With becoming modesty, Muriel ceased her motions and turned to Moray, asking what he had seen this year. He interpreted this as referring to the dramatic world, and they had a gay and exhilarating exchange of titles after this manner. Muriel, have you seen Pego My Heart? Moray, no, I haven't. Muriel, eagerly, it's wonderful. You want to see it. Maury, have you seen Omar, the tent-maker? Muriel, no, but I hear it's wonderful. I'm very anxious to see it. Have you seen Fair and Warmer? Maury, hopefully. Yes. Muriel, I don't think it's very good. It's trashy. Maury, faintly. Yes, that's true. Muriel, but I went to Within the Law last night, and I thought it was fine. Have you seen The Little Café? This continued until they ran out of plays. Dick, meanwhile, turned to Mr. Blockman, determined to extract what gold he could from this unpromising load. I hear all the new novels are sold to the moving pictures as soon as they come out. That's true. Of course, the main thing in a moving picture is a strong story. Yes, I suppose so. So many novels are all full of talk and psychology. Of course, those aren't as valuable to us. It's impossible to make much of that interesting on the screen. You want plots first, said Richard brilliantly. Of course, plots first. He paused, shifted his gaze. His paws spread, included the others with all the authority of a warning finger. Gloria, followed by Rachel, was coming out of the dressing room. Among other things, it developed during dinner that Joseph Blockman never danced, but spent the music time watching the others with the bored tolerance of an elder among children. He was a dignified man and a proud one. Born in Munich, he had begun his American career as a peanut vendor with a traveling circus. At eighteen he was a sideshow ballyhoo, later the manager of the sideshow, and, soon after, the proprietor of a second-class vaudeville house. Just when the moving picture had passed out of the stage of a curiosity, and become a promising industry, he was an ambitious young man of twenty-six with some money to invest, nagging financial ambitions, and a good working knowledge of the popular show business. That had been nine years before. The moving picture industry had borne him up with it where it threw off dozens of men with more financial ability, more imagination, and more practical ideas. And now he sat here and contemplated the immortal Gloria, for whom young Stuart Holcomb had gone from New York to Pasadena, watched her, and knew that presently she would cease dancing and come back to sit on his left hand. He hoped she would hurry. The oysters had been standing some minutes. Meanwhile Anthony, who had been placed on Gloria's left hand, was dancing with her, always in a certain fourth of the floor. This, had there been stags, would have been a delicate tribute to the girl, meaning, damn you, don't cut in. It was very consciously intimate. Well, he began, looking down at her, you look mighty sweet tonight. 
She met his eyes over the horizontal half-foot that separated them. "'Thank you, Anthony. In fact, you're uncomfortably beautiful,' he added. There was no smile this time. "'And you're very charming.' "'Isn't this nice?' he laughed. "'We actually approve of each other.' "'Don't you, usually?' She had caught quickly at his remark, as she always did at any unexplained allusion to herself, however faint. He lowered his voice, and when he spoke there was in it no more than a wisp of badinage. Does a priest approve of the Pope? I don't know, but that's probably the vaguest compliment I ever received. Perhaps I can muster a few bromides. Well, I wouldn't have you strain yourself. Look, at Muriel, right here, next to us. He glanced over his shoulder. Muriel was resting her brilliant cheek against the lapel of Maury Noble's dinner coat, and her powdered left arm was apparently twisted around his head. One was impelled to wonder why she failed to seize the nape of his neck with her hand. Her eyes, turned ceilingward, rolled largely back and forth, her hips swayed, and as she danced she kept up a constant low singing. This at first seemed to be a translation of the song into some foreign tongue, but became eventually apparent as an attempt to fill out the meter of the song with the only words she knew, the words of the title. He's a rag-picker, a rag-picker, a rag-time-picking man, rag-picking, picking, pick-pick, rag-pick, pick-pick, and so on, into phrases still more strange and barbaric. When she caught the amused glances of Anthony and Gloria, she acknowledged them only with a faint smile and a half-closing of her eyes, to indicate that the music entering into her soul had put her into an ecstatic and exceedingly seductive trance. The music ended and they returned to their table, whose solitary but dignified occupant arose and tendered each of them a smile so ingratiating that it was as if he were shaking their hands and congratulating them on a brilliant performance. "'Blockhead never will dance. I think he has a wooden leg,' remarked Gloria to the table at large. The three young men started, and the gentleman referred to winced perceptibly. This was the one rough spot in the course of Blockman's acquaintance with Gloria. She relentlessly punned on his name. First it had been Blockhouse, lately the more invidious Blockhead. He had requested with a strong undertone of irony that she use his first name, and this she had done obediently several times, then slipping, helpless, repentant, but dissolved in laughter, back into Blockhead. It was a very sad and thoughtless thing. "'I'm afraid Mr. Blockman thinks we're a frivolous crowd,' sighed Muriel waving a balanced oyster in his direction. "'He has that air,' murmured Rachel. Anthony tried to remember whether she had said anything before. He thought not. It was her initial remark. Mr. Blockman suddenly cleared his throat and said in a loud, distinct voice, "'On the contrary. When a man speaks, he's merely tradition. He has, at best, a few thousand years back of him. But woman, why, she's the miraculous mouthpiece of posterity.' In the stunned pause that followed this astounding remark, Anthony choked suddenly on an oyster and hurried his napkin to his face. Rachel and Muriel raised a mild, if somewhat surprised, laugh, in which Dick and Maury joined, both of them red in the face and restraining uproariousness with the most apparent difficulty. "'My God!' thought Anthony. "'It's a subtitle from one of his movies. The man's memorized it.' Gloria alone made no sound. She fixed Mr. Blockman with a glance of silent reproach. "'Well, for the love of heaven, where on earth did you dig that up?' Blockman looked at her uncertainly, not sure of her intention. But in a moment he recovered his poise and assumed the bland and consciously tolerant smile of an intellectual among spoiled and callow youth. The soup came up from the kitchen, but simultaneously the orchestra leader came up from the bar, where he had absorbed the tone color inherent in the sidel of beer. So the soup was left to cool during the delivery of a ballad entitled Everything's at Home Except Your Wife. Then the champagne, and the party assumed more amusing proportions. The men, except Richard Caramel, drank freely. Gloria and Muriel sipped a glass apiece. Rachel Gerald took none. They sat out the waltzes, but danced to everything else, all except Gloria, who seemed to tire after a while and preferred to sit smoking at the table her eyes now lazy, now eager, according to whether she listened to Blockman or watched a pretty woman among the dancers. Several times Anthony wondered what Blockman was telling her. He was chewing a cigar back and forth in his mouth, 
and had expanded after dinner to the extent of violent gestures. Ten o'clock found Gloria and Anthony beginning a dance. Just as they were out of earshot of the table, she said in a low voice, "'Dance over by the door. I want to go down to the drug store.' Obediently, Anthony guided her through the crowd, in the designated direction. In the hall she left him for a moment, to reappear with a cloak over her arm. "'I want some gumdrops,' she said, humorously apologetic. "'You can't guess what for this time. It's just that I want to bite my fingernails, and I will if I don't get some gumdrops.' She sighed, and resumed as they stepped into the empty elevator. "'I've been biting them all day. A bit nervous, you see. Excuse the pun. It was unintentional. The words just arranged themselves. Gloria Gilbert, the female wag. Reaching the ground floor, they naively avoided the hotel candy counter, descended the wide front staircase, and, walking through several corridors, found a drug store in the Grand Central Station. After an intense examination of the perfume counter, she made her purchase. Then, on some mutual unmentioned impulse, they strolled, arm in arm, not in the direction from which they had come, but out into 43rd Street. The night was alive with thaw. It was so nearly warm that a breeze drifting low along the sidewalk brought to Anthony a vision of an unhoped-for hyacinthine spring. Above, in the blue oblong of sky, around them, in the caress of the drifting air, the illusion of a new season carried relief from the stiff and breathed-over atmosphere they had left, and for a hushed moment the traffic sounds and the murmur of water flowing in the gutters seemed an elusive and rarefied prolongation of that music to which they had lately danced. When Anthony spoke, it was with surety that his words came from something breathless and desirous that the night had conceived in their two hearts. "'Let's take a taxi and ride around a bit,' he suggested, without looking at her. "'Oh, Gloria, Gloria!' A cab yawned at the curb. As it moved off like a boat on a labyrinthine ocean and lost itself among the inchoate night masses of the great buildings, among the now stilled, now strident, cries and clangings, Anthony put his arm around the girl, drew her over to him, and kissed her damp, childish mouth. She was silent. She turned her face up to him, pale under the wisps and patches of light that trailed in like moonshine through a foliage. Her eyes were gleaming ripples in the white lake of her face. The shadows of her hair bordered the brow with a persuasive, unintimate dusk. No love was there, surely, nor the imprint of any love. Her beauty was cool as this damp breeze as the moist softness of her own lips. "'You're such a swan in this light,' he whispered after a moment. There were silences as murmurous as sound. There were pauses that seemed about to shatter, and were only to be snatched back to oblivion by the tightening of his arms about her, and the sense that she was resting there as a caught gossamer feather, drifted in out of the dark. Anthony laughed, noiselessly and exultantly, turning his face up and away from her, half in an overpowering rush of triumph, half lest her sight of him should spoil the splendid immobility of her expression. Such a kiss, it was a flower held against the face, never to be described, scarcely to be remembered, as though her beauty were giving off emanations of itself which settled transiently and already dissolving upon his heart. The buildings fell away in melted shadows. This was the park now, and, after a long while, the great white ghost of the Metropolitan Museum moved majestically past, echoing sonorously to the rush of the cab. Why, Gloria! Why, Gloria! Her eyes appeared to regard him out of many thousand years. All emotion she might have felt, all words she might have uttered, would have seemed inadequate beside the adequacy of her silence, ineloquent against the eloquence of her beauty, and of her body, close to him, slender and cool. Tell him to turn around, she murmured, and drive pretty fast going back. Up in the supper room the air was hot. The table, littered with napkins and ashtrays, was old and stale. It was between dances as they entered, and Muriel Kane looked up with roguishness extraordinary. Well, where have you been? To call up mother, answered Gloria coolly. I promised her I would. Did we miss a dance? There followed an incident that, though slight in itself, Anthony had cause to reflect on many years afterward. Joseph Blockman, leaning well back in his chair, fixed him with a peculiar glance, in which several emotions were curiously and inextricably mingled. He did not greet Gloria except by rising, 
and he immediately resumed a conversation with Richard Caramel about the influence of literature on the moving pictures. End of Book One, Chapter Three, Part One of Two. Book One, Chapter Three, Part Two of Two of The Beautiful and Damned. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Beautiful and Damned by F. Scott Fitzgerald. Book One, Chapter Three The Connoisseur of Kisses. Part Two of Two. Magic. The stark and unexpected miracle of a night fades out with the lingering death of the last stars and the premature birth of the first newsboys. The flame retreats to some remote and platonic fire. The white heat has gone from the iron and the glow from the coal. Along the shelves of Anthony's library, filling a wall amply, crept a chill and insolent pencil of sunlight touching with frigid disapproval Thérèse of France and Anne the Superwoman, Jenny of the Orient Ballet, and Zuleika the Conjurer, and Hoosier Cora, then down a shelf and into the years, resting pityingly on the over-invoked shades of Helen, Thais, Salome, and Cleopatra. Anthony, shaved and bathed, sat in his most deeply cushioned chair and watched it until at the steady rising of the sun it lay glinting for a moment on the silk ends of the rug and went out. It was ten o'clock. The Sunday Times, scattered about his feet, proclaimed by rotogravure and editorial, by social revelation and sporting sheet, that the world had been tremendously engrossed during the past week in the business of moving towards some splendid, if somewhat indeterminate, goal. For his part, Anthony had been once to his grandfather's, twice to his broker's, and three times to his tailor's, and in the last hour of the week's last day he had kissed a very beautiful and charming girl. When he reached home, his imagination had been teeming with high-pitched, unfamiliar dreams. There was suddenly no question on his mind, no eternal problem for a solution and resolution. He had experienced an emotion that was neither mental nor physical, nor merely a mixture of the two, and the love of life absorbed him for the present to the exclusion of all else. He was content to let the experiment remain isolated and unique. Almost impersonally, he was convinced that no woman he had ever met compared in any way with Gloria. She was deeply herself. She was immeasurably sincere. Of these things he was certain. Beside her, the two dozen schoolgirls and debutantes, young married women in waifs and strays whom he had known, were so many females, in the word's most contemptuous sense, breeders and bearers, exuding still that faintly odorous atmosphere of the cave and the nursery. So far as he could see, she had neither submitted to any will of his, nor caressed his vanity, except as her pleasure in his company was a caress. Indeed, he had no reason for thinking she had given him aught that she did not give to others. That was as it should be. The idea of an entanglement growing out of the evening was as remote as it would have been repugnant. And she had disclaimed and buried the incident with a decisive untruth. Here were two young people with fancy enough to distinguish a game from its reality, who by the very casualness with which they met and passed on would proclaim themselves unharmed. Having decided this, he went to the phone and called up the Plaza Hotel. Gloria was out. Her mother knew neither where she had gone nor when she would return. It was somehow at this point that the first wrongness in the case asserted itself. There was an element of callousness, almost of indecency, in Gloria's absence from home. He suspected that, by going out, she had intrigued him into a disadvantage. Returning, she would find his name and smile, most discreetly. He should have waited a few hours in order to drive home the utter inconsequence with which he regarded the incident. What an asinine blunder! She would think he considered himself particularly favored. She would think he was reacting with the most inept intimacy to a quite trivial episode. He remembered that, during the previous month, his janitor, to whom he had delivered a rather muddled lecture on the Brother Hoove Man, had come up next day, and, on the basis of what had happened the night before, seated himself in the window-seat for a cordial and chatty half-hour. Anthony wondered, in horror, 
if Gloria would regard him as he had regarded that man. Him! Anthony Patch! Horror! It never occurred to him that he was a passive thing, acted upon by an influence above and beyond Gloria, that he was merely the sensitive plate on which the photograph was made. Some gargantuan photographer had focused the camera on Gloria and, snap, the poor plate could but develop, confined like all things to its nature. But Anthony, lying upon his couch and staring at the orange lamp, passed his thin fingers incessantly through his dark hair and made new symbols for the hours. She was in a shop now, it seemed, moving leisurely among the velvets and the furs, her own dress making, as she walked, a debonair rustle in that world of silken rustles and cool soprano laughter, and scents of many slain but living flowers. The minis and pearls and jewels and jennies would gather around her like courtiers, bearing wispy frailties of georgette crepe, delicate chiffon to echo her cheeks in faint pastel, milky lace to rest in pale disarray against her neck. Damask was used, but to cover priests and divans in those days, and cloth of samarand was remembered only by the romantic poets. She would go elsewhere after a while, tilting her head a hundred ways under a hundred bonnets, seeking in vain for mock cherries to match her lips or plumes that were graceful as her own supple body. Noon would come. She would hurry along Fifth Avenue, a Nordic Ganymede, her fur coat swinging fashionably with her steps, her cheeks redder by a stroke of the wind's brush, her breath a delightful mist upon the bracing air and the doors of the Ritz would revolve, the crowd would divide, fifty masculine eyes would start, stare, as she gave back forgotten dreams to the husbands of many obese and comic women. One o'clock. With her fork, she would tantalize the heart of an adoring artichoke, while her escort served himself up in the thick, dripping sentences of an enraptured man. Four o'clock. Her little feet moving to melody, her face distinct in the crowd, her partner happy as a petted puppy, and mad as the immemorial hatter. Then, then night would come drifting down, and perhaps another damp. The signs would spill their light into the street. Who knew? No wiser than he, they happily sought to recapture that picture done in cream and shadow they had seen on the hushed avenue the night before. And they might, ah, they might. A thousand taxis would yawn at a thousand corners, and only to him was that kiss forever lost and done. In a thousand guises Thais would hail a cab and turn up her face for loving, and her pallor would be virginal and lovely, and her kiss chaste as the moon. He sprang excitedly to his feet. How inappropriate that she should be out! He had realized at last what he wanted, to kiss her again, to find rest in her great immobility. She was the end of all restlessness, all malcontent. Anthony dressed and went out, as he should have done long before, and down to Richard Caramel's room to hear the last revision of the last chapter of The Demon Lover. He did not call Gloria again until six. He did not find her in until eight, and, oh, climax of anticlimaxes, she could give him no engagement until Tuesday afternoon. A broken piece of gutta percha clattered to the floor as he banged up the phone. Black Magic Tuesday was freezing cold. He called at a bleak two o'clock, and as they shook hands he wondered confusedly whether he had ever kissed her. It was almost unbelievable. He seriously doubted if she remembered it. "'I called you four times on Sunday,' he told her. "'Did you?' There was surprise in her voice and interest in her expression. Silently he cursed himself for having told her. He might have known her pride did not deal in such petty triumphs. Even then he had not guessed at the truth, that— Never having had to worry about men, she had seldom used the wary subterfuges, the playings out and haulings in, that were the stock in trade of her sisterhood. When she liked a man, that was trick enough. Did she think she loved him? There was an ultimate and fatal thrust. Her charm endlessly preserved itself. "'I was anxious to see you,' he said simply. "'I want to talk to you. I mean, really talk, somewhere where we can be alone. May I?' What do you mean? He swallowed a sudden lump of panic. He felt that she knew what he wanted. I mean, not at a tea table, he said. Well, all right, but not today. I want to get some exercise. Let's walk. It was bitter and raw. All the evil hate in the mad heart of February 
was wrought into the forlorn and icy wind that cut its way cruelly across Central Park and down along Fifth Avenue. It was almost impossible to talk, and discomfort made him distracted, so much so that he turned at 61st Street to find that she was no longer beside him. He looked around. She was forty feet in the rear, standing motionless, her face half-hidden in her fur coat collar. Moved either by anger or laughter, he could not determine which. He started back. "'Don't let me interrupt your walk,' she called. "'I'm mighty sorry,' he answered in confusion. "'Did I go too fast?' "'I'm cold,' she announced. "'I want to go home, and you walk too fast. "'I'm very sorry.' Side by side they started for the plaza. He wished he could see her face. "'Men don't usually get so absorbed in themselves when they're with me.' "'I'm sorry.' "'That's very interesting.' "'It is rather too cold to walk,' he said briskly, to hide his annoyance. She made no answer, and he wondered if she would dismiss him at the hotel entrance. She walked in without speaking, however, and to the elevator, throwing him a single remark as she entered it. "'You'd better come up.' He hesitated for the fraction of a moment. "'Perhaps I'd better call some other time.' "'Just as you say.' Her words were murmured as an aside. The main concern of life was the adjusting of some stray wisps of hair in the elevator mirror. Her cheeks were brilliant, her eyes sparkled, she had never seemed so lovely, so exquisitely to be desired. Despising himself, he found that he was walking down the tenth-floor corridor, a subservient foot behind her, was in the sitting-room while she disappeared to shed her furs. Something had gone wrong. In his own eyes he had lost a shred of dignity. In an unpremeditated yet significant encounter, he had been completely defeated. However, by the time she reappeared in the sitting-room, he had explained himself to himself with sophistic satisfaction. After all, he had done the strongest thing, he thought. He had wanted to come up, he had come. Yet what happened later on that afternoon must be traced to the indignity he had experienced in the elevator. The girl was worrying him intolerably, so much so that when she came out he involuntarily drifted into criticism. "'Who's this Blockman, Gloria?' "'A business friend of father's.' "'Odd sort of fellow.' "'He doesn't like you either,' she said with a sudden smile. Anthony laughed. "'I'm flattered at his notice. He evidently considers me a—' He broke off with, "'Is he in love with you?' "'I don't know.' "'The deuce you don't,' he insisted. "'Of course he is.' I remember the look he gave me when we got back to the table. He'd probably have had me quietly assaulted by a delegation of movie soups if you hadn't invented that phone call. He didn't mind. I told him afterward what really happened. You told him? He asked me. I don't like that very well, he remonstrated. She laughed again. Oh, you don't? What business is it of his? None. That's why I told him. Anthony, in a turmoil, bit savagely at his mouth. "'Why should I lie?' she demanded directly. "'I'm not ashamed of anything I do. It happened to interest him to know that I kissed you, and I happened to be in a good humour, so I satisfied his curiosity by a simple and precise yes. Being rather a sensible man, after his fashion, he dropped the subject. Except to say that he hated me. "'Oh, it worries you? Well, if you must probe this stupendous matter to its depths, he didn't say he hated you. I simply know he does. It doesn't worry— Oh, let's drop it, she cried spiritedly. It's a most uninteresting matter to me. With a tremendous effort, Anthony made his acquiescence a twist of subject, and they drifted into an ancient question-and-answer game concerned with each other's pasts, gradually warming as they discovered the age-old immemorial resemblances in tastes and ideas. They said things that were more revealing than they intended— but each pretended to accept the other at face, or rather word, value. The growth of intimacy is like that. First, one gives off his best picture, the bright and finished product mended with bluff and falsehood and humor. Then more details are required, and one paints a second portrait, and a third. Before long, the best lines cancel out, and the secret is exposed at last. The planes of the pictures have intermingled and given us away, and though we paint in paint, we can no longer sell a picture. We must be satisfied with hoping that such fatuous accounts of ourselves 
as we make to our wives and children and business associates, are accepted as true. It seems to me, Anthony was saying earnestly, that the position of a man with neither necessity nor ambition is unfortunate. Heaven knows it would be pathetic of me to be sorry for myself, yet sometimes I envy Dick. Her silence was encouragement. It was as near as she ever came to an intentional lure. And there used to be dignified occupations for a gentleman who had leisure, things a little more constructive than filling up the landscape with smoke or juggling someone else's money. There's science, of course. Sometimes I wish I'd taken a good foundation, say at Boston Tech. But now, by golly, I'd have to sit down for two years and struggle through the fundamentals of physics and chemistry. She yawned. I've told you I don't know what anybody ought to do, she said ungraciously, and at her indifference his rancor was born again. Aren't you interested in anything except yourself? Not much. He glared. His growing enjoyment in the conversation was ripped to shreds. She had been irritable and vindictive all day, and it seemed to him that for this moment he hated her hard selfishness. He stared morosely at the fire. Then a strange thing happened. She turned to him and smiled, and as he saw her smile, every rag of anger and hurt vanity dropped from him, as though his very moods were but the outer ripples of her own, as though emotion rose no longer in his breast unless she saw fit to pull an omnipotent controlling thread. He moved closer, and taking her hand, pulled her ever so gently toward him, until she half lay against his shoulder. She smiled up at him as he kissed her. Gloria, he whispered very softly. Again she had made a magic, subtle and pervading as a spilt perfume, irresistible and sweet. Afterward, neither the next day nor after many years could he remember the important things of that afternoon. Had she been moved? In his arms, had she spoken a little, or at all? What measure of enjoyment had she taken in his kisses? And had she at any time lost herself ever so little? Oh, for him there was no doubt. He had risen and paced the floor in sheer ecstasy. That such a girl should be, should poise curled in the corner of the couch like a swallow, newly landed from a clean, swift flight, watching him with inscrutable eyes, he would stop his pacing and, half shy each time at first, drop his arm around her and find her kiss. She was fascinating, he told her. He had never met anyone like her before. He besought her jauntily but earnestly to send him away. He didn't want to fall in love. He wasn't coming to see her any more. Already she had haunted too many of his ways. What delicious romance! His true reaction was neither fear nor sorrow, only this deep delight in being with her that colored the banality of his words and made the mawkish seem sad and the posturing seem wise. He would come back, eternally. He should have known. This is all. It's been very rare to have known you, very strange and wonderful, but this wouldn't do, and wouldn't last. As he spoke, there was in his heart that tremulousness that we take for sincerity in ourselves. Afterward, he remembered one reply of hers to something he had asked for. He remembered it in this form. Perhaps he had unconsciously arranged and polished it. A woman should be able to kiss a man beautifully and romantically without any desire to be either his wife or his mistress. As always when he was with her, she seemed to grow gradually older, until, at the end, ruminations too deep for words would be wintering in her eyes. An hour passed, and the fire leaped up in little ecstasies, as though its fading life was sweet. It was five now, and the clock over the mantel became articulate in sound. Then, as if a brutish sensibility in him was reminded by those thin, tinny beats that the petals were falling from that flowered afternoon, Anthony pulled her quickly to her feet and held her helpless, without breath, in a kiss that was neither a game nor a tribute. Her arms fell to her side. In an instant she was free. Don't, she said quietly. I don't want that. She sat down on the far end of the lounge and gazed straight before her. A frown had gathered between her eyes. Anthony sank down beside her and closed his hand over hers. It was lifeless and unresponsive. Why, Gloria! He made a motion as if to put his arm about her, but she drew away. I don't want that, she repeated. I'm very sorry, he said, a little impatiently. I, I didn't know you made such fine distinctions. 
She did not answer. Won't you kiss me, Gloria? I don't want to. It seemed to him she had not moved for hours. A sudden change, isn't it? Annoyance was growing in his voice. Is it? She appeared uninterested. It was almost as though she were looking at someone else. Perhaps I'd better go. No reply. He rose and regarded her angrily, uncertainly. Again he sat down. Gloria, Gloria, won't you kiss me? No. Her lips, parting for the word, had just faintly stirred. Again he got to his feet, this time with less decision, less confidence. Then I'll go. Silence. All right, I'll go. He was aware of a certain irremediable lack of originality in his remarks. Indeed he felt that the whole atmosphere had grown oppressive. He wished she would speak, rail at him, cry out upon him, anything but this pervasive and chilling silence. He cursed himself for a weak fool. His clearest desire was to move her, to hurt her, to see her wince. Helplessly, involuntarily, he erred again. If you're tired of kissing me, I'd better go. He saw her lips curl slightly, and his last dignity left him. She spoke, at length. I believe you've made that remark several times before. He looked about him immediately, saw his hat and coat on a chair, blundered into them during an intolerable moment. Looking again at the couch, he perceived that she had not turned, not even moved. With a shaken, immediately regretted, goodbye, he went quickly but without dignity from the room. For over a moment Gloria made no sound. Her lips were still curled. Her glance was straight, proud, remote. Then her eyes blurred a little, and she murmured three words half aloud to the death-bound fire. "'Good-bye, you ass,' she said. Panic The man had had the hardest blow of his life. He knew at last what he wanted, but in finding it out it seemed that he had put it forever beyond his grasp. He reached home in misery, dropped into an armchair without even removing his overcoat, and sat there for over an hour, his mind racing the paths of fruitless and wretched self-absorption. She had sent him away. That was the reiterated burden of his despair. Instead of seizing the girl and holding her by sheer strength until she became passive to his desire, instead of beating down her will by the force of his own, he had walked, defeated and powerless, from her door with the corners of his mouth drooping, and what force there might have been in his grief and rage, hidden behind the manner of a whipped schoolboy. At one minute she had liked him tremendously, ah, she had nearly loved him. In the next he had become a thing of indifference to her, an insolent and efficiently humiliated man. He had no great self-reproach, some, of course, but there were other things dominant in him now, far more urgent. He was not so much in love with Gloria as mad for her, Unless he could have her near him again, kiss her, hold her close and acquiescent, he wanted nothing more from life. By her three minutes of utter unwavering indifference, the girl had lifted herself from a high but somehow casual position in his mind, to be instead his complete preoccupation. However much his wild thoughts varied between a passionate desire for her kisses and an equally passionate craving to hurt and mar her, The residue of his mind craved, in finer fashion, to possess the triumphant soul that had shone through those three minutes. She was beautiful, but especially she was without mercy. He must own that strength that could send him away. At present no such analysis was possible to Anthony. His clarity of mind, all those endless resources which he thought his irony had brought him, were swept aside. Not only for that night, but for the days and weeks that followed, his books were to be but furniture, and his friends only people who lived and walked in the nebulous outer world from which he was trying to escape. That world was cold and full of bleak wind, and for a little while he had seen into a warm house where fires shone. About midnight he began to realize that he was hungry. He went down into 52nd Street, where it was so cold that he could scarcely see, The moisture froze on his lashes and in the corners of his lips. Everywhere dreariness had come down from the north, settling upon the thin and cheerless street, where black bundled figures, blacker still against the night, 
moved stumbling along the sidewalk through the shrieking wind, sliding their feet cautiously ahead, as though they were on skis. Anthony turned over toward Sixth Avenue, so absorbed in his thoughts as not to notice that several passers-by had stared at him. His overcoat was wide open, and the wind was biting in, hard and full of merciless death. After a while a waitress spoke to him, a fat waitress with black-rimmed eyeglasses, from which dangled a long black cord. "'Order, please.' Her voice, he considered, was unnecessarily loud. He looked up resentfully. "'You want to order, or don't you?' "'Of course,' he protested. "'Well, I asked you three times. This ain't no restroom.' He glanced at the big clock and discovered with a start that it was after two. He was down around 30th Street somewhere, and after a moment he found and translated the "'Child's' in a white semicircle of letters upon the glass front. The place was inhabited sparsely by three or four bleak and half-frozen night hawks. "'Give me some bacon and eggs and coffee, please.' The waitress bent upon him a last disgusted glance, and, looking ludicrously intellectual in her corded glasses, hurried away. God! Glorious kisses had been such flowers! He remembered as though it had been years ago the low freshness of her voice, the beautiful lines of her body shining through her clothes, her face lily-colored under the lamps of the street, under the lamps. Misery struck at him again, piling a sort of terror upon the ache and yearning. He had lost her. It was true, no denying it, no softening it. But a new idea had seared his sky. What of Blockman? What would happen now? There was a wealthy man, middle-aged enough to be tolerant with the beautiful wife, to baby her whims and indulge her unreason, to wear her as she perhaps wished to be worn, a bright flower in his buttonhole, safe and secure from the things she feared. He felt that she had been playing with the idea of marrying Blockman, and it was well possible that this disappointment in Anthony might throw her on sudden impulse into Blockman's arms. The idea drove him childishly frantic. He wanted to kill Blockman and make him suffer for his hideous presumption. He was saying this over and over to himself, with his teeth tight shut, and a perfect orgy of hate and fright in his eyes. But, behind this obscene jealousy, Anthony was in love at last, profoundly and truly in love, as the word goes between man and woman. His coffee appeared at his elbow, and gave off, for a certain time, a gradually diminishing wisp of steam. The night manager, seated at his desk, glanced at the motionless figure alone at the last table, and then, with a sigh, moved down upon him, just as the hour hand crossed the figure of three on the big clock. Wisdom After another day the turmoil subsided, and Anthony began to exercise a measure of reason. He was in love. He cried it passionately to himself. The things that a week before would have seemed insuperable obstacles, his limited income, his desire to be irresponsible and independent, had, in this forty hours, become the merest chaff before the wind of his infatuation. If he did not marry her, his life would be a feeble parody of his own adolescence. To be able to face people, and to endure the constant reminder of Gloria that all existence had become, it was necessary for him to have hope. So he built hope, desperately and tenaciously, out of the stuff of his dream. A hope flimsy enough, to be sure, a hope that was cracked and dissipated a dozen times a day, a hope mothered by mockery, but, nevertheless, a hope that would be brawn and sinew to his self-respect. Out of this developed a spark of wisdom, a true perception of his own from out the effortless past. Memory is short, he thought. So very short. At the crucial point the trust president is on the stand, a potential criminal needing but one push to be a jailbird, scorned by the upright for leagues around. Let him be acquitted, and in a year all is forgotten. Yes, he did have some trouble once, just a technicality, I believe. Oh, memory is very short. Anthony had seen Gloria altogether about a dozen times, say two dozen hours. Supposing he left her alone for a month, made no attempt to see her or speak to her, and avoided every place where she might possibly be. Wasn't it possible, the more possible because she had never loved him, that at the end of the time the rush of events would efface his personality from her conscious mind, and with his personality, his offense and humiliation, 
she would forget, for there would be other men. He winced. The implication struck out at him. Other men. Two months. God. Better three weeks. Two weeks. He thought this the second evening after the catastrophe, when he was undressing, and at this point he threw himself down on the bed and lay there, trembling very slightly and looking at the top of the canopy. Two weeks. That was worse than no time at all. In two weeks he would approach her much as he would have to now, without personality or confidence, remaining still the man who had gone too far, and then, for a period in time that was but a moment, but in fact an eternity, whined. No, two weeks was too short a time. Whatever poignancy there had been for her in that afternoon must have time to dull. He must give her a period when the incident should fade, and then a new period when she should gradually begin to think of him, no matter how dimly, with the true perspective that would remember his pleasantness as well as his humiliation. He fixed, finally, on six weeks, as approximately the interval best suited to his purpose. And on a desk calendar he marked the days off, finding that it would fall on the ninth of April. Very well, on that day he would phone and ask her if he might call. Until then, silence. After his decision a gradual improvement was manifest. He had taken at least a step in the direction to which hope pointed, and he realized that the less he brooded upon her, the better he would be able to give the desired impression when they met. In another hour he fell into a deep sleep. THE INTERVAL Nevertheless, though, as the days passed, the glory of her hair dimmed perceptibly for him, and in a year of separation might have departed completely, the six weeks held many abominable days. He dreaded the sight of Dick and Maury, imagining wildly that they knew all. But when the three met, it was Richard Caramel and not Anthony who was the center of attention. The demon lover had been accepted for immediate publication. Anthony felt that from now on he moved apart. He no longer craved the warmth and security of Maury's society, which had cheered him no further back than November. Only Gloria could give that now and no one else ever again. So Dick's success rejoiced him only casually, and worried him not a little. It meant that the world was going ahead, writing and reading and publishing and living, and he wanted the world to wait motionless and breathless for six weeks, while Gloria forgot. Two Encounters His greatest satisfaction was in Geraldine's company. He took her once to dinner and the theatre, and entertained her several times in his apartment. When he was with her she absorbed him, not as Gloria had, but quieting those erotic sensibilities in him that worried over Gloria. It didn't matter how he kissed Geraldine. A kiss was a kiss, to be enjoyed to the utmost for its short moment. To Geraldine things belonged in definite pigeonholes. A kiss was one thing, anything further was quite another. A kiss was all right, the other things were bad. When half the interval was up, two incidents occurred on successive days that upset his increasing calm and caused a temporary relapse. The first was, he saw Gloria. It was a short meeting. Both bowed, both spoke, yet neither heard the other. But when it was over, Anthony read down a column of the sun three times in succession without understanding a single sentence. One would have thought Sixth Avenue a safe street. Having forsworn his barber at the plaza, he went around the corner one morning to be shaved, and while waiting his turn, he took off coat and vest, and with his soft collar open at the neck, stood near the front of the shop. The day was an oasis in the cold desert of March, and the sidewalk was cheerful with a population of strolling sun-worshippers. A stout woman, upholstered in velvet, her flabby cheeks too much massaged, swirled by with her poodle straining at its leash, the effect being given of a tug bringing in an ocean liner. Just behind them a man in a striped blue suit, walking slew-footed in white spatted feet, grinned at the sight, and catching Anthony's eye, winked through the glass. Anthony laughed, thrown immediately into that humor in which men and women were graceless and absurd phantasms, grotesquely curved and rounded in a rectangular world of their own building. They inspired the same sensations in him as did those strange and monstrous fish who inhabit the esoteric world of green in the aquarium. Two more strollers caught his eye casually, a man and a girl, 
Then, in a horrified instant, the girl resolved herself into Gloria. He stood here powerless. They came nearer, and Gloria, glancing in, saw him. Her eyes widened, and she smiled politely. Her lips moved. She was less than five feet away. "'How do you do?' he muttered inanely. Gloria, happy, beautiful, young, with a man he had never seen before. It was then that the barber's chair was vacated, and he read down the newspaper column three times in succession. The second incident took place the next day. Going into the Manhattan bar about seven, he was confronted with Blockman. As it happened, the room was nearly deserted, and before the mutual recognition he had stationed himself within a foot of the older man and ordered his drink, so it was inevitable that they should converse. "'Hello, Mr. Patch,' said Blockman amiably enough. Anthony took the proffered hand and exchanged a few aphorisms on the fluctuations of the mercury. "'Do you come in here much?' inquired Blockman. "'No, very seldom.' He omitted to add that the Plaza Bar had, until recently, been his favorite. "'Nice bar. One of the best bars in town.' Anthony nodded. Blockman emptied his glass and picked up his cane. He was in evening dress. "'Well, I'll be hurrying on. I'm going to dinner with Miss Gilbert.' Death looked suddenly out at him from two blue eyes. Had he announced himself as his vis-à-vis -vis prospective murderer, he could not have struck a more vital blow at Anthony. The younger man must have reddened visibly, for his every nerve was an instant clamor. With tremendous effort he mustered a rigid, oh, so rigid, smile, and said a conventional good-bye. But that night he lay awake until after four, half wild with grief and fear and abominable imaginings. Weakness And one day in the fifth week he called her up. He had been sitting in his apartment, trying to read L'Education Sentimentale, and something in the book had sent his thoughts racing in the direction that, set free, they always took, like horses racing for a home stable. With suddenly quickened breath, he walked to the telephone. When he gave the number, it seemed to him that his voice faltered and broke like a schoolboy's. The central must have heard the pounding of his heart. The sound of the receiver being taken up at the other end was a crack of doom, and Mrs. Gilbert's voice, soft as maple syrup running into a glass container, had for him a quality of horror in its single, Hello, ah? Miss Gloria is not feeling well. She's lying down, asleep. Who shall I say called? Nobody, he shouted. In a wild panic he slammed down the receiver, collapsed into his armchair in the cold sweat of breathless relief. Serenade The first thing he said to her was, Why, you've bobbed your hair. And she answered, Yes, isn't it gorgeous? It was not fashionable then. It was to be fashionable in five or six years. At that time it was considered extremely daring. "'It's all sunshine outdoors,' he said gravely. "'Don't you want to take a walk?' She put on a light coat and a quaintly piquant Napoleon hat of Alice Blue, and they walked along the avenue and into the zoo, where they properly admired the grandeur of the elephant and the collar height of the giraffe, but did not visit the monkey house because Gloria said that monkeys smelt so bad. Then they returned toward the plaza, talking about nothing, but glad for the spring singing in the air and for the warm balm that lay upon the suddenly golden city. To their right was the park, while at the left a great bulk of granite and marble muttered dully a millionaire's chaotic message to whosoever would listen, something about, I worked and I saved and I was sharper than all Adam, and here I sit, by golly, by golly. All the newest and most beautiful designs in automobiles were out on Fifth Avenue, and ahead of them, the plaza loomed up rather unusually white and attractive. The supple, indolent Gloria walked a short shadow's length ahead of him, pouring out lazy casual comments that floated a moment on the dazzling air before they reached his ear. Oh, she cried, I want to go south the hot springs. I want to get out in the air and just roll around on the new grass and forget there's ever been any winter. Don't you, though? I want to hear a million robins making a frightful racket. I sort of like birds. All women are birds, he ventured. What kind am I? Quick and eager. A swallow, I think, and sometimes a bird of paradise. Most girls are sparrows, of course, 
See that row of nursemaids over there? They're sparrows, or are they magpies? And of course you've met canary girls and robin girls. And swan girls and parrot girls? All grown women are hawks, I think, or owls. What am I, a buzzard? She laughed and shook her head. Oh, no, you're not a bird at all, do you think? You're a Russian wolfhound. Anthony remembered that they were white and always looked unnaturally hungry. But then they were usually photographed with dukes and princesses, so he was properly flattered. Dick's a fox terrier, a trick fox terrier, she continued. And Maury's a cat. Simultaneously it occurred to him how like Blockman was to a robust and offensive hog, but he preserved a discreet silence. Later, as they parted, Anthony asked when he might see her again. "'Don't you ever make long engagements?' he pleaded. "'Even if it's a week ahead, I think it'd be fun to spend a whole day together, morning and afternoon both.' "'It would be, wouldn't it?' she thought for a moment. "'Let's do it next Sunday.' "'All right. I'll map out a program that'll take up every minute.' He did. He even figured, to a nicety, what would happen in the two hours when she would come to his apartment for tea, how the good bounds would have the windows wide to let in the fresh breeze, but a fire going also, lest there be chill in the air, and how there would be clusters of flowers about in big cool bowls that he would buy for the occasion. They would sit on the lounge. And when the day came, they did sit upon the lounge. After a while, Anthony kissed her because it came about quite naturally. He found sweetness sleeping still upon her lips, and felt that he had never been away. The fire was bright, and the breeze sighing in through the curtains brought a mellow damp, promising May and world of summer. His soul thrilled to remote harmonies. He heard the strum of far guitars and waters lapping on a warm Mediterranean shore, for he was young now, as he would never be again, and more triumphant than death. Six o'clock stole down too soon, and rang the querulous melody of St. Anne's chimes on the corner. Through the gathering dusk they strolled to the avenue, where the crowds, like prisoners released, were walking with elastic step at last after the long winter, and the tops of the buses were thronged with congenial kings, and the shops full of fine soft things for the summer, the rare summer, the gay promising summer that seemed for love what the winter was for money. Life was singing for his supper on the corner. Life was handing round cocktails in the street. Old women there were in that crowd, who felt that they could have run and won a hundred-yard dash. In bed that night, with the lights out, and the cool room swimming with moonlight, Anthony lay awake and played with every minute of the day, like a child playing in turn with each one of a pile of long-wanted Christmas toys. He had told her gently, almost in the middle of a kiss, that he loved her, and she had smiled and held him closer and murmured, I'm glad, looking into his eyes. There had been a new quality in her attitude, a new growth of sheer physical attraction toward him, and a strange emotional tenseness that was enough to make him clinch his hands and draw in his breath at the recollection. He had felt nearer to her than ever before. In a rare delight, he cried aloud to the room that he loved her. He phoned next morning, no hesitation now, no uncertainty. Instead, a delirious excitement that doubled and trebled when he heard her voice. "'Good morning, Gloria. Good morning.' "'That's all I called you up to say, dear. "'I'm glad you did. I wish I could see you. "'You will, tomorrow night. "'That's a long time, isn't it?' "'Yes.' Her voice was reluctant. His hand tightened on the receiver. "'Couldn't I come tonight?' He dared anything in the glory and revelation of that almost whispered yes. I have a date. Oh, but I might, I might be able to break it. Oh, a sheer cry, a rhapsody. Gloria? What? I love you. Another pause, and then, I, I'm glad. Happiness, remarked Maury Noble one day is only the first hour after the alleviation of some especially intense misery. But, oh, Anthony's face as he walked down the tenth-floor corridor of the plaza that night. His dark eyes were gleaming, around his mouth were lines it was a kindness to see. He was handsome then, if never before, bound for one of those immortal moments which come so radiantly 
that their remembered light is enough to see by for years. He knocked, and at a word, entered. Gloria, dressed in simple pink, starched and fresh as a flower, was across the room, standing very still and looking at him wide-eyed. As he closed the door behind him, she gave a little cry and moved swiftly over the intervening space, her arms rising in a premature caress as she came near. Together they crushed out the stiff folds of her dress in one triumphant and enduring embrace. End of Book One, Chapter Three, Part Two of Two Book Two, Chapter One, Part One of Three of The Beautiful and Damned. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Beautiful and Damned by F. Scott Fitzgerald. Book Two, Chapter One The Radiant Hour, Part One of Three. After a fortnight, Anthony and Gloria began to indulge in practical discussions, as they called those sessions when, under the guise of severe realism, they walked in an eternal moonlight. Not as much as I do you, the critic of the Belle Lettre would insist. If you really loved me, you'd want everyone to know it. I do, she protested. I want to stand on the street corner like a sandwich man, informing all the passers-by. Then tell me all the reasons why you're going to marry me in June. Well, because you're so clean. You're sort of blowy clean, like I am. There's two sorts, you know. One's like Dick. He's clean like polished pans. You and I are clean like streams and winds. I can tell whenever I see a person whether he is clean, and if so, what kind of clean he is. We're twins. Ecstatic thought. Mother says, she hesitated uncertainly, Mother says that two souls are sometimes created together and, and in love before they're born. Bilphism gained its easiest convert. After a while he lifted up his head and laughed soundlessly toward the ceiling. When his eyes came back to her he saw that she was angry. "'Why did you laugh?' she cried. "'You've done that twice before. There's nothing funny about our relation to each other. I don't mind playing the fool, and I don't mind having you do it, but I can't stand it when we're together. I'm sorry. Oh, don't say you're sorry. If you can't think of anything better than that, just keep quiet. I love you. I don't care. There was a pause. Anthony was depressed. At length Gloria murmured, I'm sorry, I was mean. You weren't. I was the one. Peace was restored. The ensuing moments were so much more sweet and sharp and poignant. They were stars on this stage each playing to an audience of two, the passion of their pretense created the actuality. Here, finally, was the quintessence of self-expression, yet it was probable that, for the most part, their love expressed Gloria rather than Anthony. He felt often like a scarcely tolerated guest at a party she was giving. Telling Mrs. Gilbert had been an embarrassed matter. She sat stuffed into a small chair and listened with an intense and very blinky sort of concentration. She must have known it. For three weeks Gloria had seen no one else, and she must have noticed that this time there was an authentic difference in her daughter's attitude. She had been given special deliveries to post, she had heeded, as all mothers seemed to heed, the hither end of telephone conversations, disguised but still rather warm. Yet she had delicately professed surprise, and declared herself immensely pleased. She doubtless was. So were the geranium plants blossoming in the window boxes, so were the cabbies when the lovers sought the romantic privacy of handsome cabs, quaint device, and the staid bill of fares on which they scribbled, you know I do, pushing it over for the other to see. But between kisses Anthony and this golden girl quarreled incessantly. Now, Gloria, he would cry, please let me explain. Don't explain, kiss me. I don't think that's right. If I hurt your feelings, we ought to discuss it. I don't like this kiss and forget. But I don't want to argue. I think it's wonderful that we can kiss and forget, and when we can't, it'll be time to argue. At one time some gossamer difference attained such bulk that Anthony arose and punched himself into his overcoat. 
For a moment it appeared that the scene of the preceding February was to be repeated, but, knowing how deeply she was moved, he retained his dignity with his pride, and, in a moment, Gloria was sobbing in his arms, her lovely face miserable as a frightened little girl's. Meanwhile they kept unfolding to each other, unwillingly, by curious reactions and evasions, by distastes and prejudices and unintended hints of the past. The girl was profoundly incapable of jealousy, and, because he was extremely jealous, this virtue piqued him. He told her recondite incidents of his own life on purpose to arouse some spark of it, but to no avail. She possessed him now, nor did she desire the dead years. Oh, Anthony, she would say, always when I'm mean to you, I'm sorry afterward. I'd give my right hand to save you one little moment's pain. And in that instant her eyes were brimming and she was not aware that she was voicing an illusion. Yet Anthony knew that there were days when they hurt each other purposely, taking almost a delight in the thrust. Incessantly she puzzled him, one hour so intimate and charming, striving desperately toward an unguessed, transcendent union, the next silent and cold, apparently unmoved by any consideration of their love or anything he could say. Often he would eventually trace these portentous reticences to some physical discomfort. Of these she never complained until they were over, or to some carelessness or presumption in him, or to an unsatisfactory dish at dinner. But even then, the means by which she created the infinite distances she spread about herself were a mystery, buried somewhere back in those twenty-two years of unwavering pride. "'Why do you like Muriel?' he demanded one day. "'I don't very much. "'Then why do you go with her?' "'Just for someone to go with. "'They're no exertion, those girls. "'They sort of believe everything I tell them. "'But I rather like Rachel. "'I think she's cute, and so clean and slick, don't you? "'I used to have other friends, in Kansas City and at school, "'casual, all of them, girls who just flitted into my range and out of it, "'for no more reason than that boys took us places together. "'They didn't interest me after environment stopped throwing us together, now they're mostly married. What does it matter? They were all just people. You like men better, don't you? Oh, much better. I've got a man's mind. You've got a mind like mine, not strongly gendered either way. Later she told him about the beginnings of her friendship with Blockman. One day in Delmonico's, Gloria and Rachel had come upon Blockman and Mr. Gilbert having luncheon, and curiosity had impelled her to make it a party of four. She had liked him, rather. He was a relief from younger men, satisfied as he was with so little. He humored her, and he laughed, whether he understood her or not. She met him several times, despite the open disapproval of her parents, and, within a month, he had asked her to marry him, tendering her everything from a villa in Italy to a brilliant career on the screen. She had laughed in his face, and he had laughed, too. But he had not given up. To the time of Anthony's arrival in the arena, he had been making steady progress. She treated him rather well, except that she had called him always by an invidious nickname, perceiving, meanwhile, that he was figuratively following along beside her as she walked the fence, ready to catch her if she should fall. The night before the engagement was announced, she told Blockman. It was a heavy blow. She did not enlighten Anthony as to the details but she implied that he had not hesitated to argue with her. Anthony gathered that the interview had terminated on a stormy note, with Gloria, very cool and unmoved, lying in her corner of the sofa, and Joseph Blockman of Films Par Excellence pacing the carpet with eyes narrowed and head bowed. Gloria had been sorry for him, but she had judged it best not to show it. In a final burst of kindness she had tried to make him hate her there at the last. But Anthony, understanding that Gloria's indifference was her strongest appeal, judged how futile this must have been. He wondered, often, but quite casually, about Blockman. Finally, he forgot him entirely. Heyday One afternoon they found front seats on the sunny roof of a bus, and rode for hours from the fading square up along the sullied river, and then, as the stray beams fled the westward streets, sailed down the turgid avenue, darkening with ominous bees from the department stores. The traffic was clotted and gripped in a patternless jam. The buses were packed four deep like platforms above the crowd 
as they waited for the moan of the traffic whistle. "'Isn't it good?' cried Gloria. "'Look!' A miller's wagon, stark white with flour, driven by a powdery clown, passed in front of them behind a white horse and his black teammate. "'What a pity!' she complained. "'They'd look so beautiful in the dusk, if only both horses were white. I'm mighty happy just this minute in this city.' Anthony shook his head in disagreement. I think the city's a mountebank, always struggling to approach the tremendous and impressive urbanity ascribed to it, trying to be romantically metropolitan. I don't. I think it is impressive. Momentarily. But it's really a transparent, artificial sort of spectacle. It's got its press agent and stars and its flimsy, unenduring stage settings and, I'll admit, the greatest army of supers ever assembled. He paused, laughed shortly, and added, Technically excellent, perhaps, but not convincing. I'll bet policemen think people are fools, said Gloria thoughtfully, as she watched a large but cowardly lady being helped across the street. He always sees them frightened and inefficient and old. They are, she added. And then, we'd better get off. I told Mother I'd have an early supper and go to bed. She says I look tired, damn it. I wish we were married, he muttered soberly. There'll be no good night then, and we can do just as we want. Won't it be good? I think we ought to travel a lot. I want to go to the Mediterranean in Italy, and I'd like to go on the stage some time, say, for about a year. You bet. I'll write a play for you. Won't that be good? And I'll act in it. And then some time when we have more money— Old Adam's death was always thus tactfully alluded to. We'll build a magnificent estate, won't we? Oh, yes, with private swimming pools. Dozens of them. And private rivers? Oh, I wish it were now. Odd coincidence. He had just been wishing that very thing. They plunged like divers into the dark, eddying crowd, and emerging in the cool fifties, sauntered indolently homeward, infinitely romantic to each other. Both were walking alone in a dispassionate garden with a ghost found in a dream. Halcyon days like boats drifting along slow-moving rivers, spring evenings full of a plaintive melancholy that made the past beautiful and bitter, bidding them look back and see that the loves of other summers long gone were dead with the forgotten waltzes of their years. Always the most poignant moments were when some artificial barrier kept them apart. In the theater their hands would steal together, join, give and return gentle pressures through the long dark. In crowded rooms they would form words with their lips for each other's eyes, not knowing that they were but following in the footsteps of dusty generations, but comprehending dimly that, if truth is the end of life, happiness is a mode of it, to be cherished in its brief and tremulous moment. And then, one fairy night, May became June. Sixteen days now, fifteen, fourteen. Three Digressions just before the engagement was announced, Anthony had gone up to Tarrytown to see his grandfather, who, a little more wizened and grizzled as time played its ultimate chuckling tricks, greeted the news with profound cynicism. "'Oh, you're going to get married, are you?' He said this with such a dubious mildness, and shook his head up and down so many times, that Anthony was not a little depressed. While he was unaware of his grandfather's intentions, he presumed that a large part of the money would come to him. A good deal would go in charities, of course, a good deal to carry on the business of reform. "'Are you going to work?' "'Why,' temporized Anthony, somewhat disconcerted, "'I am working, you know.' "'Ah, uh, I mean work,' said Adam Patch dispassionately. "'I'm not quite sure yet what I'll do. I'm not exactly a beggar, Grandpa,' he asserted with some spirit. The old man considered this with eyes half-closed. Then, almost apologetically, he asked, "'How much do you save a year?' "'Nothing so far.' "'And so, after just managing to get along on your money, you've decided that by some miracle two of you can get along on it.' "'Gloria has some money of her own, enough to buy clothes. How much?' Without considering this question impertinent, Anthony answered it. "'About a hundred a month.' That's altogether about seventy-five hundred a year. Then he added softly, It ought to be plenty. If you have any sense, it ought to be plenty. But the question is whether you have any or not. 
I suppose it is. It was shameful to be compelled to endure this pious browbeating from the old man, and his next words were stiffened with vanity. I can manage very well. You seem convinced that I'm utterly worthless. At any rate, I came up here simply to tell you that I'm getting married in June. Good-bye, sir. With this he turned away, and headed for the door, unaware that in that instant his grandfather, for the first time, rather liked him. Wait, called Adam Patch. I want to talk to you. Anthony faced about. Well, sir? Sit down. Stay all night. Somewhat mollified, Anthony resumed his seat. I'm sorry, sir, but I'm going to see Gloria tonight. What's her name? Gloria Gilbert. New York girl? Someone you know? She's from the Middle West. What business her father in? In a celluloid corporation or trust or something. They're from Kansas City. You going to be married out there? Why, no, sir. We thought we'd be married in New York, rather quietly. Like to have the wedding out here? Anthony hesitated. The suggestion made no appeal to him, but it was certainly the part of wisdom to give the old man, if possible, a proprietary interest in his married life. In addition, Anthony was a little touched. That's very kind of you, Grandpa, but wouldn't it be a lot of trouble? Everything's a lot of trouble. Your father was married here, but in the old house. Why, I thought he was married in Boston. Adam Patch considered. That's true. He was married in Boston. Anthony felt a moment's embarrassment at having made the correction, and he covered it up with words. Well, I'll speak to Gloria about it. Personally, I'd like to, but of course, it's up to the Gilberts, you see. His grandfather drew a long sigh, half closed his eyes, and sank back in his chair. In a hurry? he asked in a different tone. Not especially. I wonder, began Adam Patch, looking out with a mild, kindly glance at the lilac bushes that rustled against the windows. I wonder if you ever think about the afterlife. Why, sometimes. I think a great deal about the afterlife. His eyes were dim, but his voice was confident and clear. I was sitting here today thinking about what's lying in wait for us, and somehow I began to remember an afternoon nearly sixty-five years ago when I was playing with my little sister Annie down where that summer house is now. He pointed out into the long flower garden, his eyes trembling of tears, his voice shaking. I began thinking, and it seemed to me that you ought to think a little more about the afterlife. You ought to be steadier. He paused and seemed to grope about for the right word. More industrious, why? Then his expression altered. His entire personality seemed to snap together like a trap, and when he continued the softness had gone from his voice. Why, when I was just two years older than you, he rasped with a cunning chuckle, I sent three members of the firm of Wren and Hunt to the poorhouse. Anthony started with embarrassment. Well, good-bye, added his grandfather suddenly. You'll miss your train. Anthony left the house unusually elated, and strangely sorry for the old man, not because his wealth could buy him neither youth nor digestion, but because he had asked Anthony to be married there, and because he had forgotten something about his son's wedding that he should have remembered. Richard Caramel, who was one of the ushers, caused Anthony and Gloria much distress in the last few weeks by continually stealing the rays of their spotlight. The Demon Lover had been published in April, and it interrupted the love affair as it may be said to have interrupted everything its author came in contact with. It was a highly original, rather overwritten piece of sustained description concerned with a Don Juan of the New York slums. As Maury and Anthony had said before, as the more hospitable critics were saying then, there was no writer in America with such power to describe the atavistic and unsubtle reactions of that section of society. The book hesitated, then suddenly went. Editions, small at first, then larger, crowded each other week by week. A spokesman of the Salvation Army denounced it as a cynical misrepresentation of all the uplift taking place in the underworld. Clever press agenting spread the unfounded rumor that Gypsy Smith was beginning a libel suit because one of the principal characters was a burlesque of himself. It was borrowed from the public library of Burlington, Iowa, 
and a midwestern columnist announced by innuendo that richard caramel was in a sanitarium with delirium tremens the author indeed spent his days in a state of pleasant madness the book was in his conversation three-fourths of the time he wanted to know if one had heard the latest he would go into a store and in a loud voice order books to be charged to him in order to catch a chance morsel of recognition from clerk or customer he knew to a town in what sections of the country it was selling best he knew exactly what he cleared on each edition and when he met any one who had not read it or as it happened only too often had not heard of it he succumbed to moody depression so it was natural for anthony and gloria to decide in their jealousy that he was so swollen with conceit as to be a bore to dick's great annoyance gloria publicly boasted that she had never read the demon lover and didn't intend to until everyone stopped talking about it as a matter of fact she had no time to read now for the presents were pouring in first a scattering then an avalanche varying from the bric-a-brac of forgotten family friends to the photographs of forgotten poor relations maury gave them an elaborate drinking set which included silver goblets cocktail shaker and bottle openers the extortion from dick was more conventional a tea set from tiffany's from joseph bachman came a simple and exquisite travelling clock with his card there was even a cigarette holder from bounds this touched anthony and made him want to weep indeed any emotion short of hysteria seemed natural in the half-dozen people who were swept up by this tremendous sacrifice to convention the room set aside in the plaza bulged with offerings sent by harvard friends and by associates of his grandfather with remembrances of gloria's farmover days and with rather pathetic trophies from her former beaux which last arrived with esoteric melancholy messages written on cards tucked carefully inside beginning i little thought when or i'm sure i wish you all the happiness or even when you get this i shall be on my way to the most munificent gift was simultaneously the most disappointing it was a concession of adam patches a check for five thousand dollars to most of the presents anthony was cold it seemed to him that they would necessitate keeping a chart of the marital status of all their acquaintances during the next half century but gloria exulted in each one tearing at the tissue paper and excelsior with the rapaciousness of a dog digging for a bone breathlessly seizing a ribbon or an edge of metal and finally bringing to light the whole article and holding it up critically no emotion except rapt interest in her unsmiling face look anthony darn nice isn't it no answer until an hour later when she would give him a careful account of her precise reaction to the gift whether it would have been improved by being smaller or larger whether she was surprised at getting it and if so just how much surprised mrs gilbert arranged and rearranged a hypothetical house distributing the gifts among the different rooms tabulating articles as second best clock or silver to use every day and embarrassing anthony and gloria by semi-facetious references to a room she called the nursery she was pleased by old adam's gift and thereafter had it that he was a very ancient soul as much as anything else as adam patch never quite decided whether she referred to the advancing senility of his mind or to some private and psychic schema of her own it cannot be said to have pleased him indeed he always spoke of her to anthony as that old woman the mother as though she were a character in a comedy he had seen staged many times before concerning gloria he was unable to make up his mind she attracted him but as she herself told anthony he had decided that she was frivolous and was afraid to approve of her five days a dancing platform was being erected on the lawn at tarrytown four days a special train was chartered to convey the guests to and from new york three days the diary she was dressed in blue silk pajamas and standing by her bed with her hand on the light to put the room in darkness when she changed her mind and opening a table drawer brought out a little black book a line a day diary this she had kept for seven years many of the pencil entries were almost illegible and there were notes and references to nights and afternoons long since forgotten for it was not an intimate diary even though it began with the immemorial i am going to keep a diary for my children yet 
as she thumbed over the pages the eyes of many men seemed to look out at her from their half-obliterated names with one she had gone to new haven for the first time in nineteen o eight when she was sixteen and padded shoulders were fashionable at yale she had been flattered because touchdown michaud had rushed her all evening she sighed remembering the grown-up satin dress she had been so proud of and the orchestra playing yama yama my yama man and jungle town so long ago the names eltinge reardon jim parsons curly mcgregor kenneth cohen fisheye fry whom she had liked for being so ugly carter kirby he had sent her a present so had tudor baird marty reffer the first man she had been in love with for more than a day and stuart holcomb who had run away with her in his automobile and tried to make her marry him by force and larry fenwick whom she had always admired because he had told her one night that if she wouldn't kiss him she could get out of his car and walk home what a list and after all an obsolete list she was in love now set for the eternal romance that was to be the synthesis of all romance yet sad for these men and these moonlights and for the thrill she had had and the kisses the past her past oh what a joy she had been exuberantly happy Turning over the pages, her eyes rested idly on the scattered entries of the past four months. She read the last few carefully. April 1st. I know Bill Carstairs hates me because I was so disagreeable, but I hate to be sentimentalized over sometimes. We drove out to the rockier country club, and the most wonderful moon kept shining through the trees. My silver dress is getting tarnished. Funny how one forgets the other nights at rockier, with Kenneth Cohen when I loved him so. April 3rd. After two hours of Schroeder, who, they inform me, has millions, I've decided that this matter of sticking to things wears one out, particularly when the things concerned are men. There's nothing so often overdone, and from today I swear to be amused. We talked about love. How banal. With how many men have I talked about love? April 11th. Patch actually called up today and when he forswore me about a month ago he fairly raged out the door. I'm gradually losing faith in any man being susceptible to fatal injuries. April 20th. Spent the day with Anthony. Maybe I'll marry him some time. I kind of like his ideas. He stimulates all the originality in me. Blockhead came around about ten in his new car and took me out Riverside Drive. I liked him tonight. He's so considerate. He knew I didn't want to talk, so he was quiet all during the ride. April 21st. Woke up thinking of Anthony, and sure enough, he called, and sounded sweet on the phone. So I broke a date for him. Today I feel I'd break anything for him, including the Ten Commandments in my neck. He's coming at eight, and I shall wear pink and look very fresh and starched. She paused here, remembering that after he had gone that night, she had undressed with the shivering April air streaming in the windows. Yet it seemed she had not felt the cold warmed by the profound banalities burning in her heart. The next entry occurred a few days later. April 24th. I want to marry Anthony, because husbands are so often husbands, and I must marry a lover. There are four general types of husbands. One, the husband who always wants to stay in in the evening, has no vices, and works for a salary. Totally undesirable. Two, the atavistic master, whose mistress one is, to wait on his pleasure. This sort always considers every pretty woman shallow, a sort of peacock with arrested development. 3. Next comes the worshipper, the idolater of his wife and all that is his, to the utter oblivion of everything else. This sort demands an emotional actress for a wife, God. It must be an exertion to be thought righteous. 4. And Anthony, a temporarily passionate lover with wisdom enough to realize when it has flown, and that it must fly. And I want to get married to Anthony. What grubworms women are to crawl on their bellies through colorless marriages. Marriage was created not to be a background, but to need one. Mine is going to be outstanding. It can't, shan't be the setting. It's going to be the performance, the live, lovely, glamorous performance, and the world shall be the scenery. I refuse to dedicate my life to posterity. Surely one owes as much to the current generation as to one's unwanted children. What a fate, to grow rotund and unseemly, to lose my self-love, 
to think in terms of milk, oatmeal, nurse, diapers. Dear dream children, how much more beautiful you are, dazzling little creatures who flutter, all dream children must flutter, on golden, golden wings. Such children, however, poor dear babies, have little in common with the wedded state. June 7th. Moral question. Was it wrong to make Blockman love me? Because I did really make him. He was almost sweetly sad tonight. How opportune it was that my throat is swollen plunk together and tears were easy to muster. But he's just the past, buried already in my plentiful lavender. June 8th. And today I've promised not to chew my mouth. Well, I won't, I suppose. But if he'd only ask me not to eat. Blowing bubbles, that's what we're doing, Anthony and me. And we blew such beautiful ones today, and they'll explode, and then we'll blow more and more, I guess. Bubbles just as big and just as beautiful, until all the soap and water is used up. On this note the diary ended. Her eyes wandered up the page, over the June 8th of 1912, 1910, 1907. The earliest entry was scrawled in the plump, bulbous hand of a sixteen-year-old girl. It was the name, Bob Lamar, and a word she could not decipher. Then she knew what it was, and, knowing, she found her eyes misty with tears. There, in a graying blur, was the record of her first kiss, faded as its intimate afternoon, on a rainy veranda seven years before. She seemed to remember something one of them had said that day, and yet she could not remember. Her tears came faster, until she could scarcely see the page. She was crying, she told herself, because she could remember only the rain and the wet flowers in the yard and the smell of the damp grass. After a moment she found a pencil, and holding it unsteadily, drew three parallel lines beneath the last entry. Then she printed FINI in large capitals, put the book back in the drawer, and crept into bed. Breath of the Cave Back in his apartment after the bridal dinner, Anthony snapped out his lights and, feeling impersonal and fragile as a piece of china waiting on a serving table, got into bed. It was a warm night, a sheet was enough for comfort, and through his wide-open windows came sound, evanescent and summery, alive with remote anticipation. He was thinking that the young years behind him, hollow and colorful, had been lived in facile and vacillating cynicism upon the recorded emotions of men long dust. And there was something beyond that, he knew now. There was the union of his soul with Gloria's, whose radiant fire and freshness was the living material of which the dead beauty of books was made. From the night into his high-walled room there came, persistently, that evanescent and dissolving sound, something the city was tossing up and calling back again, like a child playing with a ball. In Harlem, the Bronx, Gramercy Park, and along the waterfronts, in little parlors or on pebble-strewn, moon-flooded roofs, a thousand lovers were making this sound, crying little fragments of it into the air. All the city was playing with this sound out there in the blue summer dark, throwing it up and calling it back, promising that, in a little while, life would be beautiful as a story, promising happiness, and by that promise giving it. It gave love hope in its own survival. It could do no more. It was then that a new note separated itself jarringly from the soft crying of the night. It was a noise from an area way within a hundred feet from his rear window, the noise of a woman's laughter. It began low, incessant and whining, some servant maid with her fellow, he thought, and then it grew in volume and became hysterical until it reminded him of a girl he had seen overcome with nervous laughter at a vaudeville performance. Then it sank, receded, only to rise again and include words, a coarse joke, some bit of obscure horseplay he could not distinguish. It would break off for a moment, and he would just catch the low rumble of a man's voice, then begin again, interminably, at first annoying, then strangely terrible. He shivered, and getting up out of bed went to the window. It had reached a high point, tensed and stifled, almost the quality of a scream. Then it ceased, and left behind it a silence empty and menacing as the greater silence overhead. Anthony stood by the window a moment longer before he returned to his bed. He found himself upset and shaken. Try as he might to strangle his reaction, 
some animal quality in that unrestrained laughter had grasped his imagination and for the first time in four months aroused his old aversion and horror toward all the business of life the room had grown smothery he wanted to be out in some cool and bitter breeze miles above the cities and to live serene and detached back in the corners of his mind life was that sound out there that ghastly reiterated female sound oh my god he cried drawing in his breath sharply burying his face in the pillows he tried in vain to concentrate upon the details of the next day morning in the gray light he found that it was only five o'clock he regretted nervously that he had awakened so early he would appear fagged at the wedding he envied gloria who could hide her fatigue with careful pigmentation in his bathroom he contemplated himself in the mirror and saw that he was unusually white half a dozen small imperfections stood out against the morning pallor of his complexion and overnight he had grown the faint stubble of a beard the general effect he fancied was unprepossessing haggard half unwell on his dressing-table were spread a number of articles which he told over carefully with suddenly fumbling fingers their tickets to california the book of travellers checks his watch set to the half-minute the key to his apartment which he must not forget to give to maury and most important of all the ring it was of platinum set around with small emeralds gloria had insisted on this she had always wanted an emerald wedding ring she said it was the third present he had given her first had come the engagement ring and then a little gold cigarette case he would be giving her many things now clothes and jewels and friends and excitement it seemed absurd that from now on he would pay for all her meals it was going to cost he wondered if he had not underestimated for this trip and if he had not better cash a larger check the question worried him then the breathless impendency of the event swept his mind clear of details this was the day unsought unsuspected six months before but now breaking in yellow light through his east window dancing along the carpet as though the sun were smiling at some ancient and reiterated gag of his own anthony laughed in a nervous one-syllable snort by god he muttered to himself i'm as good as married end of book two chapter one part one of three Book Two, Chapter One, Part Two of Three of The Beautiful and Damned. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Beautiful and Damned by F. Scott Fitzgerald. Book Two, Chapter One, The Radiant Hour, Part Two of Three. The Ushers six young men in cross patches library growing more and more cheery under the influence of mum's extra dry set surreptitiously in cold pails by the bookcases the first young man by golly believe me in my next book i'm going to do a wedding scene that'll knock em cold the second young man met a debutante the other day and said she thought your book was powerful as a rule young girls cry for this primitive business the third young man where's anthony the fourth young man walking up and down outside talking to himself second young man lord did you see the minister most peculiar looking teeth fifth young man i think they're natural funny thing people having gold teeth sixth young man they say they love em my dentist told me once a woman came to him and insisted on having two of her teeth covered with gold no reason at all all right the way they were fourth young man here you got a book out dicky gratulations dick stiffly thanks fourth young man innocently what is it college stories dick more stiffly no not college stories fourth young man pity hasn't been a good book about harvard for years dick touchily why don't you supply the lack third young man i think i saw a squad of guests turn the drive in a packard just now sixth young man might open a couple more bottles on the strength of that 
third young man. It was the shock of my life when I heard the old man was going to have a wet wedding. Rabid prohibitionist, you know. Fourth young man, snapping his fingers excitedly. By gad, I knew I'd forgotten something. Kept thinking it was my vest. Dick, what was it? Fourth young man. By gad, by gad. Sixth young man. Here, here, why the tragedy? Second young man. Where'd you forget, the way home? Dick, maliciously. He forgot the plot for his book of Harvard stories. Fourth young man. No, sir, I forgot the present, by George. I forgot to buy old Anthony a present. I kept putting it off and putting it off, and by gad, I've forgotten it. What'll they think? Sixth young man, facetiously. That's probably what's been holding up the wedding. The fourth young man looks nervously at his watch. Laughter. Fourth young man. By gad, what an ass I am! Second young man. What do you make of that bridesmaid who thinks she's Nora Bays? Kept telling me she wished this was a ragtime wedding. Name's Haynes or Hampton. Dick. Hurriedly spurring his imagination. Kane, you mean. Muriel Kane. She's a sort of debt of honor, I believe. Once saved Gloria from drowning or something of the sort. Second young man. I didn't think she could stop that perpetual swaying long enough to swim. Fill up my glass, will you? Old man and I had a long talk about the weather just now. Maury. Who, old Adam? Second young man. No, the bride's father. He must be with a weather bureau. Dick. He's my uncle, Otis. Otis. Well, it's an honorable profession. Laughter. Sixth young man. Bride your cousin, isn't she? Dick. Yes, Cable, she is. Cable. She certainly is a beauty. Not like you, Dicky. Bet she brings old Anthony to terms. Maury. Why are all grooms given the title of old? I think marriage is an error of youth. Dick. Maury, the professional cynic. Maury. Why, you intellectual faker! Fifth young man. Battle of the highbrows here, Otis. Pick up what crumbs you can. Dick. Faker yourself. What do you know? Maury. What do you know? Dick. Ask me anything. Any branch of knowledge. Maury. All right. What's the fundamental principle of biology? Dick. You don't know yourself. Maury. Don't hedge. Dick. Well, natural selection? Maury. Wrong. Dick. I give it up. Maury. Ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny. Fifth young man. Take your base. Maury. Ask you another. What's the influence of mice on the clover crop? Laughter. Fourth young man. What's the influence of rats on the decalogue? Maury. Shut up, you saphead. There is a connection. Dick. What is it, then? Maury, pausing a moment in growing disconcertation. Why, let's see. I seem to have forgotten exactly. Something about the bees eating the clover. Fourth young man. And the clover eating the mice. Ha, ha. Maury, frowning. Let me just think a minute. Dick, sitting up suddenly. Listen. A volley of chatter explodes in the adjoining room. The six young men arise, feeling at their neckties. Dick, weightily. We'd better join the firing squad. They're going to take the picture, I guess. No, that's afterward. Otis. Cable, you take the ragtime bridesmaid. Fourth young man. I wish to God I'd sent that present. Maury. If you'll give me another minute, I'll think of that about the mice. Otis. I was usher last month for old Charlie McIntyre and... They move slowly toward the door as the chatter becomes a babble and the practicing preliminary to the overture issues in long, pious groans from Adam Patch's organ. Anthony There were five hundred eyes boring through the back of his cutaway, and the sun glinting on the clergyman's inappropriately bourgeois teeth. With difficulty he restrained a laugh. Gloria was saying something in a clear, proud voice, and he tried to think that the affair was irrevocable, that every second was significant that his life was being slashed into two periods, and that the face of the world was changing before him. He tried to recapture that ecstatic sensation of ten weeks before. All these emotions eluded him. He did not even feel the physical nervousness of that very morning. 
it was all one gigantic aftermath. And those gold teeth! He wondered if the clergyman were married. He wondered perversely if the clergyman could perform his own marriage service. But as he took Gloria into his arms he was conscious of a strong reaction. The blood was moving in his veins now. A languorous and pleasant content settled like a weight upon him, bringing responsibility and possession. He was married. Gloria. So many, such mingled emotions, that no one of them was separable from the others. She could have wept for her mother, who was crying quietly back there ten feet, and for the loveliness of the June sunlight flooding in at the windows. She was beyond all conscious perceptions, only a sense, colored with delirious wild excitement, that the ultimately important was happening, and a trust, fierce and passionate, burning in her like a prayer, that in a moment she would be forever and securely safe. Late one night they arrived in Santa Barbara, where the night clerk at the Hotel Lafcadio refused to admit them on the grounds that they were not married. The clerk thought that Gloria was beautiful. He did not think that anything so beautiful as Gloria could be moral. Con amore. That first half-year, the trip west, the long months loiter along the California coast, and the gray house near Greenwich where they lived until late autumn made the country dreary. Those days, those places, saw the enraptured hours. The breathless idyll of their engagement gave way, first, to the intense romance of the more passionate relationship. The breathless idyll left them, fled on to other lovers. They looked around one day and it was gone, how they scarcely knew. Had either of them lost the other in the days of the idyll, the love lost would have been ever to the loser, that dim desire without fulfillment, which stands back of all life. But magic must hurry on, and the lovers remain. The idyll passed, bearing with it its extortion of youth. Came a day when Gloria found that other men no longer bored her. Came a day when Anthony discovered that he could sit again late into the evening, talking with Dick of those tremendous abstractions that had once occupied his world. But, knowing that they had had the best of love, they clung to what remained. Love lingered, by way of long conversations at night into those stark hours when the mind thins and sharpens, and the borrowings from dreams become the stuff of all life, by way of deep and intimate kindnesses they develop toward each other, by way of their laughing at the same absurdities and thinking the same things noble and the same things sad. It was, first of all, a time of discovery. The things they found in each other were so diverse, so intermixed, and moreover, so sugared with love, as to seem at the time not so much discoveries as isolated phenomena, to be allowed for, and to be forgotten. Anthony found that he was living with a girl of tremendous nervous tension, and of the most high-handed selfishness. Gloria knew, within a month, that her husband was an utter coward toward any one of a million phantasms created by his imagination. Her perception was intermittent, for this cowardice sprang out, became almost obscenely evident, then faded and vanished, as though it had been only a creation of her own mind. Her reactions to it were not those attributed to her sex. It roused her neither to disgust nor to a premature feeling of motherhood. Herself almost completely without physical fear, she was unable to understand, and so she made the most of what she felt to be his fear's redeeming feature, which was that, though he was a coward under a shock and a coward under a strain, when his imagination was given play, he had yet a sort of dashing recklessness that moved her on its brief occasions almost to admiration, and a pride that usually steadied him when he thought he was observed. The trait first showed itself in a dozen incidents of little more than nervousness. His warning to a taxi driver against fast driving, in Chicago, his refusal to take her to a certain tough café she had always wished to visit. These, of course, admitted the conventional interpretation, that it was of her he had been thinking, Nevertheless, their culminative weight disturbed her. But something that occurred in a San Francisco hotel, when they had been married a week, gave the matter certainty. It was after midnight and pitch dark in their room. Gloria was dozing off, and Anthony's even breathing beside her made her suppose that he was asleep, when suddenly she saw him raise himself on his elbow and stare at the window. "'What is it, dearest?' she murmured. "'Nothing.' He had relaxed to his pillow and turned toward her. Nothing, my darling wife. Don't say wife. 
I'm your mistress. Wife's such an ugly word. Your permanent mistress is so much more tangible and desirable. Come into my arms, she added in a rush of tenderness. I can sleep so well, so well with you in my arms. Coming into Gloria's arms had a quite definite meaning. It required that he should slide one arm under her shoulder, lock both arms about her, and arrange himself as nearly as possible as a sort of three-sided crib for her luxurious ease. Anthony, who tossed, whose arms went tinglingly to sleep after half an hour of that position, would wait until she was asleep and roll her gently over to her side of the bed. Then, left to his own devices, he would curl himself into his usual knots. Gloria, having attained sentimental comfort, retired into her doze. Five minutes ticked away on Blockman's traveling clock. Silence lay all about the room, over the unfamiliar, impersonal furniture and the half-oppressive ceiling that melted imperceptibly into invisible walls on both sides. Then there was suddenly a rattling flutter at the window, staccato and loud upon the hushed, pent air. With a leap, Anthony was out of the bed and standing tense beside it. "'Who's there?' he cried, in an awful voice. Gloria lay very still, wide awake now, and engrossed not so much in the rattling as in the rigid, breathless figure whose voice had reached from the bedside into that ominous dark. The sound stopped. The room was quiet as before. Then Anthony, pouring words in at the telephone. "'Someone just tried to get into the room. There's someone at the window!' His voice was emphatic now, faintly terrified. "'All right, hurry!' He hung up the receiver, stood motionless. There was a rush and commotion at the door, a knocking. Anthony went to open it upon an excited night clerk with three bellboys grouped staring behind him. Between thumb and finger the night clerk held a wet pen with the threat of a weapon. One of the bellboys had seized a telephone directory and was looking at it sheepishly. Simultaneously the group was joined by the hastily summoned house detective, and as one man they surged into the room. Lights sprang on with a click. Gathering a piece of sheet about her, Gloria dove away from sight, shutting her eyes to keep out the horror of this unpremeditated visitation. There was no vestige of an idea in her stricken sensibilities save that her Anthony was at grievous fault. The night clerk was speaking from the window, his tone half of the servant, half of the teacher reproving a schoolboy. "'Nobody out there,' he declared conclusively. "'My golly, nobody could be out there.' This here's a sheer fall to the street of fifty feet. It was the wind you heard, tugging at the blind. Oh. Then she was sorry for him. She wanted only to comfort him and draw him back tenderly into her arms, to tell them to go away because the thing their presence connotated was odious. Yet she could not raise her head for shame. She heard a broken sentence, apologies, conventions of the employee, and one unrestrained snicker from a bellboy. I've been just nervous as the devil all evening, Anthony was saying. Somehow that noise just shook me. I was only about half awake. Sure, I understand, said the night clerk with comfortable tact. Been that way myself. The door closed, the lights snapped out. Anthony crossed the floor quietly and crept into bed. Gloria, feigning to be heavy with sleep, gave a quiet little sigh and slipped into his arms. What was it, dear? Nothing he answered, his voice still shaken. I thought there was somebody at the window, so I looked out, but I couldn't see anyone and the noise kept up, so I phoned downstairs. Sorry if I disturbed you, but I'm awfully darn nervous tonight. Catching the lie, she gave an interior start. He had not gone to the window, nor near the window. He had stood by the bed and then sent in his call of fear. Oh, she said, and then, I'm so sleepy. For an hour they lay awake side by side, Gloria with her eyes shut so tight that blue moons formed and revolved against backgrounds of deepest mauve, Anthony staring blindly into the darkness overhead. After many weeks it came gradually out into the light, to be laughed and joked at. They made a tradition to fit over it. Whenever that overpowering terror of the night attacked Anthony, she would put her arms around him and croon, soft as a song, I'll protect my Anthony. Oh, nobody's ever going to harm my Anthony. He would laugh as though it were a jest they played for their mutual amusement, but to Gloria it was never quite a jest. It was, at first, a keen disappointment. 
Later, it was one of the times when she controlled her temper. The management of Gloria's temper, whether it was aroused by a lack of hot water for her bath or by a skirmish with her husband, became almost the primary duty of Anthony's day. It must be done just so, by this much silence, by that much pressure, by this much yielding, by that much force. It was in her angers, with their attendant cruelties, that her inordinate egotism chiefly displayed itself. Because she was brave, because she was spoiled, because of her outrageous and commendable independence of judgment, and finally because of her arrogant consciousness that she had never seen a girl as beautiful as herself, Gloria had developed into a consistent, practicing Nietzschean. This, of course, with overtones of profound sentiment. There was, for example, her stomach. She was used to certain dishes, and she had a strong conviction that she could not possibly eat anything else. There must be a lemonade and tomato sandwich late in the morning, then a light lunch with a stuffed tomato. Not only did she require food from a selection of a dozen dishes, but in addition, this food must be prepared in just a certain way. One of the most annoying half-hours of the first fortnight occurred in Los Angeles, when an unhappy waiter brought her a tomato stuffed with chicken salad instead of celery. "'We always serve it that way, madam,' he quavered to the gray eyes that regarded him wrathfully. Gloria made no answer, but when the waiter had turned discreetly away, she banged both fists upon the table until the china and silver rattled. "'Poor Gloria,' laughed Anthony unwittingly. "'You can't get what you want ever, can you?' "'I can't eat stuff!' she flared up. "'I'll call back the waiter. I don't want you to. He doesn't know anything, the darn fool!' "'Well, it isn't the hotel's fault. Either send it back, forget it, or be a sport and eat it.' "'Shut up!' she said succinctly. "'Why take it out on me?' "'Oh, I'm not,' she wailed. "'But I simply can't eat it.' Anthony subsided helplessly. "'We'll go somewhere else,' he suggested. "'I don't want to go anywhere else. I'm tired of being trotted around to a dozen cafés and not getting one thing fit to eat. When did we go around to a dozen cafés?' "'You'd have to in this town,' insisted Gloria with ready sophistry. Anthony, bewildered, tried another tack. Why don't you try to eat it? It can't be as bad as you think. Just because I don't like chicken. She picked up her fork and began poking contemptuously at the tomato, and Anthony expected her to begin flinging the stuffings in all directions. He was sure that she was approximately as angry as she had ever been. For an instant he had detected a spark of hate directed as much toward him as toward anyone else, and Gloria angry was, for the present, unapproachable. Then, surprisingly, he saw that she had tentatively raised the fork to her lips and tasted the chicken salad. Her frown had not abated, and he stared at her anxiously, making no comment, and daring scarcely to breathe. She tasted another forkful. In another moment she was eating. With difficulty Anthony restrained a chuckle. When at length he spoke, his words had no possible connection with chicken salad. This incident, with variations, ran like a lugubrious fugue through the first year of marriage. Always it left Anthony baffled, irritated, and depressed. But another rough brushing of temperaments, a question of laundry bags, he found even more annoying as it ended inevitably in a decisive defeat for him. One afternoon in Coronado, where they made the longest stay of their trip more than three weeks, Gloria was arraying herself brilliantly for tea. Anthony, who had been downstairs listening to the latest rumor bulletins of war in Europe, entered the room, kissed the back of her powdered neck, and went to his dresser. After a great pulling out and pushing in of drawers, evidently unsatisfactory, he turned around to the unfinished masterpiece. "'Got any handkerchiefs, Gloria?' he asked. Gloria shook her golden head. "'Not a one. I'm using one of yours. The last one, I deduce.' He laughed dryly. Is it? She applied an emphatic, though very delicate, contour to her lips. Isn't the laundry back? I don't know. Anthony hesitated, then, with sudden discernment, opened the closet door. His suspicions were verified. On the hook provided hung the blue bag furnished by the hotel. This was full of his clothes. He had put them there himself. 
The floor beneath it was littered with an astonishing mass of finery. Lingerie, stockings, dresses, nightgowns, and pajamas, most of it scarcely worn, but all of it coming indubitably under the general heading of Gloria's laundry. He stood holding the closet door open. Why, Gloria! What? The lip line was being erased and corrected according to some mysterious perspective. Not a finger trembled as she manipulated the lipstick. Not a glance wavered in his direction. It was a triumph of concentration. Haven't you ever sent out the laundry? Is it there? It most certainly is. Well, I guess I haven't then. Gloria, began Anthony, sitting down on the bed and trying to catch her mirrored eyes. You're a nice fellow, you are. I've sent it out every time it's been sent since we left New York, and over a week ago you promised you'd do it for a change. All you'd have to do would be to cram your own junk into that bag and ring for the chambermaid. Oh, why fuss about the laundry? exclaimed Gloria petulantly. I'll take care of it. I haven't fussed about it. I'd just as soon divide the bother with you, but when we're out of handkerchiefs it's darn near time something's done. Anthony considered that he was being extraordinarily logical. But Gloria, unimpressed, put away her cosmetics and casually offered him her back. "'Hook me up,' she suggested. "'Anthony, dearest, I forgot all about it. I meant to, honestly, and I will today. Don't be cross with your sweetheart.' What could Anthony do then but draw her down upon his knee and kiss a shade of color from her lips? "'But I don't mind,' she murmured with a smile, radiant and magnanimous. You can kiss all the paint off my lips any time you want. They went down to tea. They bought some handkerchiefs in a notion store nearby. All was forgotten. But two days later Anthony looked in the closet and saw the bag still hung limp upon its hook, and that the gay and vivid pile on the floor had increased surprisingly in height. Gloria! he cried. Oh! Her voice was full of real distress. Despairingly, Anthony went to the phone and called the chambermaid. "'It seems to me,' he said impatiently, "'that you expect me to be some sort of French valet to you.' Gloria laughed, so infectiously that Anthony was unwise enough to smile. Unfortunate man. In some intangible manner his smile made her mistress of the situation. With an air of injured righteousness she went emphatically to the closet and began pushing her laundry violently into the bag. Anthony watched her, ashamed of himself. There, she said, implying that her fingers had been worked to the bone by a brutal taskmaster. He considered, nevertheless, that he had given her an object lesson, and that the matter was closed, but on the contrary it was merely beginning. Laundry pile followed laundry pile, at long intervals. Dearth of handkerchief followed dearth of handkerchief, at short ones not to mention dearth of sock, of shirt, of everything. And Anthony found at length that either he must send it out himself or go through the increasingly unpleasant ordeal of a verbal battle with Gloria. Gloria and General Lee On their way east they stopped two days in Washington, strolling about with some hostility in its atmosphere of harsh repellent light, of distance without freedom, of pomp without splendor. It seemed a pasty, pale, and self-conscious city. The second day they made an ill-advised trip to General Lee's old home at Arlington. The bus which bore them was crowded with hot, unprosperous people, and Anthony, intimate to Gloria, felt a storm brewing. It broke at the zoo, where the party stopped for ten minutes. The zoo, it seemed, smelt of monkeys. Anthony laughed. Gloria called down the curse of heaven upon monkeys, including in her malevolence all the passengers of the bus and their perspiring offspring who had hide themselves monkeyward. Eventually the bus moved on to Arlington. There it met other buses, and immediately a swarm of women and children were leaving a trail of peanut shells through the halls of General Lee, and crowding at length into the room where he was married. On the wall of this room a pleasing sign announced in large red letters, Ladies' Toilet. At this final blow, Gloria broke down. I think it's perfectly terrible, she said furiously. The idea of letting these people come here, and of encouraging them by making these houses show places. Well, objected Anthony, if they weren't kept up they'd go to pieces. What if they did? she exclaimed as they sought the wide pillared porch. Do you think they've left a breath of 1860 here? 
This has become a thing of 1914. Don't you want to preserve old things? But you can't, Anthony. Beautiful things grow to a certain height, and then they fail and fade off, breathing out memories as they decay. And just as any period decays in our minds, the things of that period should decay too. And in that way they're preserved for a while in the few hearts like mine that react to them. That graveyard at Tarrytown, for instance. The asses who give money to preserve things have spoiled that too. Sleepy Hollow's gone, Washington Irving's dead, and his books are rotting in our estimation year by year. Then let the graveyard rot too, as it should, as all things should. Trying to preserve a century by keeping its relics up to date is like keeping a dying man alive by stimulants. So you think that just as a time goes to pieces, its houses ought to go too? Of course. Would you value your Keats letter if the signature was traced over to make it last longer? It's just because I love the past that I want this house to look back on its glamorous moment of youth and beauty, and I want its stairs to creak as if to the footsteps of women with hoop skirts and men in boots and spurs. But they've made it into a blondined, rouged-up old woman of sixty. It hasn't any right to look so prosperous. It might care enough for Lee to drop a brick now and then. How many of these, these animals, she waved her hand around, get anything from this, for all the histories and guidebooks and restorations in existence? How many of them who think that, at best, appreciation is talking in undertones and walking on tiptoes would even come here if it was any trouble? I want it to smell of magnolias instead of peanuts, and I want my shoes to crunch on the same gravel that Lee's boots crunched on. There's no beauty without poignancy, and there's no poignancy without the feeling that it's going. Men, names, books, houses, bound for dust, mortal. A small boy appeared beside them, and, swinging a handful of banana peels, flung them valiantly in the direction of the Potomac. Sentiment Simultaneously with the fall of Liège, Anthony and Gloria arrived in New York. In retrospect, the six weeks seemed miraculously happy. They had found, to a great extent, as most young couples find in some measure, that they possessed in common many fixed ideas and curiosities and odd quirks of mind. They were essentially companionable. But it had been a struggle to keep many of their conversations on the level of discussions. Arguments were fatal to Gloria's disposition. She had, all her life, been associated either with her mental inferiors or with men who, under the almost hostile intimidation of her beauty, had not dared to contradict her. Naturally, then, it irritated her when Anthony emerged from the state in which her pronouncements were an infallible and ultimate decision. He failed to realize, at first, that this was the result partly of her female education and partly of her beauty, and he was inclined to include her with her entire sex as curiously and definitely limited. It maddened him to find she had no sense of justice, but he discovered that, when a subject did interest her, her brain tired less quickly than his. What he chiefly missed in her mind was the pedantic teleology, the sense of order and accuracy, the sense of life as a mysteriously correlated piece of patchwork. But he understood, after a while, that such a quality in her would have been incongruous. Of the things they possessed in common, greatest of all was their almost uncanny pull at each other's hearts. The day they left the hotel in Coronado, she sat down on one of the beds while they were packing, and began to weep bitterly. Dearest, his arms were around her, he pulled her head down upon his shoulder. What is it, my own Gloria? Tell me. We're going away, she sobbed. Oh, Anthony, it's sort of the first place we've lived together. Our two little beds here, side by side, they'll always be waiting for us, and we're never coming back to him any more. She was tearing at his heart as she always could. Sentiment came over him, rushed into his eyes. Gloria, why, we're going on to another room, and two other little beds. We're going to be together all our lives. Words flooded from her in a low, husky voice. But it won't be like our two beds ever again. Everywhere we go and move on and change, something's lost, something's left behind. You can't ever quite repeat anything, and I've been so yours here. He held her passionately near, discerning far beyond any criticism of her sentiment, a wise grasping of the minute, if only an indulgence of her desire to cry. Gloria the idler, caresser of her own dreams. 
extracting poignancy from the memorable things of life and youth. Later in the afternoon, when he returned from the station with the tickets, he found her asleep on one of the beds, her arm curled about a black object which he could not at first identify. Coming closer, he found it was one of his shoes, not a particularly new one, nor clean one, but her face, tear-stained, was pressed against it, and he understood her ancient and most honorable message. There was almost ecstasy in waking her and seeing her smile at him, shy but well aware of her own nicety of imagination. With no appraisal of the worth or dross of these two things, it seemed to Anthony that they lay somewhere near the heart of love. End of Book Two, Chapter One, Part Two of Three Book Two, Chapter One, Part Three of Three of The Beautiful and Damned. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Beautiful and Damned by F. Scott Fitzgerald. Book Two, Chapter One The Radiant Hour. Part Three of Three The Grey House. It is in the twenties that the actual momentum of life begins to slacken, and it is a simple soul indeed to whom as many things are significant and meaningful at thirty as at ten years before. At thirty an organ grinder is a more or less moth-eaten man who grinds an organ, and once he was an organ grinder. The unmistakable stigma of humanity touches all those impersonal and beautiful things that only youth ever grasps in their impersonal glory. A brilliant ball, gay with light romantic laughter, wears through its own silks and satins to show the bare framework of a man-made thing, oh, that eternal hand. A play, most tragic and most divine, becomes merely a succession of speeches, sweated over by the eternal plagiarist in the clammy hours, and acted by men subject to cramps, cowardice, and manly sentiment. And this time, with Gloria and Anthony, this first year of marriage, and the gray house caught them in that stage when the organ grinder was slowly undergoing his inevitable metamorphosis. She was twenty-three, he was twenty-six. The gray house was, at first, of sheerly pastoral intent. They lived impatiently in Anthony's apartment for the first fortnight after their return from California, in a stifled atmosphere of open trunks, too many collars, and the eternal laundry bags. They discussed with their friends the stupendous problem of their future. Dick and Maury would sit with them, agreeing solemnly, almost thoughtfully, as Anthony ran through his list of what they ought to do, and where they ought to live. "'I'd like to take Gloria abroad,' he complained, "'except for this damn war. And next to that, I'd sort of like to have a place in the country, somewhere near New York, of course, where I could write, or whatever I decide to do.' Gloria laughed. "'Isn't he cute?' she required of Maury, whatever he decides to do. But what am I going to do if he works? Maury, will you take me around if Anthony works? Anyway, I'm not going to work yet, said Anthony quickly. It was vaguely understood between them that on some misty day he would enter a sort of glorified diplomatic service and be envied by princes and prime ministers for his beautiful wife. Well, said Gloria helplessly, I'm sure I don't know. We talk and talk and never get anywhere, and we ask all our friends and they just answer the way we want them to. I wish somebody'd take care of us. Why don't you go out to, out to Greenwich or something, suggested Richard Caramel. I'd like that, said Gloria, brightening. Do you think we could get a house there? Dick shrugged his shoulders and Maury laughed. You two amuse me, he said. Of all the impractical people— as soon as a place is mentioned, you expect us to pull great piles of photographs out of our pockets, showing the different styles of architecture available in bungalows. That's just what I don't want, wailed Gloria. A hot, stuffy bungalow, with a lot of babies next door and their father cutting the grass in his shirt sleeves. For heaven's sake, Gloria, interrupted Maury, nobody wants to lock you up in a bungalow. Who in God's name brought bungalows into the conversation? but you'll never get a place anywhere unless you go out and hunt for it. Go where? You say go out and hunt for it, but where? With dignity, Moray waved his hand paw-like about the room. Out anywhere, 
Out in the country. There are lots of places. Thanks. Look here, Richard Caramel brought his yellow eye rakishly into play. The trouble with you two is that you're all disorganized. Do you know anything about New York State? Shut up, Anthony. I'm talking to Gloria. Well, she admitted finally, I've been to two or three house parties in Port Chester and around in Connecticut, but of course that isn't in New York State, is it? And neither is Morristown, she finished with drowsy irrelevance. There was a shout of laughter. Oh, Lord, cried Dick, neither is Morristown. No, and neither is Santa Barbara, Gloria. Now listen, to begin with, unless you have a fortune, there's no use considering any place like Newport or Southampton or Tuxedo. They're out of the question. They all agreed to this solemnly. And personally, I hate New Jersey. Then, of course, there's Upper New York, above Tuxedo. Too cold, said Gloria briefly. I was there once in an automobile. Well, it seems to me that there are a lot of towns like Rye between New York and Greenwich where you could buy a little gray house of some... Gloria leaped at the phrase triumphantly. For the first time since their return east, she knew what she wanted. Oh, yes, she cried. Oh, yes, that's it. A little gray house with sort of white around and a whole lot of swamp maples just as brown and gold as an October picture in a gallery. Where can we find one? Unfortunately, I've mislaid my list of little gray houses with swamp maples around them, but I'll try to find it. Meanwhile, you take a piece of paper and write down the names of seven possible towns, and every day this week you take a trip to one of those towns. Oh, gosh, protested Gloria, collapsing mentally. Why won't you do it for us? I hate trains. Well, hire a car and... Gloria yawned. I'm tired of discussing it. Seems to me all we do is talk about where to live. My exquisite wife wearies of thought, remarked Anthony ironically. She must have a tomato sandwich to stimulate her jaded nerves. Let's go out to tea. As the unfortunate upshot of this conversation, they took Dick's advice literally, and two days later went out to Rye, where they wandered around with an irritated real estate agent like bewildered babes in the wood. They were shown houses at a hundred a month, which closely adjoined other houses at a hundred a month. They were shown isolated houses to which they invariably took violent dislikes, though they submitted weakly to the agent's desire that they look at that stove, some stove, into a great shaking of doorposts and tapping of walls, intended, evidently, to show that the house would not immediately collapse, no matter how convincingly it gave that impression. They gazed through windows into interiors furnished either commercially with slab-like chairs and unyielding settees, or home-like, with the melancholy bric-a-brac of other summers, crossed tennis rackets, fit-form couches, and depressing Gibson girls. With a feeling of guilt, they looked at a few really nice houses, aloof, dignified and cool, at three hundred a month. They went away from Rye thanking the real estate agent very much indeed. On the crowded train back to New York, the seat behind was occupied by a super-respirating Latin whose last few meals had obviously been composed entirely of garlic. They reached the apartment gratefully, almost hysterically, and Gloria rushed for a hot bath in the reproachless bathroom. So far as the question of a future abode was concerned, both of them were incapacitated for a week. The matter eventually worked itself out with unhoped-for romance. Anthony ran into the living room one afternoon fairly radiating the idea. I've got it, he was exclaiming, as though he had just caught a mouse. We'll get a car. Gee whiz, haven't we got troubles enough taking care of ourselves? Give me a second to explain, can't you? Just let's leave our stuff with Dick, and just pile a couple of suitcases in our car, the one we're going to buy, we'll have to have one in the country anyway, and just start out in the direction of New Haven. You see, as we get out of commuting distance from New York, the rents'll get cheaper and as soon as we find a house we want, we'll just settle down. By his frequent and soothing interpolation of the word just, he aroused her lethargic enthusiasm. Strutting violently about the room, he simulated a dynamic and irresistible efficiency. We'll buy a car tomorrow. Life, limping after imagination's ten-league boots, saw them out of town a week later in a cheap but sparkling new roadster, saw them through the chaotic, unintelligible Bronx, then over a wide, murky district which alternated cheerless blue-green wastes with suburbs of tremendous and sordid activity. They left New York at eleven, 
and it was well past a hot and beatific noon when they moved rakishly through Pelham. "'These aren't towns,' said Gloria scornfully. "'These are just city blocks plumped down coldly into waste acres. I imagine all the men here have their mustaches stained from drinking their coffee too quickly in the morning. And play pinochle on the commuting trains. What's pinochle? Don't be so literal. How should I know? But it sounds as though they ought to play it. I like it. It sounds as if it were something where you sort of cracked your knuckles or something. Let me drive. Anthony looked at her suspiciously. You swear you're a good driver? Since I was fourteen. He stopped the car cautiously at the side of the road, and they changed seats. Then, with a horrible grinding noise, the car was put in gear, Gloria adding an accompaniment of laughter which seemed to Anthony disquieting and in the worst possible taste. "'Here we go!' she yelled. "'Whoop!' Their heads snapped back like marionettes on a single wire as the car leaped ahead and curved retchingly about a standing milk wagon, whose driver stood up on his seat and bellowed after them. In the immemorial tradition of the road, Anthony retorted with a few brief epigrams as to the grossness of the milk-delivering profession. He cut his remarks short, however, and turned to Gloria with the growing conviction that he had made a grave mistake in relinquishing control, and that Gloria was a driver of many eccentricities and of infinite carelessness. "'Remember now,' he warned her nervously, "'the man said we oughtn't to go over twenty miles an hour for the first five thousand miles.' She nodded briefly, but evidently intending to accomplish the prohibitive distance as quickly as possible, slightly increased her speed. A moment later he made another attempt. "'See that sign? Do you want to get us pinched?' "'Oh, for heaven's sake!' cried Gloria in exasperation. "'You always exaggerate things so.' "'Well, I don't want to get arrested.' "'Who's arresting you? You're so persistent, just like you were about my cough medicine last night.' "'It was for your own good.' Ha! I might as well be living with Mama. What a thing to say to me! A standing policeman swerved into view, was hastily passed. See him? demanded Anthony. Oh, you drive me crazy. He didn't arrest us, did he? When he does, it'll be too late, countered Anthony brilliantly. Her reply was scornful, almost injured. Why, this old thing won't go over thirty-five. It isn't old. It is in spirit. That afternoon the car joined the laundry bags and Gloria's appetite as one of the trinity of contention. He warned her of railroad tracks, he pointed out approaching automobiles, finally he insisted on taking the wheel and a furious, insulted Gloria sat silently beside him between the towns of Larchmont and Rye. But it was due to this furious silence of hers that the grey house materialized from its abstraction, for just beyond Rye he surrendered gloomily to it and re-relinquished the wheel. Mutely he beseeched her, and Gloria, instantly cheered, vowed to be more careful. But because a discourteous streetcar persisted callously in remaining upon its track, Gloria ducked down a side street, and thereafter that afternoon was never able to find her way back to the post road. The street they finally mistook for it lost its post road aspect when it had gone five miles from Cos Cobb. Its macadam became gravel, then dirt. Moreover, it narrowed and developed a border of maple trees, through which filtered the westering sun, making its endless experiments with shadow designs upon the long grass. "'We're lost now,' complained Anthony. "'Read that sign.' "'Marietta, five miles. What's Marietta?' "'Never heard of it, but let's go on. We can't turn here, and there's probably a detour back to the post road.' The way became scarred with deepening ruts and insidious shoulders of stone. Three farmhouses faced them momentarily, slid by. A town sprang up in a cluster of dull roofs around a white tall steeple. Then Gloria, hesitating between two approaches and making her choice too late, drove over a fire hydrant and ripped the transmission violently from the car. It was dark when the real estate agent of Marietta showed them the gray house. They came upon it just west of the village where it rested against the sky that was a warm blue cloak buttoned with tiny stars. The grey house had been there when women who kept cats were probably witches, when Paul Revere made false teeth in Boston preparatory to arousing the great commercial people, when our ancestors were gloriously deserting Washington in droves. Since those days the house had been bolstered up in a feeble corner, considerably repartitioned, and newly plastered inside, 
amplified by a kitchen and added to by a side porch but save for where some jovial oaf had roofed the new kitchen with red tin colonial it defiantly remained how did you happen to come to marietta demanded the real estate agent in a tone that was first cousin to suspicion he was showing them through four spacious and airy bedrooms we broke down explained gloria i drove over a fire hydrant and we had ourselves towed to the garage and then we saw your sign the man nodded unable to follow such a sally of spontaneity there was something subtly immoral in doing anything without several months consideration they signed a lease that night and in the agent's car returned jubilantly to the somnolent and dilapidated marietta inn which was too broken even for the chance immoralities and consequent gaieties of a country roadhouse half the night they lay awake planning the things they were to do there anthony was going to work at an astounding pace on his history and thus ingratiate himself with his cynical grandfather when the car was repaired they would explore the country and join the nearest really nice club where gloria would play golf or something while anthony wrote this of course was anthony's idea gloria was sure she wanted but to read and dream and be fed tomato sandwiches and lemonades by some angelic servant still in a shadowy hinterland between paragraphs anthony would come and kiss her as she lay indolently in the hammock the hammock a host of new dreams in tune to its imagined rhythm while the heat stirred it and waves of sun undulated over the shadows of blown wheat or the dusty road freckled and darkened with quiet summer rain and guests here they had a long argument both of them trying to be extraordinarily mature and far-sighted anthony claimed that they would need people at least every other weekend as a sort of change this provoked and involved an extremely sentimental conversation as to whether anthony did not consider gloria change enough though he assured her that he did she insisted upon doubting him eventually the conversation assumed its eternal monotone what then oh what'll we do then well we'll have a dog suggested anthony i don't want one i want a kitty she went thoroughly and with great enthusiasm into the history habits and tastes of a cat she had once possessed anthony considered that it must have been a horrible character with neither personal magnetism nor a loyal heart later they slept to wake an hour before dawn with the gray house dancing in phantom glory before their dazzled eyes the soul of gloria for that autumn the gray house welcomed them with a rush of sentiment that falsified its cynical old age true there were the laundry bags there was gloria's appetite there was anthony's tendency to brood and his imaginative nervousness but there were intervals also of an unhoped-for serenity close together on the porch they would wait for the moon to stream across the silver acres of farmland jump a thick wood and tumble waves of radiance at their feet in such a moonlight gloria's face was of a pervading reminiscent white and with a modicum of effort they would slip off the blinders of custom and each would find in the other almost the quintessential romance of the vanished june one night while her head lay upon his heart and their cigarettes glowed in swerving buttons of light through the dome of darkness over the bed she spoke for the first time and fragmentarily of the men who had hung for brief moments on her beauty do you ever think of them he asked her only occasionally when something happens that recalls a particular man what do you remember their kisses all sorts of things men are different with women different in what way oh entirely and quite inexpressibly men who had the most firmly rooted reputation for being this way or that way would sometimes be surprisingly inconsistent with me brutal men were tender negligible men were astonishingly loyal and lovable and often honorable men took attitudes that were anything but honorable for instance well there was a boy named percy walcott from cornell who was quite a hero in college a great athlete and saved a lot of people from a fire or something like that but i soon found he was stupid in a rather dangerous way what way it seems he had some naive conception of a woman fit to be his wife a particular conception that i used to run into a lot and that always drove me wild he demanded a girl who'd never been kissed and who liked to sew and sit home and pay tribute to his self-esteem and i'll bet a hat if he's gotten an idiot to sit and be stupid with him 
He's tearing out on the side with some much speedier lady. I'd be sorry for his wife. I wouldn't. Think what an ass she'd be not to realize it before she married him. He's the sort whose idea of honoring and respecting a woman would be never to give her any excitement. With the best intentions, he was deep in the dark ages. What was his attitude toward you? I'm coming to that. As I told you, or did I tell you, he was mighty good-looking. Big brown, honest eyes, and one of those smiles that guarantee the heart behind it is twenty-carat gold. Being young and credulous, I thought he had some discretion, so I kissed him fervently one night while we were riding around after a dance at the homestead at Hot Springs. It had been a wonderful week, I remember, with the most luscious trees spread out like green lather, sort of, all over the valley, and a mist rising out of them on October mornings like bonfires lit to turn them brown. How about your friend with the ideals? interrupted Anthony. It seems that when he kissed me he began to think that perhaps he could get away with a little more, that I needn't be respected like this Beatrice Fairfax glad girl of his imagination. What did he do? Not much. I pushed him off a sixteen-foot embankment before he was well started. Hurt him? inquired Anthony with a laugh. Broke his arm and sprained his ankle. He told the story all over Hot Springs, and when his arm healed, a man named Barley, who liked me, fought him and broke it over again. Oh, it was an awful mess. He threatened to sue Barley, and Barley, he was from Georgia, was seen buying a gun in town. But before that, Mama had dragged me north again, much against my will, so I never did find out all that happened, though I saw Barley once in the Vanderbilt lobby. Anthony laughed long and loud. What a career! I suppose I ought to be furious because you've kissed so many men. I'm not, though. At this she sat up in bed. It's funny, but I'm so sure that those kisses left no mark on me, no taint of promiscuity, I mean, even though a man once told me in all seriousness that he hated to think I'd been a public drinking glass. He had his nerve. I just laughed and told him to think of me rather as a loving cup that goes from hand to hand but should be valued none the less. Somehow it doesn't bother me. On the other hand, it would, of course, if you'd done any more than kiss them. But I believe you're absolutely incapable of jealousy, except as hurt vanity. Why don't you care what I've done? Wouldn't you prefer it if I'd been absolutely innocent? It's all in the impression it might have made on you. My kisses were because the man was good-looking, or because there was a slick moon, or even because I felt vaguely sentimental and a little stirred. But that's all. It's had utterly no effect on me. But you'd remember and let memories haunt you and worry you. Haven't you ever kissed anyone like you've kissed me? No, she answered simply. As I've told you, men have tried, oh, lots of things. Any pretty girl has that experience. You see, she resumed, it doesn't matter to me how many women you've stayed with in the past, so long as it was merely a physical satisfaction, but I don't believe I could endure the idea of your ever having lived with another woman for a protracted period, or even having wanted to marry some possible girl. It's different somehow. There'd be all the little intimacies remembered, and they'd dull the freshness that, after all, is the most precious part of love. Rapturously, he pulled her down beside him on the pillow. Oh, my darling, he whispered, as if I remembered anything but your dear kisses. Then Gloria, in a very mild voice, Anthony, did I hear anybody say they were thirsty? Anthony laughed abruptly, and with a sheepish and amused grin got out of bed. With just a little piece of ice in the water, she added, do you suppose I could have that? Gloria used the adjective little whenever she asked a favor. It made the favor sound less arduous. But Anthony laughed again. Whether she wanted a cake of ice or a marble of it, he must go downstairs to the kitchen. Her voice followed him through the hall. And just a little cracker with just a little marmalade on it? Oh, gosh, sighed Anthony in rapturous slang. She's wonderful, that girl. She has it. When we have a baby, she began one day. This, it had already been decided, was to be after three years. I want it to look like you. Except its legs, he insinuated slyly. Oh, yes, except his legs. He's got to have my legs. But the rest of him can be you. My nose? Gloria hesitated. Well, perhaps my nose, but certainly your eyes and my mouth, and I guess my shape of the face. I wonder, I think he'd be sort of cute if he had my hair. My dear Gloria, you've appropriated the whole baby. Well, I didn't mean to, she apologized cheerfully. 
Let him have my neck at least, he urged, regarding himself gravely in the glass. You've often said you liked my neck because the Adam's apple doesn't show. And, besides, your neck's too short. Why, it is not, she cried indignantly, turning to the mirror. It's just right. I don't believe I've ever seen a better neck. It's too short, he repeated teasingly. Short? Her tone expressed exasperated wonder. Short? You're crazy! She elongated and contracted it to convince herself of its reptilian sinuousness. Do you call that a short neck? One of the shortest I've ever seen. For the first time in weeks tears started from Gloria's eyes, and the look she gave him had a quality of real pain. Oh, Anthony! My lord, Gloria! He approached her in bewilderment and took her elbows in his hands. Don't cry, please. Didn't you know I was only kidding? Gloria, look at me. Why, dearest, you've got the longest neck I've ever seen, honestly. Her tears dissolved in a twisted smile. Well, you shouldn't have said that, then. Let's talk about the b baby. Anthony paced the floor and spoke as though rehearsing for a debate. To put it briefly, there are two babies we could have. Two distinct and logical babies, utterly differentiated. There's the baby that's the combination of the best of both of us, your body, my eyes, my mind, your intelligence, and then there is the baby which is our worst, my body, your disposition, and my irresolution. I like that second baby, she said. What I'd really like, continued Anthony, would be to have two sets of triplets one year apart, and then experiment with the six boys. Poor me, she interjected. I'd educate them each in a different country and by a different system, and when they were twenty-three I'd call them together and see what they were like. Let's have them all with my neck, suggested Gloria. The End of a Chapter The car was at length repaired, and with a deliberate vengeance took up where it left off the business of causing infinite dissension. Who should drive? How fast should Gloria go? These two questions, and the eternal recriminations involved, ran through the days. They motored to the post-road towns, Rye, Portchester, and Greenwich, and called on a dozen friends, mostly Gloria's, who all seemed to be in different stages of having babies, and in this respect as well as in others, bored her to a point of nervous distraction. For an hour after each visit, she would bite her fingers furiously and be inclined to take out her rancor on Anthony. "'I loathe women!' she cried in a mild temper. "'What on earth can you say to them, except talk lady-lady?' I've enthused over a dozen babies that I've wanted only to choke, and every one of those girls is either incipiently jealous and suspicious of her husband if he's charming, or beginning to be bored with him if he isn't. Don't you ever intend to see any women? I don't know. They never seem clean to me. Never, never. Except just a few. Constance Shaw, you know, the Mrs. Merriam who came over to see us last Tuesday, is almost the only one. She's so tall and fresh-looking and stately. I don't like them so tall. Though they went to several dinner dances at various country clubs, they decided that the autumn was too nearly over for them to go out on any scale, even had they been so inclined. He hated golf. Gloria liked it only mildly, and though she enjoyed a violent rush that some undergraduates gave her one night, and was glad that Anthony should be proud of her beauty, she also perceived that their hostess for the evening, a Mrs. Granby, was somewhat disquieted by the fact that Anthony's classmate, Alec Granby, joined with enthusiasm in the rush. The Granbys never phoned again, and though Gloria laughed, it piqued her not a little. You see, she explained to Anthony, if I wasn't married it wouldn't worry her, but she's been to the movies in her day and she thinks I may be a vampire. But the point is that placating such people requires an effort that I'm simply unwilling to make and those cute little freshmen making eyes at me and paying me idiotic compliments. I've grown up, Anthony. Marietta itself offered little social life. Half a dozen farm estates formed a hectagon around it, but these belonged to ancient men who displayed themselves only as inert, grey-thatched lumps in the back of limousines on their way to the station, whither they were sometimes accompanied by equally ancient and doubly massive wives. The townspeople were a particularly uninteresting type. Unmarried females were predominant for the most part, with school festival horizons and souls bleak as the forbidding white architecture of the three churches. The only native with whom they came in close contact was the broad-hipped, broad-shouldered Swedish girl who came every day to do their work. She was silent and efficient, and Gloria, 
after finding her weeping violently into her bowed arms upon the kitchen table, developed an uncanny fear of her and stopped complaining about the food. Because of her untold and esoteric grief, the girl stayed on. Gloria's penchant for premonitions and her bursts of vague supernaturalism were a surprise to Anthony. Either some complex, properly and scientifically inhibited in the early years with her bilfistic mother, or some inherited hypersensitiveness, made her susceptible to any suggestion of the psychic, and, far from gullible about the motives of people, she was inclined to credit any extraordinary happening attributed to the whimsical perambulations of the buried. The desperate squeakings about the old house on windy nights that to Anthony were burglars with revolvers ready in hand represented to Gloria the auras, evil and restive, of dead generations, expiating the inexpiable upon the ancient and romantic hearth. One night, because of two swift bangs downstairs, which Anthony fearfully but unavailingly investigated, they lay awake nearly until dawn, asking each other examination paper questions about the history of the world. In October, Muriel came out for a two weeks' visit. Gloria had called her on long distance, and Miss Kane ended the conversation characteristically by saying, All righty, I'll be there with bells. She arrived with a dozen popular songs under her arm. You ought to have a phonograph out here in the country, she said. Just a little, Vic. They don't cost much. Then, whenever you're lonesome, you can have Caruso or Al Jolson right at your door. She worried Anthony to distraction by telling him that he was the first clever man she had ever known, and she got so tired of shallow people. He wondered that people fell in love with such women. Yet he supposed that under a certain impassioned glance even she might take on a softness and promise. But Gloria— violently showing off her love for Anthony, was diverted into a state of purring content. Finally, Richard Caramel arrived for a garrulous and to Gloria painfully literary weekend, during which he discussed himself with Anthony long after she lay in childlike sleep upstairs. "'It's been mighty funny, this success and all,' said Dick. "'Just before the novel appeared I'd been trying, without success, to sell some short stories.' Then, after my book came out, I polished up three and had them accepted by one of the magazines that had rejected them before. I've done a lot of them since. Publishers don't pay me for my book till this winter. Don't let the victor belong to the spoils. You mean write trash? He considered. If you mean deliberately injecting a slushy fade-out into each one, I'm not. But I don't suppose I'm being so careful. I'm certainly writing faster, and I don't seem to be thinking as much as I used to. Perhaps it's because I don't get any conversation, now that you're married and Maury's gone to Philadelphia. Haven't the old urge and ambition, early success and all that. Doesn't it worry you? Frantically. I get a thing I call sentence fever that must be like buck fever. It's a sort of intense literary self-consciousness that comes when I try to force myself. But the really awful days aren't when I think I can't write. They're when I wonder when any writing is worth while at all. I mean whether I'm not a sort of glorified buffoon. "'I like to hear you talk that way,' said Anthony, with a touch of his old patronizing insolence. "'I was afraid you'd gotten a bit idiotic over your work. Read the damnedest interview you gave out.' Dick interrupted with an agonized expression. "'Good Lord, don't mention it. Young lady wrote it. Most admiring young lady. Kept telling me my work was strong, and I sort of lost my head and made a lot of strange pronouncements. Some of it was good, though, don't you think?' Oh, yes, that part about the wise writer writing for the youth of his generation, the critic of the next, and the schoolmaster of ever afterward. Oh, I believe a lot of it, admitted Richard Caramel with a faint beam. It was simply a mistake to give it out. In November they moved into Anthony's apartment, from which they sallied triumphantly to the Yale-Harvard and Harvard-Princeton football games, to the St. Nicholas ice-skating rink, to a thorough round of the theaters, and to a miscellany of entertainments, from small staid dances to the great affairs that Gloria loved, held in those few houses where lackeys with powdered wigs scurried around in magnificent Anglomania under the direction of gigantic major domos. Their intention was to go abroad the first of the year, or, at any rate, when the war was over. Anthony had actually completed a Chestertonian essay on the twelfth century by way of introduction to his proposed book, and Gloria had done some extensive research work on the question of Russian sable coats. In fact, the winter was approaching quite comfortably, when the bilfistic demiurge decided suddenly in mid-December 
that Mrs. Gilbert's soul had aged sufficiently in its present incarnation. In consequence, Anthony took a miserable and hysterical Gloria out to Kansas City, where, in the fashion of mankind, they paid the terrible and mind-shaking deference to the dead. Mr. Gilbert became, for the first and last time in his life, a truly pathetic figure. That woman he had broken to wait upon his body and play congregation to his mind had ironically deserted him just when he could not much longer have supported her. Never again would he be able so satisfactorily to bore and bully a human soul. End of Book Two, Chapter One, Part Three of Three Book Two, Chapter Two, Part One of Three of The Beautiful and Damned. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Beautiful and Damned by F. Scott Fitzgerald. Book Two, Chapter Two, Symposium, Part One of Three. Gloria had lulled Anthony's mind to sleep. She, who seemed of all women the wisest and the finest, hung like a brilliant curtain across his doorways, shutting out the light of the sun. In those first years what he believed bore invariably the stamp of Gloria, he saw the sun always through the pattern of the curtain. It was a sort of lassitude that brought them back to Marietta for another summer. Through a golden, enervating spring they had loitered, restive and lazily extravagant, along the California coast, joining other parties intermittently, and drifting from Pasadena to Coronado, from Coronado to Santa Barbara, with no purpose more apparent than Gloria's desire to dance by different music or catch some infinitesimal variant among the changing colors of the sea. Out of the Pacific there rose to greet them savage rocklands and equally barbaric hostelries built that, at tea-time, one might drowse into a languid wicker bazaar glorified by the polo costumes of Southampton and Lake Forest and Newport and Palm Beach. And, as the waves met and splashed and glittered in the most placid of the bays, so they joined this group and that, and with them shifted stations, murmuring ever of those strange, unsubstantial gaieties in wait, just over the next green and fruitful valley. A simple, healthy leisure class it was, the best of the men not unpleasantly undergraduate, they seemed to be on a perpetual candidate's list for some etherealized porcelain or skull and bones extended out indefinitely into the world. The women, of more than average beauty, fragilely athletic, somewhat idiotic as hostesses, but charming and infinitely decorative as guests. Sedately and gracefully, they danced the steps of their selection in the balmy tea hours, accomplishing with a certain dignity the movement so horribly burlesqued by clerk and chorus girl the country over. It seemed ironic that in this lone and discredited offspring of the arts, Americans should excel unquestionably. Having danced and splashed through a lavish spring, Anthony and Gloria found that they had spent too much money, and for this must go into retirement for a certain period. There was Anthony's work, they said. Almost before they knew it, they were back in the gray house more aware now that other lovers had slept there, other names had been called over the banisters, other couples had sat upon the porch steps, watching the grey-green fields and the black bulk of woods beyond. It was the same Anthony, more restless, inclined to quicken only under the stimulus of several highballs, faintly, almost imperceptibly apathetic toward Gloria. But Gloria, she would be twenty-four in August, and was in an attractive but sincere panic about it. Six years to thirty. Had she been less in love with Anthony, her sense of the flight of time would have expressed itself in a reawakened interest in other men, in a deliberate intention of extracting a transient gleam of romance from every potential lover who glanced at her with lowered brows over a shining dinner table. She said to Anthony one day, How I feel is that if I wanted anything, I'd take it. That's what I've always thought all my life, but it happens that I want you and so I just haven't room for any other desires. They were bound eastward through a parched and lifeless Indiana, and she had looked up from one of her beloved moving picture magazines to find a casual conversation suddenly turned grave. Anthony frowned out the car window. As the track crossed a country road, 
a farmer appeared momentarily in his wagon. He was chewing on a straw, and was apparently the same farmer they had passed a dozen times before, sitting in silent and malignant symbolism. As Anthony turned to Gloria, his frown intensified. "'You worry me,' he objected. "'I can imagine wanting another woman under certain transitory circumstances, but I can't imagine taking her.' "'But I don't feel that way, Anthony. I can't be bothered resisting things I want. My way is not to want them, to want nobody but you. Yet when I think that if you just happen to take a fancy to someone—' "'Oh, don't be an idiot!' she exclaimed. "'There'd be nothing casual about it.' and I can't even imagine the possibility." This emphatically closed the conversation. Anthony's unfailing appreciation made her happier in his company than in any one's else. She definitely enjoyed him. She loved him. So the summer began very much as had the one before. There was, however, one radical change in Menage. The icy-hearted Scandinavian, whose austere cooking and sardonic manner of waiting on table had so depressed Gloria, gave way to an exceedingly efficient Japanese whose name was Tanala Haka, but who confessed that he heeded any summons which included the disyllable Tana. Tana was unusually small, even for a Japanese, and displayed a somewhat naive conception of himself as a man of the world. On the day of his arrival from R. Gugimoniki, Japanese Reliable Employment Agency, he called Anthony into his room to see the treasures of his trunk. These included a large collection of Japanese postcards, which he was all for explaining to his employer at once, individually and at great length. Among them were half a dozen of pornographic intent and plainly of American origin, though the makers had modestly omitted both their names and the form for mailing. He next brought out some of his own handiwork, a pair of American pants, which he had made himself, and two suits of solid silk underwear. He informed Anthony confidentially as to the purpose for which these latter were reserved. The next exhibit was a rather good copy of an etching of Abraham Lincoln, to whose face he had given an unmistakable Japanese cast. Last came a flute. He had made it himself, but it was broken. He was going to fix it soon. After these polite formalities, which Anthony conjectured must be native to Japan, Tana delivered a long harangue in splintered English on the relation of master and servant from which Anthony gathered that he had worked on large estates, but had always quarreled with the other servants because they were not honest. They had a great time over the word honest, and in fact became rather irritated with each other, because Anthony persisted stubbornly that Tana was trying to say hornets, and even went to the extent of buzzing in the manner of a bee and flapping his arms to imitate wings. After three-quarters of an hour, Anthony was released with the warm assurance that they would have other nice chats in which Tana would tell, How we do in my country. Such was Tana's garrulous premiere in the Grey House, and he fulfilled its promise. Though he was conscientious and honorable, he was unquestionably a terrific bore. He seemed unable to control his tongue, sometimes continuing from paragraph to paragraph with a look akin to pain in his small brown eyes. Sunday and Monday afternoons he read the comic section of the newspapers. One cartoon which contained a facetious Japanese butler diverted him enormously, though he claimed that the protagonist, who to Anthony appeared clearly oriental, had really an American face. The difficulty with the funny paper was that when, aided by Anthony, he had spelled out the last three pictures and assimilated their context with a concentration surely adequate for Kant's critique, he had entirely forgotten what the first pictures were about. In the middle of January, Anthony and Gloria celebrated their first anniversary by having a date. Anthony knocked at the door, and she ran to let him in. Then they sat together on the couch, calling over those names they had made for each other, new combinations of endearments ages old. Yet to this date was appended no attenuated goodnight with its ecstasy of regret. Later in June, horror leered out at Gloria struck at her and frightened her bright soul back half a generation. Then slowly it faded out, faded back into that impenetrable darkness whence it had come, taking relentlessly its modicum of youth. With an infallible sense of the dramatic, it chose a little railroad station in a wretched village near Port Chester. The station platform lay all day bare as a prairie, exposed to the dusty yellow sun and to the glance of that most obnoxious type of countryman, who lives near a metropolis and has attained its cheap smartness without its urbanity. 
A dozen of these yokels, red-eyed, cheerless as scarecrows, saw the incident. Dimly it passed across their confused and uncomprehending minds, taken at its broadest for a coarse joke, at its subtlest for a shame. Meanwhile, there upon the platform a measure of brightness faded from the world. With Eric Merriam, Anthony had been sitting over a decanter of scotch all the hot summer afternoon, while Gloria and Constance Merriam swam and sunned themselves at the beach club, the latter under a striped parasol awning, Gloria stretched sensuously upon the soft, hot sand, tanning her inevitable legs. Later they had all four played with inconsequential sandwiches. Then Gloria had risen, tapping Anthony's knee with her parasol to get his attention. "'We've got to go, dear.' "'Now?' He looked at her unwillingly. At that moment nothing seemed of more importance than to idle on that shady porch drinking mellowed scotch, while his host reminisced interminably on the by-play of some forgotten political campaign. "'We've really got to go,' repeated Gloria. "'We can get a taxi to the station. Come on, Anthony,' she commanded a bit more imperiously. "'Now see here.' Merriam, his yarn cut off, made conventional objections, meanwhile provocatively filling his guest's glass with a highball that should have been sipped through ten minutes. But at Gloria's annoyed, "'We really must!' Anthony drank it off, got to his feet, and made an elaborate bow to his hostess. "'It seems we must,' he said, with little grace. In a minute he was following Gloria down the garden walk between tall rose bushes, her parasol brushing gently the June-blooming leaves. "'Most inconsiderate,' he thought, as they reached the road. He felt with injured naivete that Gloria should not have interrupted such innocent and harmless enjoyment." The whiskey had both soothed and clarified the restless things in his mind. It occurred to him that she had taken this same attitude several times before. Was he always to retreat from pleasant episodes at a touch of her parasol or a flicker of her eye? His unwillingness blurred to ill-will, which rose within him like a resistless bubble. He kept silent, perversely inhibiting a desire to reproach her. They found a taxi in front of the inn, rode silently to the little station. Then Anthony knew what he wanted, to assert his will against this cool and impervious girl, to obtain with one magnificent effort a mastery that seemed infinitely desirable. "'Let's go over to see the Barneses,' he said, without looking at her. "'I don't feel like going home.' Mrs. Barnes, nay, Rachel Gerald, had a summer place several miles for Redgate. "'We went there the day before yesterday,' she answered shortly. "'I'm sure they'd be glad to see us.' He felt that that was not a strong enough note, braced himself stubbornly, and added, I want to see the Barneses. I haven't any desire to go home. Well, I haven't any desire to go to the Barneses. Suddenly they stared at each other. Why, Anthony, she said with annoyance, this is Sunday night and they probably have guests for supper. Why should we go in at this hour? Then why couldn't we have stayed at the Merriam's? He burst out. Why go home when we were having a perfectly decent time? They asked us to supper. They had to. Give me the money and I'll get the railroad tickets. I certainly will not. I'm in no humor for a ride in that damn hot train. Gloria stamped her foot on the platform. Anthony, you act as if you're tight. On the contrary, I'm perfectly sober. But his voice had slipped into a husky key, and she knew with certainty that this was untrue. If you're sober, you'll give me the money for the tickets. But it was too late to talk to him that way. In his mind was but one idea, that Gloria was being selfish, that she was always being selfish, and would continue to be, unless here and now he asserted himself as her master. This was the occasion of all occasions, since, for a whim, she had deprived him of a pleasure. His determination solidified, approached momentarily a dull and sullen hate. "'I won't go in the train,' he said, his voice trembling a little with anger. "'We're going to the Barneses.' I'm not, she cried. If you go, I'm going home alone. Go on, then. Without a word, she turned toward the ticket office. Simultaneously, he remembered that she had some money with her, and that this was not the sort of victory he wanted, the sort he must have. He took a step after her and seized her arm. See here, he muttered. You're not going alone. I certainly am. Why, Anthony! This exclamation, as she tried to pull away from him, and he only tightened his grasp. He looked at her with narrowed and malicious eyes. 
Let go! Her cry had a quality of fierceness. If you have any decency, you'll let go. Why? He knew why, but he took a confused and not quite confident pride in holding her there. I'm going home, do you understand? And you're going to let me go. No, I'm not. Her eyes were burning now. Are you going to make a scene here? I say you're not going. I'm tired of your eternal selfishness. I only want to go home. Two wrathful tears started from her eyes. This time you're going to do what I say. Slowly her body straightened. Her head went back at a gesture of infinite scorn. I hate you. Her low words were expelled like venom through her clenched teeth. Oh, let me go. Oh, I hate you. She tried to jerk herself away, but he only grasped the other arm. I hate you! I hate you! At Gloria's fury his uncertainty returned, but he felt that now he had gone too far to give in. It seemed that he had always given in, and that in her heart she had despised him for it. Ah, she might hate him now, but afterward she would admire him for his dominance. The approaching train gave out a premonitory siren that tumbled melodramatically toward them down the glistening blue tracks. Gloria tugged and strained to free herself, and words older than the book of Genesis came to her lips. "'Oh, you brute!' she sobbed. "'Oh, you brute! Oh, I hate you! Oh, you brute! Oh!' On the station platform, other prospective passengers were beginning to turn and stare. The drone of the train was audible. It increased to a clamor. Gloria's efforts redoubled, then ceased altogether, and she stood there, trembling and hot-eyed at this helpless humiliation as the engine roared and thundered into the station. Lo, below the flood of steam and the grinding of the brakes came her voice. Oh, if there was one man here, you couldn't do this. You couldn't do this. You coward. You coward. Oh, you coward. Anthony, silent, trembling himself, gripped her rigidly, aware that faces, dozens of them, curiously unmoved, shadows of a dream, were regarding him. Then the bells distilled metallic crashes that were like physical pain. The smokestacks volleyed in slow acceleration at the sky, and in a moment of noise and gray, gaseous turbulence, the line of faces ran by, moved off, became indistinct, until suddenly there was only the sun slanting east across the tracks and a volume of sound decreasing far off like a train made out of tin thunder. He dropped her arms. He had won. Now, if he wished, he might laugh. The test was done, and he had sustained his will with violence. Let leniency walk in the wake of victory. We'll hire a car here and drive back to Marietta, he said with fine reserve. For answer, Gloria seized his hand with both of hers, and raising it to her mouth bit deeply into his thumb. He scarcely noticed the pain. Seeing the blood spurt, he absent-mindedly drew out his handkerchief and wrapped the wound. That, too, was part of the triumph, he supposed. It was inevitable that defeat should thus be resented, and as such was beneath notice. She was sobbing, almost without tears, profoundly and bitterly. "'I won't go! I won't go! You can't make me go! You've, you've killed any love I ever had for you, and any respect! But all that's left in me would die before I'd move from this place. Oh, if I thought you'd lay your hands on me!' "'You're going with me,' he said brutally, "'if I have to carry you.' He turned, beckoned to a taxicab, told the driver to go to Marietta. The man dismounted and swung the door open. Anthony faced his wife and said between his clenched teeth, Will you get in, or will I put you in? With a subdued cry of infinite pain and despair, she yielded herself up and got into the car. All the long ride, through the increasing dark of twilight, she sat huddled in her side of the car, her silence broken by an occasional dry and solitary sob. Anthony stared out the window, his mind working dully on the slowly changing significance of what had occurred. Something was wrong. That last cry of Gloria's had struck a chord which echoed posthumously and with incongruous disquiet in his heart. He must be right. Yet, she seemed such a pathetic little thing now, broken and dispirited, humiliated beyond the measure of her lot to bear. The sleeves of her dress were torn, her parasol was gone, forgotten on the platform. It was a new costume, he remembered, and she had been so proud of it that very morning when they had left the house. 
he began wondering if anyone they knew had seen the incident, and persistently there recurred to him her cry, All that's left in me would die. This gave him a confused and increasing worry. It fitted so well with the Gloria who lay in the corner, no longer a proud Gloria, nor any Gloria he had known. He asked himself if it were possible. While he did not believe she would cease to love him, this, of course, was unthinkable, it was yet problematical whether Gloria, without her arrogance, her independence, her virginal confidence and courage, would be the girl of his glory, the radiant woman who was precious and charming because she was ineffably, triumphantly herself. He was very drunk even then, so drunk as to not realize his own drunkenness. When they reached the gray house he went to his own room, and, his mind still wrestling helplessly and somberly with what he had done, fell into a deep stupor on his bed. It was after one o'clock, and the hall seemed extraordinarily quiet when Gloria, wide-eyed and sleepless, traversed it and pushed open the door of his room. He had been too befuddled to open the windows, and the air was stale and thick with whiskey. She stood for a moment by his bed, a slender, exquisitely graceful creature in her boyish silk pajamas. Then, with abandon, she flung herself upon him, half waking him in the frantic emotion of her embrace, dropping her warm tears upon his throat. "'Oh, Anthony!' she cried passionately. "'Oh, my darling, you don't know what you did!' Yet in the morning, coming early into her room, he knelt down by her bed and cried like a little boy, as though it was his heart that had been broken. "'It seemed, last night,' she said gravely, her fingers playing in his hair, "'that all the part of me you loved, the part that was worth knowing, all the pride and fire, was gone. I knew that what was left of me would always love you, but never in quite the same way. Nevertheless, she was aware even then that she would forget in time, and that it is the manner of life seldom to strike but always to wear away. After that morning the incident was never mentioned, and its deep wound healed with Anthony's hand, and if there was triumph, some darker force than theirs possessed it, possessed the knowledge and the victory. Nietzschean Incident Gloria's independence, like all sincere and profound qualities, had begun unconsciously, but, once brought to her attention by Anthony's fascinated discovery of it, it assumed more nearly the proportions of a formal code. From her conversation it might be assumed that all her energy and vitality went into a violent affirmation of the negative principle, never give a damn. Not for me or anybody, she said, except myself, and, by implication, for Anthony. That's the rule of all life, and if it weren't, I'd be that way anyhow. Nobody would do anything for me if it didn't gratify them to, and I'd do as little for them. She was on the front porch of the nicest lady in Marietta when she said this and as she finished she gave a curious little cry and sank in a dead faint to the porch floor. The lady brought her to and drove her home in her car. It had occurred to the estimable Gloria that she was probably with child. She lay upon the long lounge downstairs. Day was slipping warmly out the window, touching the late roses on the porch pillars. "'All I think of ever is that I love you,' she wailed, I value my body because you think it's beautiful, and this body of mine, of yours, to have it grow ugly and shapeless, it's simply intolerable. Oh, Anthony, I'm not afraid of the pain. He consoled her desperately, but in vain, she continued. And then afterward I might have wide hips and be pale, with all my freshness gone and no radiance in my hair. He paced the floor with his hands in his pockets, asking, Is it certain? I don't know anything. I've always hated obstricts or whatever you call them. I thought I'd have a child sometime, but not now. Well, for God's sake, don't lie there and go to pieces. Her sobs lapsed. She drew down a merciful silence from the twilight which filled the room. Turn on the lights, she pleaded. These days seem so short. June seemed to have longer days when I was a little girl. The light snapped on, and it was as though blue drapes of softest silk had been dropped behind the windows and the door. Her pallor, her immobility, without grief now, or joy, awoke his sympathy. "'Do you want me to have it?' she asked listlessly. "'I'm indifferent. That is, I'm neutral. If you have it, I'll probably be glad. If you don't, well, that's all right, too.' 
I wish you'd make up your mind one way or the other. Suppose you make up your mind. She looked at him contemptuously, scorning to answer. You'd think you'd been singled out of all the women in the world for this crowning indignity. What if I do? she cried angrily. It isn't an indignity for them. It's their one excuse for living. It's the one thing they're good for. It is an indignity for me. See here, Gloria, I'm with you whatever you do, but for God's sakes be a sport about it. Oh, don't fuss at me, she wailed. They exchanged a mute look of no particular significance, but of much stress. Then Anthony took a book from the shelf and dropped into a chair. Half an hour later her voice came out of the intense stillness that pervaded the room and hung like incense on the air. I'll drive over and see Constance Merriam tomorrow. All right, and I'll go to Tarrytown and see Grandpa. You see, she added, it isn't that I'm afraid of this or anything else. I'm being true to me, you know. I know, he agreed. The Practical Men Adam Patch, in a pious rage against the Germans, subsisted on the war news. Pin maps plastered his walls, atlases were piled deep on tables convenient to his hand, together with photographic histories of the World War, official explain-alls, and the personal impressions of war correspondents and of privates X, Y, and Z. Several times during Anthony's visit, his grandfather's secretary, Edward Shuttleworth, the one-time accomplished gin physician of Pat's place in Hoboken, now shod with righteous indignation, would appear with an extra. The old man attacked each paper with untiring fury, tearing out those columns which appeared to him of sufficient pregnancy for preservation, and thrusting them into one of his already bulging files. "'Well, what have you been doing?' he asked Anthony blandly. "'Nothing? Well, I thought so. I've been intending to drive over and see you all summer.' I've been writing. Don't you remember the essay I sent you? The one I sold to the Florentine last winter? Essay? You never sent me any essay. Oh, yes, I did. We talked about it. Adam Patch shook his head mildly. Oh, no, you never sent me any essay. You may have thought you sent it, but it never reached me. Why, you read it, Grandpa, insisted Anthony, somewhat exasperated. You read it and disagreed with it. The old man suddenly remembered but this was made apparent only by a partial falling open of his mouth, displaying rows of grey gums. Eyeing Anthony with a green and ancient stare, he hesitated between confessing his error and covering it up. "'So you're writing,' he said quickly. "'Well, why don't you go over and write about these Germans? Write something real, something about what's going on, something people can read.' "'Anybody can't be a war correspondent,' objected Anthony. You have to have some newspaper willing to buy your stuff, and I can't spare the money to go over as a freelance. I'll send you over, suggested his grandfather surprisingly. I'll get you over as an authorized correspondent of any newspaper you pick out. Anthony recoiled from the idea. Almost simultaneously, he bounded toward it. I don't know. He would have to leave Gloria, whose whole life yearned toward him and enfolded him. Gloria was in trouble. Oh, the thing wasn't feasible, yet he saw himself in cocky, leaning, as all war correspondents lean, upon a heavy stick, portfolio at shoulder, trying to look like an Englishman. I'd like to think it over, he confessed. It's certainly very kind of you. I'll think it over, and I'll let you know. Thinking it over absorbed him on the journey to New York. He had had one of those sudden flashes of illumination vouchsafed to all men who are dominated by a strong and beloved woman which showed them a world of harder men, more fiercely trained in grappling with the abstractions of thought and war. In that world, the arms of Gloria would exist only as the hot embrace of a chance mistress, coolly sought and quickly forgotten. These unfamiliar phantoms were crowding closely about him when he boarded his train for Marietta in the Grand Central Station. The car was crowded, he secured the last vacant seat, and it was only after several minutes that he gave even a casual glance to the man beside him. When he did, he saw a heavy lay of jaw and nose, a curved chin, and small puffed under eyes. In a moment he recognized Joseph Blockman. Simultaneously they both half rose, were half embarrassed, and exchanged what amounted to a half handshake. Then, as though to complete the matter, they both half laughed. 
Well, remarked Anthony without inspiration, I haven't seen you for a long time. Immediately he regretted his words and started to add, I didn't know you lived out this way. But Blockman anticipated him by asking pleasantly, How's your wife? She's very well. How have you been? Excellent. His tone amplified the grandeur of the word. It seemed to Anthony that during the last year Blockman had grown tremendously in dignity. The boiled look was gone. He seemed done at last. In addition, he was no longer overdressed. The inappropriate facetiousness he had affected in ties had given way to a sturdy dark pattern, and his right hand, which had formerly displayed two heavy rings, was now innocent of ornament and even without the raw glow of a manicure. This dignity appeared also in his personality. The last aura of the successful traveling man had faded from him. That deliberate ingratiation of which the lowest form is the body joke in the Pullman smoker. One imagined that, having been fawned upon financially, he had attained aloofness. Having been snubbed socially, he had acquired reticence. But whatever had given him weight instead of bulk, Anthony no longer felt a correct superiority in his presence. Do you remember Caramel, Richard Caramel? I believe you met him one night. I remember. He was writing a book. Well, he sold it to the movies. Then they had some scenario man named Jordan work on it. Well, Dick subscribes to a clipping bureau, and he's furious because about half of the movie reviewers speak of the power and strength of William Jordan's demon lover. Didn't mention old Dick at all. You'd think this fellow Jordan had actually conceived and developed the thing. Bachman nodded comprehensively. Most of the contracts state that the original writer's name goes into all the paid publicity. Is Caramel still writing? Oh, yes. Writing hard. Short stories. Well, that's fine, that's fine. You on this train often? About once a week. We live in Marietta. Is that so? Well, well. I live near Coscob myself. Bought a place there only recently. We're only five miles apart. You'll have to come and see us. Anthony was surprised at his own courtesy. I'm sure Gloria'd be delighted to see an old friend. Anybody'll tell you where the house is. It's our second season there. Thank you. Then, as though returning a complimentary politeness, how is your grandfather? He's been well. I had lunch with him today. A great character, said Blockman severely, a fine example of an American. The Triumph of Lethargy Anthony found his wife deep in the porch hammock, voluptuously engaged with a lemonade and a tomato sandwich, and carrying on an apparently cheery conversation with Tana upon one of Tana's complicated themes. In my country, Anthony recognized his invariable preface, all time peoples eat rice because haven't got, cannot eat would no have got. Had his nationality not been desperately apparent, one would have thought he had acquired his knowledge of his native land from American primary school geographies. When the Oriental had been squelched and dismissed to the kitchen, Anthony turned questioningly to Gloria. It's all right, she announced, smiling broadly, and it surprised me more than it does you. There's no doubt? None. Couldn't be. They rejoiced happily, gay again with reborn irresponsibility. Then he told her of his opportunity to go abroad, and that he was almost ashamed to reject it. What do you think? Just tell me frankly. Why, Anthony! Her eyes were startled. Do you want to go? Without me? His face fell, yet he knew, with his wife's question, that it was too late. Her arms, sweet and strangling, were around him, for he had made all such choices back in that room in the plaza the year before. This was an anachronism from an age of such dreams. Gloria! he lied in a great burst of comprehension. Of course I don't. I was thinking you might go as a nurse or something. He wondered dully if his grandfather would consider this. As she smiled, he realized again how beautiful she was, a gorgeous girl of miraculous freshness and sheerly honorable eyes. She embraced his suggestion with luxurious intensity, holding it aloft like a sun of her own making and basking in its beams. She strung together an amazing synopsis for an extravaganza of marital adventure. After supper, surfeited with the subject, she yawned. She wanted not to talk but only to read Penrod, stretched upon the lounge until at midnight she fell asleep. But Anthony, 
after he had carried her romantically up the stairs, stayed awake to brood upon the day, vaguely angry with her, vaguely dissatisfied. "'What am I going to do?' he began at breakfast. "'Here we've been married a year, and we've just worried around without even being efficient people of leisure.' "'Yes, you ought to do something,' she admitted, being in an agreeable and loquacious humor. This was not the first of these discussions, but as they usually developed Anthony in the role of protagonist, she had come to avoid them. "'It's not that I have any moral compunctions about work,' he continued, "'but Grandpa may die tomorrow, or he may live for ten years. Meanwhile, we're living above our income, and all we've got to show for it is a farmer's car and a few clothes. We keep an apartment that we've only lived in three months, and a little old house way off in nowhere. We're frequently bored, and yet we won't make any effort to know anyone except the same crowd who drift around California all summer wearing sports clothes and waiting for their families to die. "'How you've changed,' remarked Gloria. "'Once you told me you didn't see why an American couldn't loaf gracefully.' "'Well, damn it, I wasn't married. And the old mind was working at top speed, and now it's going round and round like a cogwheel with nothing to catch it. As a matter of fact, I think that if I hadn't met you I would have done something, but you make leisure so subtly attractive. Oh, it's all my fault. I didn't mean that, and you know I didn't. But here I'm almost twenty-seven, and—oh, she interrupted in vexation, you make me tired, talking as though I were objecting or hindering you. I was just discussing it, Gloria. Can't I discuss? I should think you'd be strong enough to settle something with you without your own problems without coming to me. You talk a lot about going to work. I could use more money very easily, but I'm not complaining. Whether you work or not, I love you. Her last words were as gentle as fine snow upon hard ground. But for the moment, neither was attending to the other. They were each engaged in polishing and perfecting his own attitude. I have worked some. This, by Anthony, was an imprudent bringing up of raw reserves. Gloria laughed, torn between delight and derision. She resented his sophistry, as at the same time she admired his nonchalance. She would never blame him for being the ineffectual idler, so long as he did it sincerely, from the attitude that nothing much was worth doing. Work, she scoffed. Oh, you sad bird, you bluffer. Work, that means a great arranging of the desk and the lights, a great sharpening of pencils, and Gloria, don't sing, and please keep that damn tana away from me, and let me read you my opening sentence, and I won't be through for a long time, Gloria, so don't stay up for me, and a tremendous consumption of tea or coffee, and that's all. In just about an hour I hear the old pencil stop scratching and look over. You've got out a book and you're looking up something. Then you're reading. Then yawns, then bed, and a great tossing about because you're all full of caffeine and can't sleep. Two weeks later the whole performance over again. With much difficulty Anthony retained a scanty breech clout of dignity. Now that's a slight exaggeration. You know darn well I sold an essay to the Florentine, and it attracted a lot of attention considering the circulation of the Florentine. And what's more, Gloria, you know I sat up till five o'clock in the morning finishing it. She lapsed into silence, giving him rope. And if he had not hanged himself, he had certainly come to the end of it. At least, he concluded feebly, I'm perfectly willing to be a war correspondent. But so was Gloria. They were both willing, anxious. They assured each other of it. The evening ended on a note of tremendous sentiment, the majesty of leisure, the ill health of Adam Patch, love at any cost. Anthony, she called over the banister one afternoon, a week later, there's someone at the door. Anthony, who had been lolling in the hammock on the sun-speckled south porch, strolled around to the front of the house. A foreign car, large and impressive, crouched like an immense and saturnine bug at the foot of the path. A man in a soft pongee suit with cap to match hailed him. "'Hello there, Patch. Ran over to call on you.' It was Blockwin, as always, infinitesimally improved, of subtler intonation, of more convincing ease. "'I'm awfully glad you did.' Anthony raised his voice to a vine-covered window. "'Gloria, we've got a visitor.' "'I'm in the tub,' wailed Gloria politely. With a smile, the two men acknowledged the triumph of her alibi. "'She'll be down. Come round here on the sideboard. Like a drink? Gloria's always in the tub, a good third of every day. Pity she doesn't live on the sound.' 
Can't afford it. As coming from Adam Patch's grandson, Blockman took this as a form of pleasantry. After fifteen minutes filled with estimable brilliancies, Gloria appeared, fresh and starched yellow, bringing atmosphere and an increase of vitality. "'I want to be a successful sensation in the movies,' she announced. "'I hear that Mary Pickford makes a million dollars annually.' "'You could, you know,' said Blockman. "'I think you'd film very well.' "'Would you let me, Anthony, if I only play unsophisticated roles?' As the conversation continued in stilted commas, Anthony wondered that to him and Blockman both this girl had once been the most stimulating, the most tonic personality they had ever known, and now the three sat like over-oiled machines, without conflict, without fear, without elation, heavily enameled little figures secure beyond enjoyment, in a world where death and war, dull emotion and noble savagery were covering a continent with the smoke of terror. In a moment he would call Tana, and they would pour into themselves a gay and delicate poison, which would restore them momentarily to the pleasurable excitement of childhood, when every face in a crowd had carried its suggestion of splendid and significant transactions taking place somewhere to some magnificent and illimitable purpose. Life was no more than the summer afternoon, a faint wind stirring the lace collar of Gloria's dress, the slow baking drowsiness of the veranda. Intolerably unmoved they all seemed, removed from any romantic imminency of action. Even Gloria's beauty needed wild emotions, needed poignancy, needed death. Any day next week, Bachman was saying to Gloria, here, take this card. What they do is give you a test of about three hundred feet of film, and they can tell pretty accurately from that. How about Wednesday? Wednesday's fine. Just phone me and I'll go around with you. He was on his feet, shaking hands briskly, then his car was a wraith of dust down the road. Anthony turned to his wife in bewilderment. Why, Gloria! You don't mind if I have a trial, Anthony? Just a trial? I've got to go to town Wednesday anyhow. But it's so silly. You don't want to go into the movies, moon around a studio all day with a lot of cheap chorus people. A lot of mooning around Mary Pickford does. Everybody isn't a Mary Pickford. Well, I can't see how you'd object to my trying. I do, though. I hate actors. Oh, you make me tired. Do you imagine I have a very thrilling time dozing on this damn porch? You wouldn't mind if you loved me. Of course I love you, she said impatiently, making out a quick case for herself. It's just because I do that I hate to see you go to pieces by just lying around and saying you ought to work. Perhaps if I did go into this for a while, it'd stir you up so you'd do something. It's just your craving for excitement, that's all it is. Maybe it is. It's a perfectly natural craving, isn't it? Well, I'll tell you one thing. If you go to the movies, I'm going to Europe. Well, go on then. I'm not stopping you. To show she was not stopping him, she melted into melancholy tears. Together they marshaled the armies of sentiment, words, kisses, endearments, self-reproaches. They attained nothing. Inevitably, they attained nothing. Finally, in a burst of gargantuan emotion, each of them sat down and wrote a letter. Anthony's was to his grandfather, Gloria's was to Joseph Blockman. It was a triumph of lethargy. One day, early in July, Anthony, returned from an afternoon in New York, called upstairs to Gloria. Receiving no answer, he guessed she was asleep, and so went into the pantry for one of the little sandwiches that were always prepared for them. He found Tana seated at the kitchen table before a miscellaneous assortment of odds and ends, cigar boxes, knives, pencils, the tops of cans, and some scraps of paper covered with elaborate figures and diagrams. "'What the devil are you doing?' demanded Anthony curiously. Tana politely grinned. "'I show you!' he exclaimed enthusiastically. "'I tell—' "'You making a doghouse?' "'No, sir!' Tana grinned again. "'Make typewater!' typewriter? Yes, sir. I think, oh, all time I think, lie in bed, think about typewriter. So you thought you'd make one, eh? Wait, I tell. Anthony, munching a sandwich, leaned leisurely against the sink. Tana opened and closed his mouth several times, as though testing its capacity for action. Then, in a rush, he began. I been think typewriter has, oh, many, 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 many thing. Oh, many, 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 many... Many keys? I see. No? Yes, key. Many, 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 many letter. 
Like so, A, B, C. Yes, you're right. Wait, I tell. He screwed his face up in a tremendous effort to express himself. I been think many words and same, like I N G. You bet, a whole raft of them. So I make typewater quick, not so many letter. That's a great idea, Tana. Save time. You'll make a fortune. Press one key and there's ing. Hope you work it out. Tana laughed disparagingly. Wait, I tell... Where's Mrs. Patch? She out. Wait, I tell... Again he screwed up his face for action. My typewater. Where is she? Here, I make. He pointed to the miscellany of junk on the table. I mean Mrs. Patch. She out, Tana reassured him. She be back five o'clock, she say. Down in the village? No. Went off before lunch. She go, Mr. Blockman. Anthony started. Went out with Mr. Blockman. She be back five. Without a word, Anthony left the kitchen with Tenna's disconsolate, I tell, trailing after him. So this was Gloria's idea of excitement by God. His fists were clenched. Within a moment he had worked himself up to a tremendous pitch of indignation. He went to the door and looked out. There was no car in sight, and his watch stood at four minutes of five. With furious energy he dashed down to the end of the path. As far as the bend of the road a mile off he could see no car, except, but it was a farmer's fliver. Then, in an undignified pursuit of dignity, he rushed back to the shelter of the house as quickly as he had rushed out. Pacing up and down the living room, he began an angry rehearsal of the speech he would make to her when she came in. So this is love, he would begin. Or, no, it sounded too much like the popular phrase, so this is Paris. He must be dignified, hurt, grieved, anyhow. So this is what you do when I have to go up and trot all day around the hot city on business. No wonder I can't write. No wonder I don't dare let you out of my sight. He was expanding now, warming to his subject. I'll tell you, he continued, I'll tell you. He paused, catching a familiar ring in the words. Then he realized it was Tana's, I tell. Yet Anthony neither laughed nor seemed absurd to himself. To his frantic imagination, it was already six, seven, eight, and she was never coming. Blockman, finding her bored and unhappy, had persuaded her to go to California with him. There was a great to-do out in front, a joyous, Yoho, Anthony! And he rose, trembling, weakly happy to see her, fluttering up the path. Blockman was following, cap in hand. Dearest, she cried, we've just been for the best jaunt, all over New York State. I'll have to be starting home, said Blockman, almost immediately. Wish you'd both been here when I came. I'm sorry I wasn't, answered Anthony dryly. When he had departed, Anthony hesitated. The fear was gone from his heart, yet he felt that some protest was ethically apropos. Gloria resolved his uncertainty. I knew you wouldn't mind. He came just before lunch and said he had to go to Garrison on business, and wouldn't I go with him? He looked so lonesome, Anthony, and I drove his car all the way. Listlessly, Anthony dropped into a chair, his mind tired, tired with nothing, tired with everything, with the world's weight he had never chosen to bear. He was ineffectual and vaguely helpless here, as he had always been. One of those personalities who, in spite of all their words, are inarticulate, he seemed to have inherited only the vast tradition of human failure, that and the sense of death. I suppose I don't care, he answered. One must be broad about these things, and Gloria, being young, being beautiful, must have reasonable privileges. Yet it wearied him that he failed to understand. End of Book Two, Chapter Two, Part One of Three. Book Two, Chapter Two, Part Two of Three of The Beautiful and Damned. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Beautiful and Damned by F. Scott Fitzgerald. Book Two, Chapter Two, Symposium. Part Two of Three. Winter. She rolled over on her back and lay still for a moment in the great bed, 
watching the February sun suffer one last attenuated refinement in its passage through the leaded panes into the room. For a time she had no accurate sense of her whereabouts, or of the events of the day before, or the day before that. Then, like a suspended pendulum, memory began to beat out its story, releasing with each swing a burdened quota of time until her life was given back to her. She could hear, now, Anthony's troubled breathing beside her. She could smell whiskey and cigarette smoke. She noticed that she lacked complete muscular control. When she moved, it was not a sinuous motion with the resultant strain distributed easily over her body. It was a tremendous effort of her nervous system, as though each time she were hypnotizing herself into performing an impossible action. She was in the bathroom, brushing her teeth to get rid of that intolerable taste, then back by the bedside, listening to the rattle of Bounds's key in the outer door. "'Wake up, Anthony,' she said sharply. She climbed into bed beside him and closed her eyes. Almost the last thing she remembered was a conversation with Mr. and Mrs. Lacey. Mrs. Lacey had said, "'Sure you don't want us to get you a taxi?' And Anthony had replied that he guessed they could walk over to Fifth all right. Then they had both attempted, imprudently, to bow, and collapsed absurdly into a battalion of empty milk bottles just outside the door. There must have been two dozen milk bottles standing open-mouthed in the dark. She could conceive of no plausible explanation of those milk bottles. Perhaps they had been attracted by the singing in the Lacey house, and had hurried over agape with wonder to see the fun. Well, they'd had the worst of it, though it seemed that she and Anthony never would get up, the perverse things rolled so. Still, they had found a taxi. My meter's broken, and it'll cost you a dollar and a half to get home, said the taxi driver. Well, said Anthony, I'm young Packy McFarland, and if you'll come down here, I'll beat you till you can't stand up. At that point, the men had driven off without them. They must have found another taxi, for they were in the apartment. What time is it? Anthony was sitting up in bed, staring at her with owlish precision. This was obviously a rhetorical question. Gloria could think of no reason why she should be expected to know the time. "'Golly, I feel like the devil,' muttered Anthony dispassionately. Relaxing, he tumbled back upon his pillow. "'Bring on your grim reaper.' "'Anthony, how did we finally get home last night?' "'Taxi.' "'Oh.' Then, after a pause, "'Did you put me to bed?' "'I don't know. Seems to me you put me to bed. What day is it?' Tuesday. Tuesday? I hope so. If it's Wednesday, I've got to start work at that idiotic place. It's supposed to be down at nine or some such ungodly hour. Ask Bounds, suggested Gloria feebly. Bounds, he called. Sprightly, sober, a voice from a world that it seemed in the past two days they had left forever, Bounds sprang in short steps down the hall and appeared in the half-darkness of the door. What day, Bounds? February the 22nd, I think, sir. I mean, day of the week. Tuesday, sir. Thanks. After a pause, are you ready for breakfast, sir? Yes, and Bounds, before you get it, will you make a pitcher of water and set it here beside the bed? I'm a little thirsty. Yes, sir. Bounds retreated in sober dignity down the hall. Lincoln's birthday, affirmed Anthony without enthusiasm, or St. Valentine's or somebody's. When did we start on this insane party? Sunday night. After prayers, he suggested sardonically. We raced all over town in those hansoms, and Maury sat up with his driver, don't you remember? Then we came home and he tried to cook some bacon, came out of the pantry with a few blackened remains, insisting it was fried to the proverbial crisp. Both of them laughed, spontaneously but with some difficulty and lying there side by side, reviewed the chain of events that had ended in this rusty and chaotic dawn. They had been in New York for almost four months, since the country had grown too cool in late October. They had given up California this year, partly because of lack of funds, partly with the idea of growing abroad, should this interminable war, persisting now into its second year, end during the winter. Of late their income had lost elasticity, no longer did it stretch to cover gay whims and pleasant extravagances, and Anthony had spent many puzzled and unsatisfactory hours over a densely figured pad, making remarkable budgets that left huge margins for amusements, trips, etc., 
and trying to apportion, even approximately, their past expenditures. He remembered a time when, in going on a party with his two best friends, he and Maury had invariably paid more than their share of the expenses. They would buy the tickets for the theatre or squabble between themselves for the dinner check. It had seemed fitting. Dick, with his naivete and his astonishing fund of information about himself, had been a diverting, almost juvenile figure, court jester to their royalty. But this was no longer true. It was Dick who always had money. It was Anthony who entertained within limitations, always accepting occasional, wild, wine-inspired, check-cashing parties. And it was Anthony who was solemn about it the next morning, and told the scornful and disgusted Gloria that they'd have to be more careful next time. In the two years since the publication of The Demon Lover, Dick had made over $25,000, most of it lately, when the reward of the author of fiction had begun to swell unprecedentedly as a result of the voracious hunger of the motion pictures for plots. He received $700 for every story, at that time a large emolument for such a young man, he was not quite thirty, and for every one that contained enough action, kissing, shooting, and sacrificing, for the movies, he obtained an additional thousand. His stories varied. There was a measure of vitality and a sort of instinctive technique in all of them, but none attained the personality of the demon lover, and there were several that Anthony considered downright cheap. These, Dick explained severely, were to widen his audience. Wasn't it true that men who had attained real permanence, from Shakespeare to Mark Twain, had appealed to the many as well as to the elect? Though Anthony and Maury disagreed, Gloria told him to go ahead and make as much money as he could. That was the only thing that counted, anyhow. Maury, a little stouter, faintly mellower, and more complacent, had gone to work in Philadelphia. He came to New York once or twice a month, and on such occasions the four of them traveled the popular routes from dinner to the theater, thence to the frolic, or, perhaps at the urging of the ever-curious Gloria, to one of the cellars of Greenwich Village, notorious through the furious but short-lived vogue of the new poetry movement. In January, after many monologues directed at his reticent wife, Anthony determined to get something to do, for the winter at any rate. He wanted to please his grandfather, and even, in a measure, to see how he liked it himself. He discovered during several tentative semi-social calls that employers were not interested in a young man who was only going to try it for a few months or so. As the grandson of Adam Patch, he was received everywhere with marked courtesy but the old man was a back number now. The heyday of his fame as first an oppressor and then an uplifter of the people had been during the twenty years preceding his retirement. Anthony even found several of the younger men who were under the impression that Adam Patch had been dead for some years. Eventually, Anthony went to his grandfather and asked his advice, which turned out to be that he should enter the bond business as a salesman, a tedious suggestion to Anthony but one that, in the end, he determined to follow. Sheer money and deft manipulation had fascinations under all circumstances, while almost any side of manufacturing would be insufferably dull. He considered newspaper work, but decided that the hours were not ordered for a married man, and he lingered over pleasant fancies of himself, either as editor of a brilliant weekly of opinion, an American Mercure de France, or as scintillant producer of satiric comedy and Parisian musical review. However, the approaches to these latter guilds seemed to be guarded by professional secrets. Men drifted into them by the devious highways of writing and acting. It was palpably impossible to get on a magazine unless you had been on one before. So, in the end, he entered, by way of his grandfather's letter, that sanctum Americanum where sat the president of Wilson, Heimer, and Hardy, at his cleared desk, and issued therefrom employed. He was to begin work on the 23rd of February. In tribute to the momentous occasion, this two-day revel had been planned, since, he said, after he began working, he'd have to get to bed early during the week. Maury Noble had arrived from Philadelphia on a trip that had to do with seeing some man in Wall Street, whom, incidentally, he failed to see, and Richard Caramel had been half-persuaded, half-tricked into joining them. They had condescended to a wet and fashionable wedding on Monday afternoon, and in the evening had occurred the denouement. Gloria, going beyond her accustomed limit of four precisely timed cocktails, 
led them on as gay and joyous a bacchanal as they had ever known, disclosing an astonishing knowledge of ballet steps, and singing songs which she confessed had been taught her by her cook when she was innocent and seventeen. She repeated these by request at intervals throughout the evening with such frank conviviality that Anthony, far from being annoyed, was gratified at this fresh source of entertainment. The occasion was memorable in other ways, a long conversation between Maury and a defunct crab, which he was dragging around on the end of a string, as to whether the crab was fully conversant in the applications of the binomial theorem, and the aforementioned race in two handsome cabs, with the sedate and impressive shadows of Fifth Avenue for audience, ending in a labyrinthine escape into the darkness of Central Park. Finally, Anthony and Gloria had paid a call on some wild young married people, the Lacys, and collapsed in the empty milk bottles. Morning now, theirs to add up the checks cashed here and there in clubs, stores, restaurants, theirs to air the dank staleness of wine and cigarettes out of the tall blue front room, to pick up the broken glass and brush at the stained fabric of chairs and sofas, to give bounds, suits, and dresses for the cleaners. Finally, to take their smothery, half-feverish bodies and faded, depressed spirits out into the chill air of February, that life might go on, and Wilson, Hymer, and Hardy obtain the services of a vigorous man at nine the next morning. "'Do you remember,' called Anthony from the bathroom, "'when Moray got out at the corner of 110th Street and acted as a traffic cop, beckoning cars forward and motioning them back? They must have thought he was a private detective.' After each reminiscence they both laughed inordinately, their overwrought nerves responding as acutely and janglingly to mirth as to depression. Gloria at the mirror was wondering at the splendid color and freshness of her face. It seemed she had never looked so well, though her stomach hurt her and her head was aching furiously. The day passed slowly. Anthony, riding in a taxi to his brokers to borrow money on a bond, found that he had only two dollars in his pocket. The fare would cost all of that, but he felt that on this particular occasion he could not have endured the subway. When the taxi meter reached his limit, he must get out and walk. With this, his mind drifted off into one of its characteristic daydreams. In this dream, he discovered that the meter was going too fast. The driver had dishonestly adjusted it. Calmly, he reached his destination, and then nonchalantly handed the man what he justly owed him. The man showed fight, but almost before his hands were up, Anthony had knocked him down with one terrific blow, and when he rose, Anthony quickly sidestepped and floored him definitely with a crack in the temple. He was in court now. The judge had fined him five dollars, and he had no money. Would the court take his check? Ah, but the court did not know him. Well, he could identify himself by having them call his apartment. They did so. Yes, it was Mrs. Anthony Patch speaking. But how did she know that this man was her husband? How could she know? Let the police sergeant ask her if she remembered the milk bottles. He leaned forward hurriedly and tapped at the glass. The taxi was only at Brooklyn Bridge, but the meter showed a dollar and eighty cents, and Anthony would never have omitted the ten percent tip. Later in the afternoon, he returned to the apartment. Gloria had also been out, shopping, and was asleep, curled in the corner of the sofa with her purchase locked securely in her arms. Her face was as untroubled as a little girl's, and the bundle she pressed tightly to her bosom was a child's doll, a profound and infinitely healing balm to her disturbed and childish heart. Destiny It was with this party, more especially with Gloria's part in it, that a decided change began to come over their way of living. The magnificent attitude of not giving a damn altered overnight. From being a mere tenant of Gloria's, it became the entire solace and justification for what they chose to do and what consequence it brought. Not to be sorry, not to lose one cry of regret, to live according to a clear code of honor toward each other and to seek the moment's happiness as fervently and persistently as possible. No one cares about us but ourselves, Anthony, she said one day. It'd be ridiculous for me to go about pretending I felt any obligations toward the world, and as for worrying what people think about me, I simply don't, that's all. Since I was a little girl in dancing school, I've been criticized by the mothers of all the little girls who weren't as popular as I was, and I've always looked on criticism as a sort of envious tribute. 
This was because of a party in the Boul Mitch one night, where Constance Merriam had seen her as one of a highly stimulated party of four. Constance Merriam, as an old school friend, had gone to the trouble of inviting her to lunch the next day, in order to inform her how terrible it was. I told her I couldn't see it, Gloria told Anthony. Eric Merriam is a sort of sublimated Percy Walcott. You remember that man in Hot Springs I told you about? His idea of respecting Constance is to leave her at home with her sewing and her baby and her book, at such innocuous amusements, whenever he's going on a party that promises to be anything but deathly dull. Did you tell her that? I certain did, and I told her that what she really objected to was that I was having a better time than she was. Anthony applauded her. He was tremendously proud of Gloria, proud that she never failed to eclipse whatever other women might be in the party, proud that men were always glad to revel with her in great rowdy groups, without any attempt to do more than enjoy her beauty and the warmth of her vitality. These parties gradually became their chief source of entertainment. Still in love, still enormously interested in each other, they yet found, as spring drew near, that staying at home in the evening palled on them. Books were unreal. The old magic of being alone had long since vanished. Instead, they preferred to be bored by a stupid musical comedy, or go to dinner with the most uninteresting of their acquaintances, so long as there would be enough cocktails to keep the conversation from becoming utterly intolerable. A scattering of younger married people, who had been their friends in school or college, as well as a varied assortment of single men, began to think instinctively of them whenever color and excitement were needed. So there was scarcely a day without its phone call, its, "'Wondered what you were doing this evening.' Wives, as a rule, were afraid of Gloria, her facile attainment of the center of the stage, her innocent but nevertheless disturbing way of becoming a favorite with husbands. These things drove them instinctively into an attitude of profound distrust, heightened by the fact that Gloria was largely unresponsive to any intimacy shown her by a woman. On the appointed Wednesday in February, Anthony had gone to the imposing offices of Wilson, Hymer, and Hardy, and listened to many vague instructions delivered by an energetic young man of about his own age, named Collar, who wore a defiant yellow pompadour, and in announcing himself as an assistant secretary, gave the impression that it was a tribute to exceptional ability. "'There's two kinds of men here, you'll find,' he said. "'There's the man who gets to be an assistant secretary or treasurer, gets his name in our folder here, before he's thirty, and there's the man who gets his name there at forty-five. The man who gets his name there at forty-five stays there the rest of his life. How about the man who gets it there at thirty? inquired Anthony politely. Why, he gets up here, you see. He pointed to a list of assistant vice presidents upon the folder. Or maybe he gets to be president or secretary or treasurer. And what about these over here? Those? Oh, those are the trustees, the men with capital. I see. Now, some people, continued Collar, think that whether a man gets started early or late depends on whether or not he's got a college education, but they're wrong. I see. I had one. I was Buckley, class of 1911, but when I came down to the street, I soon found that the things that would help me here weren't the fancy things I learned in college. In fact, I had to get a lot of fancy stuff out of my head. Anthony could not help wondering what possible fancy stuff he had learned at Buckley in 1911. An irrepressible idea that it was some sort of needlework recurred to him throughout the rest of the conversation. See that fellow over there? Collar pointed to a youngish looking man with handsome gray hair, sitting at a desk inside a mahogany railing. That's Mr. Ellinger, the first vice president. Been everywhere, seen everything, got a fine education. In vain did Anthony try to open his mind to the romance of finance. He could think of Mr. Ellinger only as one of the buyers of the handsome leather sets of Thackeray, Balzac, Hugo, and Gibbon that lined the walls of the big bookstores. Through the damp and uninspiring month of March, he was prepared for salesmanship. Lacking enthusiasm, he was capable of viewing the turmoil and bustle that surrounded him only as a fruitless circumambient striving toward an incomprehensible goal tangibly evidenced only by the rival mansions of Mr. Frick and Mr. Carnegie on Fifth Avenue. That these portentous vice-presidents and trustees should actually be the fathers of the best men he had known at Harvard seemed to him incongruous. He ate in an employee's lunchroom upstairs with an uneasy suspicion that he was being uplifted, 
wondering through that first week if the dozens of young clerks, some of them alert and immaculate, and just out of college, lived in flamboyant hope of crowding onto that narrow slip of cardboard before the catastrophic thirties. The conversation that interwove with the pattern of the day's work was all much of a piece. One discussed how Mr. Wilson had made his money, what method Mr. Hymer had employed, and the means resorted to by Mr. Hardy. One related age-old but eternally breathless anecdotes of the fortunes stumbled on precipitously in the street by a butcher, or a bartender, or a darned messenger boy, by golly. And then one talked of the current gambles, and whether it was best to go out for a hundred thousand a year, or be content with twenty. During the preceding year, one of the assistant secretaries had invested all his savings in Bethlehem Steel. The story of his spectacular magnificence, of his haughty resignation in January, and of the triumphal palace he was now building in California, was the favorite office subject. The man's very name had acquired a magic significance, symbolizing, as he did, the aspirations of all good Americans. Anecdotes were told about him, how one of the presidents had advised him to sell, but, by golly, he had hung on, even bought on margin, and now look where he is. Such, obviously, was the stuff of life, a dizzy triumph dazzling the eyes of all of them, a gypsy siren to content them with meager wages and with the arithmetical improbability of their eventual success. To Anthony, the notion became appalling. He felt that to succeed here, the idea of success must grasp and limit his mind. It seemed to him that the essential element in these men at the top was their faith that their affairs were the very core of life. All other things being equal, self-assurance and opportunism won out over technical knowledge. It was obvious that the more expert work went on near the bottom, and so, with appropriate efficiency, the technical experts were kept there. His determination to stay in at night during the week did not survive, and a good half of the time he came to work with a splitting, sickish headache, and the crowded horror of the morning subway ringing in his ears like an echo of hell. Then, abruptly, he quit. He had remained in bed all one Monday, and late in the evening, overcome by one of those attacks of moody despair to which he periodically succumbed, he wrote and mailed a letter to Mr. Wilson, confessing that he considered himself ill-adapted to the work. Gloria, coming in from the theatre with Richard Caramel, found him on the lounge, silently staring at the high ceiling, more depressed and discouraged than he had been at any time since their marriage. She wanted him to whine. If he had, she would have reproached him bitterly, for she was not a little annoyed. But he only lay there so utterly miserable that she felt sorry for him, and kneeling down she stroked his head, saying how little it mattered, how little anything mattered so long as they loved each other. It was like their first year, and Anthony, reacting to her cool hand, to her voice that was soft as breath itself upon his ear, became almost cheerful and talked with her of his future plans. He even regretted, silently, before he went to bed, that he had so hastily mailed his resignation. Even when everything seems rotten, you can't trust that judgment, Gloria had said. It's the sum of all your judgments that counts. In mid-April came a letter from the real estate agent in Marietta, encouraging them to take the gray house for another year at a slightly increased rental, and enclosing a lease made out for their signatures. For a week, lease and letter lay carelessly neglected on Anthony's desk. They had no intention of returning to Marietta. They were weary of the place, and had been bored most of the preceding summer. Besides, their car had deteriorated to a rattling mess of hypochondriacal metal, and a new one was financially inadvisable. But because of another wild revel, enduring through four days and participated in, at one time or another, by more than a dozen people, they did sign the lease. To their utter horror they signed and sent it, and immediately it seemed as though they heard the gray house, drably malevolent at last, licking its white chops and waiting to devour them. "'Anthony, where's that lease?' she called in high alarm one Sunday morning, sick and sober to reality. "'Where did you leave it? It was here!' Then she knew where it was. She remembered the house party they had planned on the crest of their exuberance, she remembered a room full of men to whose less exhilarated moments she and Anthony were of no importance, and Anthony's boast of the transcendent merit and seclusion of the gray house, that it was so isolated that it didn't matter how much noise went on there. Then Dick, who had visited them, cried enthusiastically that it was the best little house imaginable, 
and that they were idiotic not to take it for another summer. It had been easy to work themselves up to a sense of how hot and deserted the city was getting, of how cool and ambrosial were the charms of Marietta. Anthony had picked up the lease and waved it wildly, found Gloria happily acquiescent, and with one last burst of garrulous decision, during which all the men agreed with solemn handshakes that they would come out for a visit. Anthony, she cried, we've signed and sent it. What? The lease. What the devil? Oh, Anthony. There was utter misery in her voice. For the summer, for eternity, they had built themselves a prison. It seemed to strike at the last roots of their stability. Anthony thought they might arrange it with the real estate agent. They could no longer afford the double rent, and going to Marietta meant giving up his apartment, his reproachless apartment, with the exquisite bath and the rooms for which he had bought his furniture and hangings. It was the closest to a home that he had ever had, familiar with memories of four colorful years. But it was not arranged with the real estate agent, nor was it arranged at all. Dispiritedly, without even any talk of making the best of it, without even Gloria's all-sufficing, I don't care, they went back to the house that they now knew heeded neither youth nor love, only those austere and incommunicable memories that they could never share. THE SINISTER SUMMER There was a horror in the house that summer. It came with them and settled itself over the place like a somber pall, pervasive through the lower rooms, gradually spreading and climbing up the narrow stairs until it oppressed their very sleep. Anthony and Gloria grew to hate being there alone. Her bedroom, which had seemed so pink and young and delicate, appropriate to her pastel-shaded lingerie, tossed here and there on chair and bed, seemed now to whisper with its rustling curtains, Ah, my beautiful young lady, yours is not the first daintiness and delicacy that has faded here under the summer suns. Generations of unloved women have adored themselves by that glass for rustic lovers who paid no heed. Youth has come into this room in palest blue and left it in the gray cerements of despair, and through long nights many girls have lain awake where that bed stands, pouring out waves of misery into the darkness. Gloria finally tumbled all her clothes and ungents ingloriously out of it, declaring that she had come to live with Anthony and making the excuse that one of her screens was rotten and admitted bugs. So her room was abandoned to insensitive guests, and they dressed and slept in her husband's chamber, which Gloria considered somehow good, as though Anthony's presence there had acted as exterminator of any uneasy shadows of the past that might have hovered about its walls. The distinction between good and bad, ordered early and summarily out of both their lives, had been reinstated in another form. Gloria insisted that any one invited to the gray house must be good, which, in the case of a girl, meant that she must be either simple and reproachless, or, if otherwise, must possess a certain solidity and strength. Always intensely skeptical of her sex, her judgments were now concerned with the question of whether women were or were not clean. By uncleanliness she meant a variety of things, a lack of pride, a slackness in fiber, and, most of all, the unmistakable aura of promiscuity. Women soil easily, she said, far more easily than men. Unless a girl's very young and brave, it's almost impossible for her to go downhill without a certain hysterical animality, the cunning, dirty sort of animality. A man's different, and I suppose that's why one of the commonest characters of romance is a man going gallantly to the devil. She was disposed to like many men, preferably those who gave her frank homage and unfailing entertainment, but often, with a flash of insight, she told Anthony that some one of his friends was merely using him, and consequently had best be left alone. Anthony customarily demurred, insisting that the accused was a good one, but he found that his judgment was more fallible than hers, memorably when, as it happened on several occasions, he was left with a succession of restaurant checks for which to render a solitary account. More from their fear of solitude than from any desire to go through the fuss and bother of entertaining, they filled the house with guests every weekend, and off and on through the week. The weekend parties were much the same. When the three or four men invited had arrived, drinking was more or less in order, followed by a hilarious dinner and a ride to the Cradle Beach Country Club, which they had joined because it was inexpensive, lively if not fashionable, and almost a necessity for such occasions as these. Moreover, it was of no great moment what one did there, and so long as the patch party were reasonably inaudible, 
it mattered little whether or not the social dictators of Cradle Beach saw the gay Gloria imbibing cocktails in the supper room at frequent intervals during the evening. Saturday ended in a glamorous confusion, it proving often necessary to assist a muddled guest to bed. Sunday brought the New York papers and a quiet morning of recuperating on the porch, and Sunday afternoon meant goodbye to the one or two guests who must return to the city, and a great revival of drinking among the one or two who remained until the next day, concluding in a convivial if not hilarious evening. The faithful Tana, pedagogue by nature, and man of all work by profession, had returned with them. Among their more frequent guests a tradition had sprung up about him. Maury Noble remarked one afternoon that his real name was Tannenbaum, and that he was a German agent kept in this country to disseminate Teutonic propaganda through Westchester County. And after that, mysterious letters began to arrive from Philadelphia, addressed to the bewildered Oriental as Lieutenant Emil Tannenbaum, containing a few cryptic messages signed General Staff, and adorned with an atmospheric double column of facetious Japanese. Anthony always handed them to Tana without a smile. Hours afterward, the recipient could be found puzzling over them in the kitchen, and declaring earnestly that the perpendicular symbols were not Japanese, nor anything resembling Japanese. Gloria had taken a strong dislike to the man ever since the day when, returning unexpectedly from the village, she had discovered him reclining on Anthony's bed, puzzling out a newspaper. It was the instinct of all servants to be fond of Anthony and to detest Gloria, and Tanner was no exception to the rule. But he was thoroughly afraid of her, and made plain his aversion only in his moodier moments by subtly addressing Anthony with remarks intended for her ear. "'What Miss Pats want dinner?' he would say, looking at his master. Or else he would comment about the bitter selfishness of American peoples, in such manner that there was no doubt who were the peoples referred to. But they dared not dismiss him. Such a step would have been abhorrent to their inertia. They endured Tana as they endured ill weather and sickness of the body and the estimable will of God, as they endured all things, even themselves. End of Book Two, Chapter Two, Part Two of Three